for the Sea Peoples to raid the eastern Mediterranean region. But there might have been another major motivation, exploding populations. As the various political, social, economic and environmental factors took hold and transformed the eastern Mediterranean region from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, a precipitous increase in the population of southeastern Europe may also have played a role. Archaeological evidence shows that the population of the Messenia region of Greece nearly tripled and reached a peak population of around 50,000 just before the region-wide troubles began in the late 13th century BC. In a good season before the troubles, Messenia would have been able to not only sustain its population with its crops, but even have surplus grain for exporting. At the same time, however, the rapid population increase in the region meant that many would have starved without a viable authority that could allocate resources, which in turn would have led to migrations by survivors. The survivors, in turn, would have been forced to find new sources of food and other resources, which would have led to piracy and raiding by at least some of them. Clearly, there were a number of factors that led to the collapse of the Bronze Age in the eastern Mediterranean region not the least of which was the migrations of the peoples that are known today as the Sea Peoples. Perhaps the region was gripped by a perfect storm of factors that ultimately led to the collapse of the political systems that kept the peace and gave a sense of order. Whether the Sea Peoples were directly responsible for bringing about the end of the Bronze Age, or merely took advantage of the situation and rode the wave of anarchy to raid and conquer, is still up for debate but their large role in the period is not. Since none of the Sea Peoples were literate when they entered the historical record, their deeds were first recorded by other peoples, and among the peoples who recorded the Sea Peoples' actions, the Egyptians documented the most details. This is partly because the Egyptians lived to tell after successfully repelling the Sea Peoples' invasions in a series of battles, and it's safe to assume that their records of these enigmatic peoples may have been lost had the Egyptians been conquered. As it was, two major invasions attempted by the Sea Peoples were recorded by the Egyptian kings Merempta and Rameses III, both of whom commemorated their victories over the foreign foes. The first Sea Peoples attempted invasion of Egypt took place during the fifth year of King Merempta's reign, around 1219 BC and was recorded in a detailed inscription at the Karnak Temple, and also in shorter versions on a column now in Cairo. The Merempta texts relate that the Egyptians killed more than 9,000 of their enemies in a six-hour battle, among which were five different Sea Peoples tribes and Libyans. An inscription asserts, Beginning of the victory which His Majesty achieved in the land of Libya, Ekwesh, Teresh, Luca, Sherdan, Shekelesh, Northerners coming from all lands. The five Sea Peoples tribes listed in the text were actually led by the Libyans, who were centuries-old enemies of the Egyptians. The ancient Libyans, like the Sea Peoples, were comprised of several different tribes. But the primary tribe that led the attack on Egypt during Merempta's reign was the Labu, from whom the modern word Libya is derived. The Libyans had historically been little more than an annoyance to Egypt, and even in the late New Kingdom during the reign of Ramses II, they were routinely and absolutely defeated. But the Libyan invasion in year five of Merempta's reign was different because they had five Sea Peoples tribes in their alliance. According to the Egyptian sources, the combined Libyan and Sea Peoples attack on Egypt in 1219 BC was not a run-of-the-mill raiding expedition, but apparently a full-scale invasion that was led by elite warriors in the vanguard and followed by potential colonizers. The Egyptian texts state, The wretched fallen chief of Libya, Merye, son of Dead, has fallen upon the country of Tihinu with his bowmen, Sherdan, Shekelesh, Ekwesh, Luka, Teresh, taking the best of every warrior and every man of war of his country. He has brought his wife and his children, leaders of the camp, and he has reached the western boundary in the fields of Perira. The most interesting part of this passage is that Merye, the chief of Tehenu, one of the ancient Egyptian designations for Libya, brought not only a large army to the borders of Egypt, but also his family. The text goes on to give more details about the actual battle. Lo, 
The bowmen of his majesty spent six hours of destruction among them. They were delivered to the sword upon the country. Lo, as they fought, the wretched chief of Libya halted, his heart fearing, withdrew again, stopped, knelt, leaving sandals, his bow and his quiver in haste behind him, and everything that was with him. His limbs, great terror coursed in his members, lo, they slew. His possessions, his equipment, his silver, his gold, his arrows, all his works, which he had brought from his land, consisting of oxen, goats, and asses, and all were carried away to the palace to bring them in, together with the captives. This text and the previous passage relate an interesting and important fact concerning the nature of the invasion. The Libyans intended to stay in Egypt if they defeated Meremptah. Although the text states that the agricultural implements and husbandry were possessions of the Libyan chief, it does not state if the sea peoples also intended to stay or if they were just mercenaries hired by the Libyans. The final causality list of the Karnak inscription shows that the vast majority of the dead were Libyans, which may indicate that the sea peoples were mercenary auxiliaries and did not intend to stay in Egypt regardless of the outcome. But this only makes historians wonder about the nature of the relationship between the ancient Libyans and the Sea Peoples. Examining the relationship between the Libyans and the Sea Peoples may help explain why the Sea Peoples attacked the places they did, but even more importantly, it may help unlock the mystery of where some of these enigmatic tribes originated. An otherwise nondescript passage from Herodotus may provide a clue. On the connection between the Sea Peoples and the Libyans, Herodotus wrote, West of the Triton and beyond the Orses, Libya is inhabited by tribes who live in ordinary houses and practice agriculture. First come the Maxis, a people who grow their hair on the right side of their heads and shave it off on the left. They stain their bodies red and claim to be descended from the men of Troy. The Maxis claimed to be descended from the city of Troy, which was destroyed sometime during the end of the Bronze Age. This may mean that some of the sea peoples who fought with Marie against the Egyptians eventually settled in Libya, or it may mean that some of the sea peoples were already living there at the time of the attempted invasion during year five of Meremptah's reign. Either way, how the sea peoples' tribes arrived in Libya before the attempted invasion of Egypt is also important, and since no Egyptian historical sources mention a migration across its lands from the east into the western desert where Libya was, most modern scholars believe the sea peoples followed sea routes that avoided Egypt altogether. Although most sea routes in the Bronze Age followed coastlines, which would have placed an east-west route along the Egyptian coastline, there were also routes that traversed the Libyan Sea to Crete and the Aegean that would have avoided Egypt. Whether the Sea Peoples, like their Libyan allies, desired to settle in Egypt, or if they merely fought exclusively as mercenaries, the relationship would continue between them and culminate with another major attempted invasion of Egypt. In year 8 of the reign of Rameses III, about 1162 BC, the Libyans and Sea Peoples attempted another invasion of Egypt, but the Second War appears to have been larger in scope and better recorded by the Egyptians. The war was precipitated by a succession crisis among the Libu, whose heir apparent was being held captive by Rameses III. Although led by the Libu tribe, other Libyan tribes, such as the Meshwesh, Asbutai, and Hassa, and six Sea Peoples tribes, joined in the attempted invasion. The alliance between the various Libyan and Sea Peoples tribes may have been formed years before this conflict, but an examination of the Egyptian texts reveals that some of the sea peoples involved in this war did not take part in the war against Meremptah decades earlier. The primary source for the war in 1162 BC is the Medinet Habu Temple, the mortuary temple of Ramesses III. The temple provides both textual inscriptions and pictorial reliefs that depict the various sea peoples in their native apparel. The texts and reliefs indicate that the war involved both land and river battles, and also involved a migration of civilians from the Levant into Egypt. The Medinet Habu texts enumerate the Sea Peoples tribes in a similar fashion to the texts from Meremptah's war, but Ray provide more details and indicate that some different tribes were involved in Ramses III's war. The text from the second pylon of the Medinet Habu temple reads, The countries, the northerners in their isles, were disturbed, 
taken away in the fray at one time. Not one stood before their hands, from Keta, Kode, Karkamish, Arvad, Alassa, they were wasted. They set up a camp in one place in Amor. They desolated his people and his land like that which is not. They came with fire prepared before them, forward to Egypt. Their main support was Peleset, Thekil, Shekelesh, Denyen, and Weshesh. These lands were united, and they laid their hands upon the land as far as the circle of the earth, their hearts confident, full of their plans. Two important pieces of information are gleaned from this passage. First, five tribes of sea peoples are named, Pelest, Thekel, Shekelesh, Weshesh, and Denyen. But only one of those tribes, the Shekelesh, were named in the inscriptions of Meremptor's war against the Libyans and sea peoples. Meanwhile, the Sherd and Shardana, who were listed as one of the sea peoples' tribes involved in Meremptor's war, are depicted in the pictorial reliefs at the Medinet Habu, but not mentioned in the texts. Interestingly, the Shardana are depicted as fighting both for and against the Egyptians in these reliefs. The second important piece of information is the mention of the various locales that the sea peoples destroyed before they arrived in Egypt. The cities are listed in such a way that it depicts the order of destruction as beginning in Asia Minor, and then going through the Levant until the raiders finally made their way into Egypt. Based on this passage, the attack on Egypt in 1162 BC was the final significant raid by the Sea Peoples, and the passage from the Medinet Habu texts that relate the actual battle seems to indicate that the Egyptians were ready for the Sea Peoples. As a result of the advance, the Sea Peoples and Libyans attempted a combined land and river attack against the Egyptians in year 8 of Rameses III's reign, but perhaps because the Egyptians already knew the Sea Peoples were headed in their direction due to the intensive destruction they had caused in the Levant, the Egyptians were able to build effective defences. The Medinet Habu texts state, I equipped my frontier in Zahi, prepared before them. The chiefs, the captains of infantry, the nobles, I caused to equip the harbour mouths like a strong wall, with warships, galleys and barges. They were manned completely from bow to stern with valiant warriors bearing their arms, soldiers of all the choicest of Egypt, being like lions roaring upon the mountain tops. Ultimately, Ramses III and the Egyptians were successful in their war against the Sea Peoples, and the texts claim the defeat was total. Those who reached my boundary, their seed is not. Their heart and their soul are finished forever and ever. As for those who had assembled before them on the sea, the full flame was in their front, before the harbour mouths, and a wall of metal upon the shore surrounded them. They were dragged, overturned, and laid low upon the beach, slain and made heaps from stern to bow of their galleys, while all their things were cast upon the water. The hieroglyphic texts of Ramses III's war against the Sea Peoples are more detailed than those of Meremptor's war, but the graphic pictorial reliefs at the Medinet Habu Temple has helped even more in the modern understanding of the Sea Peoples. Most notably, the reliefs from the Medinet Habu Temple have helped modern scholars learn about how the Sea Peoples dressed and possibly what the motive was for their second attack on Egypt. The most commonly depicted sea peoples on the reliefs are the Peleset and Jekka, who both wear a fillet from which protrudes a plume. The other prominent sea peoples tribe in the reliefs is the Sherden, who are conspicuous for their horned helmets, which they were first depicted wearing in Egyptian art during the reign of Ramses II. The Medinet Habu reliefs are also important because they depict not only sea peoples warriors fighting the Egyptians, but also women and children who are shown moving in ox-drawn carts. Unfortunately, the graphic depictions of the women and children are not accompanied with text, so it is impossible to definitively determine the context of the situation. The families may have been displaced civilians from the Levant fleeing the Sea Peoples, or they may have been the Sea Peoples warriors' families coming to settle in the fertile Nile Valley. The unknown context of the civilians brings to light another issue regarding the use of the Medinet Habu texts and reliefs as a historical source for the identity of the Sea Peoples. The modern idea of history and historical writing, historiography, was derived directly from the ancient Greeks, and the ancient Greek writer Herodotus was one of the first to write history in the narrative form. Although his and later Greek histories were flawed due to style and substance problems, 
the methodology provided the base for modern historical studies. The ancient Egyptians, on the other hand, recorded events from their past, but usually not in narrative form, and never to be used in a didactic or scholarly sense as the Greeks and modern scholars would write a history. Egyptian historical texts were often full of symbolism, myth, and idealized to fit a certain template, which makes the historical accuracy of both the Meremptor and Ramses III's texts at least somewhat suspect. The fact that both wars were recorded in temples is also important because during the New Kingdom, when both wars took place, temples were usually replete with scenes of the Egyptian king symbolically smiting the traditional enemies of Egypt. None of this is to say that the Egyptians' wars with the Sea Peoples did not happen, they obviously did. But certain details such as the number of the enemy killed, or even the resolution of the wars themselves, may be hyperbole intended for a divine audience. The ancient Egyptian textual and pictorial evidence provides a base for identifying and naming the Sea Peoples, but in order to truly understand their origins, Historians have also had to employ linguistic and archaeological methods and techniques. Linguistically, it appears that the Egyptians referred to the Sea Peoples by already established names that were often demonyms, while archaeological evidence can help modern scholars determine where the Sea Peoples went after their last attack on Egypt. Since there are nine identified Sea Peoples tribes from the Egyptian texts, determining the origins and eventual placement of each one is difficult but reasonable determinations can be made. The Peleset tribe was a major participant in the Sea People's attack on Egypt during the reign of Ramses III, and at least partially due to their name, most modern scholars identify them with the biblical Philistines. The Peleset Philistines are also the origin of the more modern name for the region, Palestine, but disagreement persists over their geographic origin. Klein believes that where they lived before they came to Egypt, and then the Levant is unknown. But Wainwright argued that they originally called the region of Cilicia, which is where Asia Minor and the Levant meet each other, their home and were neighbours of another Sea Peoples tribe, the Cheka. The Cheka are a bit more enigmatic than the Peleset. With the latter, most scholars agree regarding the location of their origins and eventual home, but both the origins and eventual landing place of the Cheka are a mystery. Wainwright believed that the Jeka originated in Asia Minor and then settled in Greece, but more recent studies have suggested that the Jeka of Ramesses III's war may have been synonymous with the Shekelesh of Meremptor's war, which means their origins may have been in Sicily. There is more of a consensus among modern scholars regarding the final destination of the Jeka. According to an ancient Egyptian literary tale known as the Report of Wenamun, the Jeka inhabited a city named Dor in the Levant. The text states, Then Smendes and Tentamen sent me off with the ship's captain Mengabet, and I went down upon the great sea of Syria in the first month of summer, day one. I arrived at Dor, a Jeka town, and Beda, its prince, had fifty loaves, one jug of wine, and one ox haunch brought to me. This passage brings to light an interesting fact about the Cheka in particular and the Sea Peoples in general, because it suggests at least some of the Sea Peoples tribes were interested not just in raiding, but also finding a permanent home. The report of Wenamun is generally believed to have been composed during the reign of the Egyptian king, Ramses IX, in the early 11th century BC, which means that the Cheka were able to establish a city with commercial ties to other states in the Mediterranean region in less than a hundred years. Although scholars are not sure of the Cheka's geographic origins, the Shekelesh have been assigned a more definite home. The Shekelesh are generally associated with the island of Sicily, even though no archaeological evidence exists to support the claim, because hundreds of years after the Sea People's invasions, Greek colonizers of Sicily in the 8th century BC found people already living on the island known as Sicils. The Sikils claimed to be descended from Troy, almost as important as the name Sikil, which is obviously similar to Shekelesh, is the claim of Trojan descent. As already noted earlier, the destruction of Troy took place during the era of the Sea People's invasions. The Shardana, like the Shekelesh, have also come to be associated with a Mediterranean island by modern scholars. The Shardana, most notable for their horned helmets in the Egyptian pictorial reliefs, 
are generally associated with the island of Sardinia in the western Mediterranean Sea. Although the name Shardana is more than likely a demonym that refers to Sardinia, it is unknown if they originated on the island or settled there after their defeat at the hands of the Egyptians. Either way, the mention of the Shardana in the Egyptian texts and the representation of them in the pictorial reliefs were the last time this group was mentioned in any historical record. The Denin, or Danuna, were a Sea People's tribe listed in the Medinet Habu texts, but there were also other historical references to this group before the general collapse of the Bronze Age. Both Hittite and Egyptian sources mention the lands of the Denin as being located in southeastern Asia Minor, in the region known as Cilicia. Unlike the Shardana and Shekelesh, the name Denin does not appear to refer to any location, but some have argued that it may be the origin of the name of the biblical tribe of Dan. The idea that Denin Danuna became the tribe of Dan is a logical possibility, considering that both the Peleset and Cheka settled in the Levant after the war with Ramses III. Perhaps the Denin followed other Sea People's tribes into the coastal Levant region and eventually became part of the Hebrew Confederation. One of the least known of the Sea People's tribes is the Weshesh, to the extent that little is still known about their origins or final destination. An ancient Egyptian source known as the Papyrus Harris relates some of the results of Ramesses III's war with the Sea Peoples, among which is an interesting policy the Egyptian king took towards some of his defeated enemies. The text states, The Sherdan and Weshesh of the Sea, they were made as those that exist not, taken captive at one time, brought as captives to Egypt like the sand of the shore. I settled them in strongholds, bound in my name. Numerous were their classes like hundred thousands. I taxed them all, in clothing and grain from the storehouses and granaries each year. It is known that the Shardana acted as mercenaries for the Egyptians and actually fought on both sides during Ramses III's war with the Sea Peoples, but perhaps this passage suggests that the Weshish followed a similar path. One may find it strange that Ramses III would forcibly settle the hostile Weshesh tribe within Egypt's borders, but perhaps he coveted their martial skills as mercenaries, or he needed them to cultivate unused land. In the ancient Near East, it was common for powerful kingdoms to forcibly move and resettle populations deemed recalcitrant. For example, the Assyrian king Sargon II conquered and forced the relocation of the population of Samaria in the late 8th century BC, and Nebuchadnezzar II's similar act towards Judah about 150 years later is another well-known use of the tactic. Ramses III of May have figured that once the Weshesh were resettled within the borders of Egypt, the population would have been thoroughly assimilated within a few generations. The Luka are mentioned in Meremptor's war against the Sea Peoples, and as with the Shardana and Shekelesh, the name appears to be associated with a location. Most modern scholars now associate the Luka with the regions of Asia Minor, known in ancient times as Lycia and Korea. The Luka, like the Shardana, are also mentioned in other sources, before they participated in the waves of invasions that helped spell the end of the Bronze Age. At the Battle of Kadesh, they were allies of the Hittites against Ramses II and the Egyptians, but they had at that time already earned a reputation as raiders and pirates. The last two known Sea Peoples tribes, the Teresh and Ekwesh, are perhaps the most important and interesting because their descendants provided much of the impetus for the culture of the ancient Greeks. The Teresh, referred to by Herodotus as the Tyrrhenians, are generally associated with Italy geographically and the Etruscans ethnically. According to Herodotus, the Teresh originated in Lydia and then settled later in Italy. The Lydians were the first people we know of to use a gold and silver coinage and to introduce retail trade, and they also claim to have invented the games which are now commonly played by themselves and by the Greeks. These games are supposed to have been invented at the time when they sent a colony to settle in Tyrrhenia. And the story is that in the reign of Attis, the son of Manes, the whole of Lydia suffered from a severe famine. For a time the people lingered on as patiently as they could, but later, when there was no improvement, 
they began to look for something to alleviate their misery. If Herodotus's account is to be believed, then the Teresh originated in Asia Minor, like most of the other sea peoples, and then migrated to Italy. The account does not explain whether the Teresh were already established in Italy when they attacked Egypt, or if they went there after their attempts at conquest ended in failure. The final sea people tribe named by the Egyptian sources was the Ekwesh. The Ekwesh were only mentioned in the texts from Meremptor's reign, so there are no pictorial reliefs of them, but scholars have associated them with the Achaeans. Some scholars argue that the name Ekwesh was the ancient Egyptians' attempt to pronounce the word Achaeoi, which, if true, would have made the Ekwesh a Mycenaean Greek group. This raises a couple of important historical points. If the Ekwesh were Achaean Mycenaean Greeks, then they were at least partially responsible for the collapse of their own culture, because Mycenaean Greece was as adversely affected by the Sea People's raids as any other people, including the Hittites. Redford believes that the Mycenaean political system had begun to collapse by the late 13th century, so in an effort to revive it, some of the member states formed an alliance against Troy, which was a leader member of a confederacy of Asia Minor city-states. The destruction of Troy is believed to have happened around 1220 BC, which was also the beginning of the collapse of the Bronze Age and the mass movements of the Sea Peoples. It was also around the same time as Meremptor's war against the Sea Peoples. The connection between the destruction of Troy, the Ekwesh and the Sea Peoples goes beyond mere conjecture. A passage from Homer's Odyssey relates what the victors did after the sack of Troy. So for nine years we Achaeans campaigned at Troy, and after sacking Priam's city in the tenth we sailed for home and our fleet was scattered by a god. But for my unhappy self, the inventive brain of Zeus was hatching more mischief. I had spent only a month in the delights of home life with my children, my wife and my possessions, when the spirit moved me to fit out some ships and sail for Egypt with heroic companions. I got nine vessels ready, and the crews were soon mustered. Then I ordered my good men to stay by the ships on guard while I sent out some scouts to reconnoitre from the heights. But, carried away by their own violence, they went on a rampage and immediately began to plunder some of the fine Egyptian farms, carrying off the women and children and killing the men. The hue and cry soon reached the city, and the townsfolk, roused by the alarm, poured out at dawn. The whole place was filled with infantry and chariots and glint of arms. Zeus the Thunderer struck abject panic into my party. Not a man had the spirit to stand and face the enemy, for we were threatened on all sides. They ended by cutting down a large part of my force with their sharp weapons and carrying off the survivors to work for them as slaves. Although the Odyssey is an epic poem full of mythology, it contains important bits of fact particularly how the Achaeans sailed to and attacked Egypt. The passage further states that the Achaeans were unsuccessful against the Egyptians, which corroborates some of the information in the Egyptian texts. As mentioned earlier, Druze has argued that it was a change in warfare tactics that brought an end to the Bronze Age. The less sedentary and less civilised tribes, such as the Sea Peoples, developed tactics that challenged and in some cases destroyed the old established kingdoms of the Bronze Age Mediterranean region. Possibly the most important tactic that the Sea Peoples took advantage of was the superiority of infantry versus chariots. In the Bronze Age Mediterranean and Near East, many of the more powerful kingdoms, especially the Hittites and Egyptians, used chariots as the bulk of their military forces. For the most part, Infantry was used in a support role, or only against barbarian tribes who had no chariots. In fact, chariots were considered prestigious, and even a bit of a gentleman's endeavour. Both Hittite and Egyptian kings would ride chariots into battle, the most notable example being Ramses II at the Battle of Kadesh. As impressive as a chariot-led army may have looked during the Bronze Age, the Sea Peoples quickly exposed the flaws in that form of fighting, and ultimately relegated chariots to the dustbin of history. Chariots could only be practically applied on level plains against other chariots, so if armies encountered hills, mountains, marshes or other difficult terrain, chariots became useless. Chariots were also expensive because several horses were required to pull a single chariot, which would require a lot of food, 
and Bronze Age armies were also required to carry spare parts and supplies when their chariots inevitably broke down. As a result, dependence on chariot warfare meant that peoples like the Hittites and Egyptians were limited in what they could do on the battlefield, while the Sea Peoples were not restricted by the heavy costs or lack of manoeuvrability of chariots. Chariots also proved to be much more cumbersome than cavalry, and it may be no coincidence that of all the ancient Near Eastern kingdoms that survived the Bronze Age collapse, the Assyrians actually thrived and were one of the first kingdoms in the region to rely not only on infantry, but also cavalry. In a sense, the Sea Peoples not only made the chariot obsolete with infantry tactics, but arguably provided a successful template for subsequent military structures. Another tactic that the Sea Peoples employed in the late Bronze Age was the selling of their services as mercenaries. Mercenary activity is as old as man, but the Sea Peoples used it to establish themselves in the ancient Mediterranean and gain a foothold for their civilizations. The Shardana Sea People tribe is known from textual evidence to have fought as mercenaries for the Egyptians at the Battle of Kadesh, and they were even employed by Ramses III in his war against the Sea Peoples. Some modern scholars believe that the Shardana were among the elite warriors, not only of the Sea Peoples, but also among those used in the Egyptian army. The Sea Peoples may not only have worked as mercenaries for the more powerful Bronze Age kingdoms either. Druze argues that they served as mercenaries in Marie's war against Merempta in 1219 BC, and this may have been true for some of the Sea People's tribes involved in the attempted invasion, but the desire to settle in fertile Nile Valley probably was a greater incentive. The Egyptians had more material wealth than the Libyans, and could pay the Sea Peoples more for their services, but since the Sea Peoples were several different tribes, the possibility remains that a few found their way into the Libyan army as mercenaries. The Sea Peoples clearly changed the face of warfare in the ancient world with new battlefield tactics, but they also introduced new weapons that proved to be more effective than those previously used. The regions where most of the Sea Peoples originated, Asia Minor and southeastern Europe, happened to be the areas that first came into contact with the great metallurgical advances from the Balkans, which produced the long swords, shields and helmets that the Sea Peoples used. One particular new weapon that proved to be revolutionary was the flange-hilted slashing sword. The sword was first developed in Central Europe, and then made its way to the Aegean, where the Sea Peoples used this weapon to wreak havoc on the Mediterranean. The Sea Peoples also wielded other new types of swords and corselets to protect them, but more important than the actual weapons they used was the access to the supplies of materials. Since the Sea Peoples controlled the coastlines of the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean, they had a monopoly and almost unlimited supply on the copper and tin of southeastern Europe, which meant a constant supply of the new weapons they wielded. Conversely, the various kingdoms and city-states of the eastern Mediterranean became increasingly isolated and cut off from metal resources as the Sea People's attacks intensified. The vast amounts of resources and the weapons they made clearly gave the Sea Peoples an advantage over their adversaries, but ancient weapons used in new ways also helped make them superior warriors. Although the Sea Peoples employed new swords that were developed in Europe, the rank and file of the various tribes used a long spear as a primary weapon with a dagger for support. The spear and dagger combination provided the warrior with a combination to use and meant that warfare had become much more merciless because those who wielded the combination did not intend to take prisoners. Some Sea People's tribes, such as the Peleset, were even known to carry two spears into battle. The Sea Peoples were not known for archery but they did employ javelins in battle, which they probably developed from hunting game before using them in warfare. Finally, the Medinet Habu reliefs show that the Sea Peoples used round shields, which was a change from the more square-type shield used in previous periods. The round-type shield would be the standard shape used for several centuries. Archaeological and historiographical evidence has revealed much to modern scholars about the weapons and tactics employed by the Sea Peoples, but ironically, little evidence exists about the types of ships and boats they used. One would think that with the moniker Sea Peoples, 
Evidence of their maritime abilities would be abundant, but only a couple of sources exist. The Medinet Habu reliefs depict a few examples of sea people's ships, but there is only one type shown in all the examples. The sea people's ships depicted in the Medinet Habu appear to be powered by oars only, but another archaeological source may show that some of their ships may have also been powered by sails. Excavations in Tel Akko, modern-day Israel, have uncovered an ancient altar from the 13th century BC that depicts a sea people's boat with both sails and oars. The lack of evidence regarding the ships is not that surprising, considering the nature of naval warfare at the time. Ships in that period were used primarily to transport warriors to either land or other ships, where they then engaged in battle. It was only in later periods that ships were developed to be used as battering rams against other ships. Furthermore, the Sea Peoples are so named because they came from the sea to Egypt, not based on any maritime prowess that they may have possessed. The combination of weapons and new battlefield tactics employed by the Sea Peoples, especially when contrasted with the reluctance to abandon old battlefield tactics by the Hittites and other Bronze Age kingdoms, allowed them to lay waste to countless cities throughout the eastern Mediterranean region. In fact, the extent of the destruction the Sea Peoples wrought on the region was so extensive that some thriving city-states were completely destroyed and others were severely weakened. Based on all of the available textual and archaeological sources, a basic route that the bulk of the Sea Peoples took can be reconstructed. Since the Sea Peoples were a number of different tribes, they did not all follow the same route, nor did all of those who did follow the same route do so at the same time. That said, there does seem to be a general pattern. The earliest raids and destruction took place in the Aegean and then moved eastward along the coastline of Asia Minor until the Hittite kingdom was destroyed. The Sea Peoples then went south into Cilicia and into the Levant, where they ravaged numerous cities until they turned west into Egypt. It was there that they were finally repulsed during the reign of Ramses III. Sandars believes that there were two separate groups, one based on land and the other at sea, moving in this pattern simultaneously. Sandars also believes that these two coalesced in the northern Levant, with many settling down north of the Orontes River. The violence and destruction that the Sea Peoples brought to the Mediterranean began in the 14th century BC in and around the island of Crete, which came slightly before the general collapse of the Bronze Age system. Sandars argued that the destruction at Crete was essentially a dress rehearsal for the more widespread destruction that would come later, but it is, therefore, of some interest to this history. Sandars also asserted that an expeditionary force from mainland Greece attacked Crete and its primary city of Knossos in order to end the commercial dominance of the Minoans in that region. Although the Mycenaean Greeks were literate and their script Linear B has been deciphered, they never developed a large corpus of texts, so most of the evidence of the Sea People's movements in the Aegean and Greek world is archaeological in nature. In addition, Sandars points to an Egyptian tomb relief from the 15th century BC in which a Minoan ambassador was painted over and replaced with a figure wearing mainland Greek attire. The destruction that was initially directed at the Minoan culture on Crete by the Mycenaean Greeks, but they apparently turned on themselves in the late 13th and early 12th centuries BC because numerous Mycenaean cities were wiped out. After the Sea Peoples destroyed the Minoan Cretan culture, they then moved to the island of Cyprus and devastated that culture. Between 1200 and 1050 BC, the population of Cyprus withered, their main city, Enkomi, was destroyed, and the Greek language subsequently took hold. The use of native Cypriot pottery also declined precipitously and was eventually replaced by the new styles of pottery used by the invaders. Other items, such as a one-metre-high bronze statue of God with a horned helmet, testify not only to the destruction of the Cypriot culture, but also its replacement by a proto-Greek culture. This was also the period when the famed city of Troy was besieged and eventually sacked by the Achaean Mycenaean Equesh raiders, some of whom then went on to raid Egypt according to Homer. If so, the path followed by the Achaeans would have been through the sea, around Crete, and then through the sea again, until they reached Libya. 
The Achaeans' Ekwesh were then probably followed by the Teresh, Shekelesh, and Luca, while the Shardana, who were already familiar with Egypt, arrived on their own. Once in Egypt, the Sea People's tribes then allied with the Libyans and assaulted Meremptas Egypt sometime around the year 1219 BC. While some of the Sea Peoples headed toward Egypt, the majority of the Sea People's tribes moved eastward from Troy and Cyprus and set their sights on the mighty Hittite Empire. For centuries, Hatti, the kingdom of the Hittites, stood as a source of stability and power in the ancient Near East. At its height, the kingdom comprised much of Western Asia Minor, and its empire spread into the Levant to control several city-states of non-Hittite peoples. During the Late Bronze Age, the Hittites were one of the great powers of the Near East, along with Babylon, Egypt and Assyria. And although the kingdoms sometimes fought each other, the conflicts were always resolved diplomatically before any widespread destruction took place. However, the Golden Age of the Hittites came to a quick and violent end at the hands of the Sea Peoples and other inland raiders known as the Phrygians. The destruction wrought on the Hittites was as severe and complete as was done to Crete and Cyprus. Excavations at the Hittite capital city of Hattusas reveal signs of a terrible destruction to the extent that the site was abandoned for centuries. Since the Sea People's invasions cut the Hittites off from their copper source, they were no longer to make weapons to protect themselves. Thus, when the invaders attacked the northern Levant, it left the city of Hattusas isolated and unable to put up a proper defence. There is no Hittite historical record of the fall of Hattusas, perhaps due to the fact that the empire's destruction came quickly but it also may be the case that Hittite scribes were unwilling to write anything that may have angered their gods. With the utter destruction of Hatti complete, the Sea Peoples then turned south into the Levant. In the Bronze Age, the Levant was a collection of several city-states, most of which were vassals of either the Egyptians or Hittites, and the largest and most prosperous of all the Levantine cities in the 13th century BC was Ugarit which under its king Nikmadu II had formed an alliance with the Hittites and their king, Supiluliuma I. At that time, Ugarit was truly an international city on the scale of Alexandria several centuries later. Merchants from Egypt, Assyria, Cyprus and Hatti travelled to the city to trade wares and even established their own ethnic enclaves in the city. Excavations have also revealed that the people of Ugarit were literate and developed a large corpus of mythological and ritual texts. Despite being a single city-state in the Levant, Ugarit's alliance with the Hittites appears to have been a relationship of equal peers instead of one of vassal and lord, as there is no mention of any obligation by Ugarit to supply the Hittites with troops or excessive tribute payments. Ugarit may have owed its independence to its large and powerful navy that numbered as many as 150 ships at its peak which was a large navy by late Bronze Age standards. However, Ugarit's large navy would not be enough to save her, and if anything, its riches may have been what enticed the sea peoples to attack. The last king of Ugarit was named Amurapi, and it was under his reign that the city was thoroughly destroyed by the sea peoples. Unlike the destruction of Hatti, there are a number of texts from Ugarit that mention the destruction and some of the raiders. One Ugaritic text mentions a group of people known as the Shikala raiding their coastline, which may be a different pronunciation of the Shekelesh Sea People's tribe. One of the more interesting Ugaritic texts is a letter written by the last king of Ugarit to the king of Alasha, Cyprus, which was excavated centuries later in the ruins of Ugarit. The letter reads, My father, behold, the enemy's ships came, here, my cities were burned, and they did evil things in my country. Does not my father know that all my troops and chariots are in the Hittite country, and all my ships are in the land of Lycia? Thus, the country is abandoned to itself. The Ugaritic king did not know it, but by the time he wrote his letter, Cyprus had already been destroyed by the Sea Peoples. With Ugarit gone, the Sea Peoples then moved south in the Levant by ships and overland until they reached the borders of Egypt, where they lost in battle against Ramses III and the Egyptians in 1189 BC. And after their second defeat at the hands of the Egyptians, 
the sea peoples then dispersed throughout the Mediterranean, and the final chaotic chapter of the Bronze Age came to an end. With that, the Iron Age began, and new empires and cultures rose to prominence across the Mediterranean and the Near East. Early Phrygian History One of the problems that people encounter when studying the ancient Phrygians was the amorphous nature of their boundaries. Modern nation-states have clearly defined borders that, if crossed by another nation-state, can lead to war. Satellites and computer programs have clearly defined modern borders in a way that was completely unknown in the ancient world. Because of that, the boundaries of some ancient kingdoms, such as Phrygia, are not so clearly defined, even to modern scholars. The Greeks divided Phrygia into multiple parts and included non-Phrygian peoples among its inhabitants. But for the sake of clarity, the Phrygians inhabited the northwestern part of Anatolia, which was once home to the legendary city of Troy, and directly under Hittite influence during the Bronze Age. Phrygia began just south of the Hellespont, which is today known as the Dardanelles, the strait that separates Europe from Asia. The western boundary was the Aegean Sea, and to the south it bordered the kingdom of Lydia. The border between Phrygia and Cappadocia to the southeast was marked by the Halys River. The 5th century BC Greek historian Herodotus wrote, On the far side of Phrygia, one comes to the river Halys. There are gates here, which have to be passed before one crosses the river, and a strong guard post. The region adjacent to the Hellespont was normally referred to as Lesser Phrygia, while the larger area to the east was known as Greater Phrygia. The Phrygians' capital city, Gordium, was located in Greater Phrygia along the Sangarius River. Besides the fluid boundaries of the kingdoms of Anatolia and the arbitrary designation of Lesser and Greater Phrygia by the Greeks, problems with the proper identification of the Phrygians is furthered by their cultural similarity to their neighbours. In order to understand the cultural background of any ancient people, it is helpful to know the linguistic cultural group to which that group belongs. The availability of Phrygian texts has helped historians reasonably decipher their language and therefore more accurately place them in a proper cultural group, although there are still some disagreements. Most modern scholars believe that the Phrygians, like their neighbours the Lydians, probably spoke an Indo-European language. Also, like the Lydian language, some believe Phrygian was possibly related to Hittite. If Phrygian was in fact derived from Hittite, then it was possibly brought about through the destruction that brought forth the end of the Bronze Age. When the Hittite Empire collapsed around 1200 BC at the hands of the Sea Peoples, the buildings and culture were destroyed, but many of the people survived. In the centuries after the Hittite collapse, the survivors carried on speaking a modified version of the Hittite language, which became Lydian and possibly Phrygian, though not all modern scholars hold to this theory. Lydian has been definitely linked to Hittite, but many academics are not so sure about Phrygian's link to Hittite, and some even consider labelling Phrygian an Indo-European language problematic. Amelie Kurt wrote that, it is still not certain whether Phrygian belongs to the Indo-European family, and that it has no close links with the earlier Hittite or Luwian languages. Conversely, more recent studies conducted by experts in the field of Indo-European studies contradict the stances of both Masson and Court. David Anthony, who has conducted in-depth research on the origins of the Indo-European peoples, definitively places Phrygian as an Indo-European language, but occupying its own unique branch of the language family separate from the other Anatolian languages. Anthony details a chart whereby he argues that Phrygian broke off from the main trunk of Indo-European to form its own branch sometime between 1200 and 800 BC. The date of 1200 BC is interesting and important because it coincides with the Sea People's invasions, the Trojan War, and the ultimate end of the Bronze Age. Anthony and other scholars who place Phrygian as an Indo-European language do so by tracing cognates and syntax of known Indo-European languages to their origins. Anthony argues that since early Indo-Europeans invented the chariot and spread its use across Europe and Asia, then words such as wheel and wagon should be cognates or near-cognates in many of the languages. For example, 
the Phrygian word for wagon, was nearly identical to the same word in the Indo-European language Tokarian, although the two linguistic cultural groups developed in complete isolation from each other. Knowledge of the Phrygian's language and its proper linguistic cultural group classification offers some clues to their ultimate origins, but unfortunately, much is still left to conjecture. The recent anthropological and archaeological studies by scholars such as Anthony can be compared with some of the writing of the classical authors to give a more complete picture of the Phrygians' origins. Although the Phrygians were a literate people, they never developed historiographical texts, so the story of their origins from their perspective is unknown. As a result, one must use classical and Assyrian sources in order to determine the geographic origins of the Phrygians. The earliest classical accounts come from Herodotus and Xanthus of Lydia, which for the most part assign a European origin to the Phrygians. Essentially, the question of the origins of comes down to whether they were native peoples, survivors from the Bronze Age, or acclimated intruders from the early Iron Age. There is literary evidence for all three scenarios that must be examined. On face value, the idea that the Phrygians were native to Anatolia appears the most logical, but it is problematic given the nature of Anatolian history. Situated where Europe meets Asia, Anatolia has always been a bridge between worlds and a place where numerous peoples have come and gone over the millennia. The Hittites were the most notable early people to make Anatolia their home, but the region was also inhabited by Assyrians and various other people during the Bronze Age. Even during the Iron Age, when Phrygia was at its height of power, Anatolia was inhabited by several different peoples, Lydians, Greeks and various Semitic people all called the region home along with the Phrygians. So it seems that very few people could be referred to as true natives of Anatolia, but Bronze Age accounts would certainly put them closer to that status. Some of the earliest mentions of the Phrygians come from the writings of Homer. Although Homer lived several centuries after the legendary Trojan War, his accounts were culled from the oral histories of the Greek people, who were deeply affected by the war. Today, it is generally believed that the Trojan War took place sometime around the year 1200 BC and was just one battle in the long process that brought an end to the Bronze Age system of the Eastern Mediterranean and Near East. In the Homeric legends of the Trojan War, as told in the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Mycenaean Greeks conducted a ten-year siege on the city of Troy in order to reclaim the princess Helen. Today, it is believed that the Mycenaeans may have actually been a renegade band who joined in the Sea People's invasions and became known as the Ekwesh by the time they attacked Egypt years later. Meanwhile, assigning an ethnic identity to the Trojans has been a bit more problematic because while they are described by Homer as having many of the same cultural attributes as their Mycenaean enemies, some modern scholars believe they were more closely related to the Hittites. Whatever the background of the Trojans, according to Homer, they were allies with the Phrygians, and Homer counted the Phrygians among those who came to the aid of besieged Troy. Ascania strong as a god, and Phorcys led the Phrygians in from Ascania due east, primed for the clash of combat. The above reference was not the only one to the Phrygians in the Iliad. There were a total of seven references to Phrygia and the Phrygians, some of which relate a thriving culture during the late Bronze Age. In one particularly interesting passage from the Iliad, King Priam tells Helen how he battled against the legendary Amazons in his younger years. The battle apparently took place in Phrygia, which he described as a bountiful land. The passage reads, Years ago I visited Phrygia rife with vineyards, saw the Phrygian men with their swarming horses there, multitudes, the armies of Otreus, Migdon like a god, encamped that time along the Sangarius river banks, and I took my stand among them, comrade in arms the day the Amazons struck, a match for men in war. But not even those hordes could match these hordes of yours, your fiery-eyed Achaeans. All of the passages depict the Phrygians as being a well-established and successful people in Anatolia during the late Bronze Age. It should be pointed out, though, that Homer's epics are a mixture of history and myth, and therefore cannot be used exclusively as a source to locate the geographic origins of the Phrygians or to determine their age as an ethnic group. 
Fortunately, other ancient sources may corroborate Homer's accounts. During the time that the Mycenaeans were besieging Troy, a number of other powerful kingdoms existed in the Near East. As mentioned above, the Hittites occupied much of Anatolia, but to their southeast was the expansive Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians had already been around for some time when Troy was sacked, and they took advantage of the confusion and destruction caused by the Sea People's attacks to expand their empire. The Assyrians were very literate and particularly adept at historical writing. They recorded nearly all of the major campaigns of their kings on cuneiform tablets and then deposited them in archives located in their major cities. Phrygia, which the Assyrians referred to in their language as Musku or Muski, is mentioned numerous times in the Assyrian historical annals, primarily during the reign of the Assyrian king Sargon II. The references to Phrygia during the reign of Sargon II will be discussed more thoroughly below, but the earliest Assyrian mentions came not long after the Trojan War, during the reign of Tiglath-Pileser I. One text describes a rebellion against Assyrian authority that began in Phrygia, Mushki. In the beginning of my reign, 20,000 men of the land of Mushki and their five kings, who for 50 years had held the lands of Alzi and Purukutsi, which in former times had paid tribute and tax unto Assur, my lord, and no king had vanquished them in battle. In their own strength they trusted, and came down and seized the land of Kutmuhi. With the help of Assur, my lord, I gathered my chariots and my troops. I looked not behind me, Mount Kashiari, a difficult region I traversed. With their twenty thousand warriors and their five kings, I fought in the land of Kutmuhi, and I defeated them. The corpses of their warriors I hurled down in the destructive battle like the storm god. Their blood I caused to flow in the valleys and on the high places of the mountains. I cut off their heads and outside their cities, like heaps of grain, I piled them up. Their spoil, their goods, and their possessions, in countless number I brought out. I carried off six thousand men, the remainder of their troops, who had fled from before my weapons and had embraced my feet, and I counted them as inhabitants of my land. Underneath the typically violent Assyrian hyperbole of the text is the image of a reasonably strong Phrygia. The Phrygians were able to muster a considerably large army by ancient standards, 20,000 men, which would be decent-sized by even modern standards, and as the text notes, they ruled over Phrygia and two other lands for 50 years. This text, combined with the passages from the Iliad, seems to indicate that the Phrygians were native to Anatolia, or at least had been there for some time before the start of the Iron Age. One other account may also point toward the Phrygians' origins in Anatolia. The writings of Herodotus have been used by many modern historians to develop numerous theories concerning the ancient world. Many of Herodotus's statements have been proven to be false, and the historian himself even seemed to contradict his own statements from time to time. Among the problematic statements of Herodotus are those concerning the origins of the Phrygians. Herodotus seemed to believe that the Phrygians originated in Europe, not Anatolia, but he also believed that they were among the most ancient of all peoples. In one notable passage, he compares the antiquity of the Phrygians to that of the Egyptians. The Egyptians before the reign of Semeticus used to think that of all races in the world, they were the most ancient. Semeticus, however, when he came to the throne, took it into his head to settle this question of priority. And ever since his time, the Egyptians have believed that the Phrygians surpassed them in antiquity and that they themselves come second. Semeticus ordered the children to be brought to him, and when he himself heard them say Bacos, he determined to find out to what language the word belonged. His inquiries revealed that it was the Phrygian forebred, and in consideration of this, the Egyptians yielded their claims and admitted the superior antiquity of the Phrygians. Although the passage is almost certainly fantasy, it does indicate that the non-Phrygian people of the first millennium BC believed that the Phrygians were among the oldest cultures. One would think that a culture that old would have remained fairly stable in terms of their geographic location, as the Egyptians did, but Herodotus and other classical historians thought that the Phrygians actually originated in Europe. Most classical accounts concerning the Phrygians 
locate their origins just north of Greece in either Thrace or Macedonia. In his listing of all of the Persian King Xerxes's forces during their invasion of Greece in the early 5th century BC, Herodotus noted, The dress of the Phrygians was, with a few small differences like the Paphlagonian. This people, according to the Macedonian account, were known as Breges during the period when they were Europeans and lived in Macedonia, and changed their name at the same time as, by migrating to Asia, they changed their country. The Armenians, who are Phrygian colonists, were armed in the Phrygian fashion, and both contingents were commanded by Artokmes, the husband of one of Darius's daughters. The belief that the Phrygians had Southeast European origins was adhered to by later classical authors, although not all believed they came from Macedonia. The first century BC geographer Strabo wrote that the Phrygians originally hailed from Thrace. Now the Greeks used to suppose that their Getai were Thracians, and the Getai lived on either side the Ister, as did also the Mysi, their also being Thracians and identical with the people who are now called Moesi. From these Mysi sprang also the Mysi, who now live between the Lydians and the Phrygians and Trojans, and the Phrygians themselves are Brygians, a Thracian tribe, as are also the Mygdonians, the Babrycians, the Medibithinians, the Bithnians, and the Thinians, and, I think also, the Mariandinians. At this point, it is a difficult proposition for historians to reconcile the two positions. It would be perfectly logical to believe that the Phrygians migrated from southeast Europe, the short distance across the Hellespont to Anatolia, where they established their kingdom. The Proto-Phrygians may have been pushed out of their ancestral homeland by raiding and migrating Dorians and or other sea peoples, and then joined in the migrations themselves until they ended up in classical Phrygia. Antony is one of the leading scholars of ancient Indo-European archaeology and anthropology who believe that the historical Phrygians originated in southeastern Europe as a pre-Phrygian culture. The problem with that theory, though, is it does not explain the seemingly stable and long-standing kingdom described in the Homeric epics and Assyrian annals from the 12th and 11th centuries BC. It could very well be that classical Phrygia formed through a combination of both theories. Some people migrated from southeast Europe into Anatolia during the collapse of the Bronze Age and then coalesced with remnants of the Hittite culture to form Phrygia. Whatever their origins, the Phrygians would develop a kingdom that exercised an incredible amount of influence in the region by the early first millennium BC. The Height of the Phrygian Kingdom Besides the passages concerning their origins, most of the classical sources that concern the Phrygians analyse the importance of King Midas and his relations with the Greeks. But it has already been shown through the references in the Iliad and the annals from the reign of the Assyrian king Tiglath Pilsa, the first, that the Phrygians had a stable and influential regional culture by the end of the Bronze Age and the start of the Iron Age. After Tiglath Pilsawi's reign, the Assyrians continued to write about Phrygia. An annal from the reign of the Assyrian king Adad Nirari II mentions how that king, or possibly his father, potentially laid siege to a city in Phrygia. In that year, and in the month Duzu, the city which is in the land of Mushki from above the river Haber, the land Haki, as far as the city of Karkemish, which is in Hatti, he raided. Adad Nirari the second successor to Kulti Ninurata II, also mentioned an expedition against Phrygia, and his campaign was decidedly more destructive. The annals state, In Nasibina I spent the night. From there I departed. In Husarina I spent the night. From Husarina I departed. In the city which Tukulti Nurta had rebuilt, I spent the night. Over steep trails of the land of Mushki I marched. In four days I reached the city of Piru, their spoils, their goods, their cattle, their sheep, I captured. Countless numbers of them I slew. Their cities I burned with fire. The crops of their fields and their cities I caused them to occupy. Tribute greater than that of earlier times, upon them I imposed. Despite the widespread destruction the Phrygians apparently endured at the hands of Tukulti Ninurata II, the Phrygians rebounded quickly. 
Phrygia is mentioned once more in the Assyrian annals during the reign of Asonasirpal II in the early 9th century BC. And in this particular passage, the Assyrian king details an expedition he led into Anatolia, during which he destroyed cities and ultimately received tribute from the Phrygians. In this same eponymy, on the twenty-fourth day of the month Abu, as the word of Assur and Ishtar, the great gods, my lords, I departed from Nineveh, against the cities which lie at the foot of the mighty mountains of Nippur and Pasate I marched. I captured the cities of Arkun, Ushu and Palazzi, and twenty cities of their neighbourhood. Great numbers I slew, their spoil and their possessions I carried off, their cities I burned with fire. All the men who had fled from before my arms came down and embraced my feet, and I imposed force labour upon them. From the cities at the foot of the mountains of Nippur and Pasate, I departed, the Tigris I crossed, and I drew near to the land of Kutmuhi. I received tribute from the lands of Kutmuhi and Mushki vessels of copper, cattle, sheep, and wine. Although fragmentary in their mentions of Phrygia, the Assyrian texts paint a picture of a kingdom that was thriving, despite the constant danger of an Assyrian putative expedition. By the 9th century BC, it appears that the Phrygians were paying tribute as some type of agreement with the Assyrians, but the other texts show that the Phrygians were at least nominally independent and not afraid to rebel against their powerful southern neighbour. The Assyrian sources also corroborate the biblical evidence that the Phrygians were copper merchants, which was one of the sources of their wealth. The wealth of Phrygia was used to field the armies that stood against the Assyrians, as well as to beautify and to protect its cities. All of this culminated under the reign of Phrygia's most famous and only king known today by name, Midas. Of course, King Midas is known to modern people as the man with the golden touch, but he was an actual king who inspired the classical writers to marvel at his wealth. According to the 3rd century AD church historian Eusebius, Midas ruled Phrygia from about 738 to 696 BC. And besides the numerous Greek and Roman accounts of Midas, the Assyrian annals also mention the Phrygian king. In the Assyrian annals, Midas is referred to as Meta by his contemporary, Sargon II. The name of Midas was discovered on a Phrygian language monument near the ruins of a city known today as Midas City, but that is the lone extant reference by the Phrygians to their most famous king. Unfortunately, since the Phrygians kept no detailed historiographical records, Historians are forced to rely on the often biased accounts of the classical historians and Assyrian annals in order to reconstruct Phrygia's dynastic history. According to the 2nd century AD Greek historian Arian, Midas was the son of Gordius, for whom the capital of Phrygia was named. There was a story about this wagon, widely believed in the neighbourhood. Gordius, so went the tale, lived in Phrygia in the ancient days. He was poor and had but two yoke of oxen and a small plot of land to till. With one pair of oxen he ploughed, with the other he drove his wagon. One day, when he was ploughing an eagle perched on the yoke of his plough, and stayed there until the oxen were loosed and the day's work done. Gordius was troubled, and went to the seers of Telmissus to consult them about what this sign from heaven might mean, for the people of Telmissus were skilled in interpreting God's mysteries, and their women and children as well as their men inherited the gift of divination. Near a village belonging to these people, he fell in with a girl who was drawing water. He told her of the eagle, and she in reply, being herself sprung from a line of seers, advised him to return to the place where he had seen the sing, and offer sacrifice to Zeus the king. Gordius urged her to go with him and show him the form the sacrifice should take, and he performed it as she directed, and afterwards married her, and they had a son whose name was Midas. Now when Midas had grown to be a fine and handsome man, there was trouble and strife among the Phrygians, and an oracle told them that a wagon would bring them a king who would put an end to their quarrels. While they were still debating what to do about these things, Midas with his father and mother drove up in the wagon and came to a stop at their place of meeting. Taking this to be the fulfilment of the oracle, the Phrygians decided that here was the man whom the god had foretold that a wagon would bring. So they put Midas on the throne, and he made an end of their trouble and strife, and laid up his father's wagon on the Acropolis, 
as a thank offering to Zeus the king for sending the eagle. It is virtually impossible to verify the legend concerning Midas' ascension to the throne of Phrygia, but it does not matter. The Phrygians, as well as the Greeks, believed that was how their legendary leader came to rule them, and the legend of Midas' acquisition of kingship was retold by succeeding generations of Phrygians, even if some of them did not actually believe it. The wealth associated with Midas was no doubt based on fact. Excavations in both Greece and Anatolia have revealed that there was an extensive trade network between the Phrygians and Greeks, which allowed both cultures to prosper economically. One of the passages from the Iliad mentions how the Phrygian men swarmed with their horses, and Herodotus appears to confirm that Phrygia did in fact have an abundance of equines. During the time of the Persian Wars, Aristagoras attempted to entice the Spartans into joining the Ionian Greeks against the Achaemenid Persians by showing them a map of their vast and materially wealthy empire. Herodotus wrote, Aristagoras produced the map he had brought with him. Look, he continued, pointing to it. Next to the Ionians, here are the Lydians. Theirs is a fine country, rich in money. Then come the Phrygians, farther east, richest in cattle and crops of all the nations we know. Other sources show that the Phrygians also benefited from rich mineral deposits. Modern historians know much more about how Phrygia's closest neighbour, Lydia, became wealthy. They were the fortunate recipients of the Pactolus River, which provided them with the rare mineral electrum. Much less is known about the source of Phrygia's wealth, but some reasonable conclusions can be drawn from the available evidence. The excavations mentioned above show that there was a trade network between Greece and Phrygia by the time of Midas's rule, and the Old Testament clarifies what materials they traded. In the Old Testament, Phrygia and the accompanying areas, which would include Lydia and Cappadocia, were usually referred to as Mesek. In the Book of Ezekiel, a number of different peoples, including the Phrygians, are enumerated as having contact with the Israelites. Javan, Tubal and Meschek, they were thy merchants. They traded the persons of men and vessels of brass in thy market. Modern excavations of various places in Anatolia show that the mountainous regions of Phrygia were producing copper and other precious minerals long before the Phrygians were a historic people, or even before the Hittites for that matter. Since brass is an alloy of zinc and copper, the Phrygians would have been in a key trading position since they had control of the rich, copper-producing regions of Anatolia. As Phrygia's wealth and influence expanded under King Midas, so too did their problems, which came primarily from the outside. The Phrygians used this abundance of horses, cattle, crops and copper to develop trade routes throughout the eastern Mediterranean, especially with the city-states of mainland Greece. The exchanges that took place between the Greeks and Phrygians amounted to much more than livestock, minerals and vases. As discussed further below, the Greeks and Romans admired and adopted some aspects of Phrygian religion, while the Phrygians for their part also adopted some facets of Greek religion. The best example of the Phrygians' admiration of Greek culture revolved around the famed Oracle of Delphi. The legendary oracle was consulted by Greeks in order to get answers to difficult questions pertaining to subjects such as warfare, economics, and marriage alliances. The oracle was consulted by all of the different Greeks, and therefore the city of Delphi was considered neutral, even when the Greek city-states were at war with each other. The oracle was not off-limits to non-Greeks, though, as demonstrated by the Lydian king Croesus's visit there during his reign, and before Croesus of Lydia visited the oracle, Midas of Phrygia appeared to have already left his mark. Gyges was the first foreigner we know of, after King Midas of Phrygia, son of Gordius, to dedicate offerings at Delphi. Midas presented the royal throne from which used to give judgment. It stands with Gyges' bowls, and is well worth seeing. The passages do not relate if Midas asked the oracle a question, which was the most common reason to visit Delphi or, if not, why he even offered the dedication. It could be that Midas did ask a question, but that it was lost by the time Herodotus compiled his work over two hundred years later. It could also be that Midas wanted to forge closer relations with the Greeks, 
and thought that an offering to one of their holiest sites would be a good way of achieving that aim. There is also the possibility that Midas simply gave the dedication as an ostentatious display of his and Phrygia's wealth. Whatever the reason or reasons for Midas making an offering to Delphi, it had the likely desired effect that eventually the Greeks began to associate Midas and the Phrygians with wealth and luxury. The numerous Greek accounts of Midas are usually unflattering and follow a template similar to the way Croesus of Lydia was described. Both kings were depicted as arrogant, albeit not cruel or despotic, with ample amount of ostentatiousness and hubris. The Greek trope of the extremely wealthy Midas even played a role in their tales about the Phrygians' origins. Herodotus wrote of a place in Macedonia called the Gardens of Midas that was briefly to play a part in the Persian Wars. He noted, once safe on the other side, the brothers went on to another part of Macedonia, and settled near the place called the Gardens of Midas, the son of Gordius, where roses grow wild, wonderful blooms with sixty petals apiece and sweeter smelling than any others in the world. The classical authors were clearly impressed by Midas's wealth, but they were not the only people who wrote about the Phrygians' trade activities. Midas enjoyed a fair amount of stability and peace for most of his reign, but by the time the wealthy king reached his sixties, the Phrygians' enemies were knocking at his doors. Besides Phrygia's intrigues with Assyria, the kingdom suffered attacks at the hands of the semi-nomadic Cimmerians late in Midas's reign. The attacks by the Cimmerians hurt, but they were for the most part just a temporary setback, as the nomads did not desire to rule the Phrygians and moved out of the region. The true threat came from their neighbours. A text from the reign of Sargon II details how Cilicia, which was a kingdom in southern Anatolia, took advantage of the Phrygians' weakness with a surprise attack. While I was engaged in the subjugation of Bityakin and the overthrow of the Aramean tribes, and while I was waging bitter warfare against the land of Iatburu, which is on the border of Elam, my official, the governor of Cilicia, made a raid against Mita, who had not made his submission to the king who went before me, without changing his mind, sent his messenger to me, to the sea of the rising sun, offering to do service and to pay tribute and gifts. The passage is important because it not only demonstrates how Phrygia suffered an attack from one of its neighbours, but also how the Phrygians were not officially part of the Assyrian Empire at the time, as Midas had yet to make his submission to the king. This seems to suggest that the independence that the Phrygians enjoyed in earlier periods continued until Midas's reign. Another passage even seems to indicate that Midas attempted to foment rebellion around this same period. The Assyrian annals read, Mati of Atuna, who put his trust in Mita of Muski, saw the defeat of Amris and the plundering of, and his courage failed. He offered payment of tribute and tax to submit to the yoke of Assur. According to Strabo, the weight of the attacks proved to be too much for Midas. The geographer is the only source that mentions the death of Midas, and he claims that the king took his own life during the Cimmerian raids. And those Cimmerians whom they also call Trerans or some tribe or other of the Cimmerians, often overran the countries on the right of the Pontus and those adjacent to them, at one time having invaded Paphlagonia, and at another time Phrygia even, at which time Midas drank bull's blood, they say, and thus went to his doom. Ligdemus, however, at the head of his own soldiers, marched as far as Lydia and Ionia and captured Sardes, but lost his life in Cilicia. It is not known for sure if the Phrygians were invaded by the Cimmerians before the Cilicians, or the other way around, but they more than likely happened in quick succession. The Assyrian sources list Midas as the king during the Cilician attacks, so based on that, one would think that the Cimmerian attacks took place first, but Strabo's account of the Phrygian king's suicide would seem to contradict that assertion. When one analyses Strabo's account critically, though, it becomes obvious that it only says Midas drank the fatal bull's blood after the Cimmerian attacks, without saying precisely how long after the attacks. The idea that one can die from drinking bull's blood is also something that should be considered when considering the life and death of King Midas. The concept of suicide by drinking bull's blood was apparently widespread in the Hellenic world. Themistocles, the Athenian hero of the Battle of Salamis, 
was said to have committed suicide by drinking bull's blood, and numerous other leaders and heroes were also believed to have taken their lives via this method. For centuries, the accounts were never challenged, but modern scholars now know that bull's blood is not poisonous to the human body, and therefore is not deadly to drink in itself. John Marr has written that the ancient Greeks believed bull's blood was deadly because it congealed rather rapidly and was believed to induce a lethal choking effect if drank. Modern science has shown that there is nothing inherently poisonous about bull's blood and drinking it alone will not cause death. Although Midas died by another manner, from what Strabo wrote, his death probably came by his own hands and was significant enough that a classical historian wrote about it hundreds of years later and described it in a way similar to one of Greece's greatest heroes, Themistocles. Besides enriching himself and his reputation, Midas was able to use his success in trade and diplomacy to make a capital city that was on par with Athens, Sardis, Memphis and Babylon. The capital city was known as Gordium, or Gordian, which also happened to be the name of Midas's father and predecessor on the throne of Phrygia. Today, little is left of ancient Gordium other than ruins on the Anatolian plateau. But during the reign of Midas, it was both a trade centre and a fortress designed to keep out invaders such as the Chimerians. Archaeological excavations conducted in the mid-20th century show that Gordium was the dynastic and political centre of Phrygia. The majority of the population lived on the plain, which is where the Agora, or central marketplace, was located. Most of the activities of the city would have taken place in and around the Agora, but since Phrygia was not a democracy or even a republic, all of the important decisions of state were made in the royal palace. The palace was located at the centre of the city, high upon a citadel, along with other important administrative and religious buildings, much like other important cities in the ancient world. Excavations have also revealed that the city was extremely well fortified, once boasting a series of walls and ramparts. None of this was surprising to archaeologists, though, who acknowledged that the Phrygians lived in a tough and active neighbourhood. As discussed above, the Phrygians faced the constant threat of being attacked by their neighbours, the Lydians and Cilicians, and were at least nominally under the yoke of Assyria for quite some time. Gordium's location nearly in the middle of Anatolia also made it subject to raids by nomadic bands such as the Sumerians, which all contributed to Gordium specifically and Phrygia in general being a society prepared for war and siege. For the most part, the Phrygians were able to rise to the occasion and protect their lands from outsiders, which eventually led to the development of a culture as sophisticated as any of their neighbours. Unfortunately, the limited Phrygian literary corpus as it pertains to historiography is also true of religious texts. There are no Phrygian texts that detail their mythological cosmogony or day-to-day -day rituals, so once again, modern scholars are forced to combine archaeological discoveries with classical texts and the scant number of Phrygian texts in order to paint a somewhat usable image of Phrygian culture. The image that is presented is one of a fairly complex culture with many features that testify to its Indo-European origins. Although the Phrygians never developed lengthy historiographical or religious texts, they were literate and modern scholars have been attempting to decipher their written language for over a hundred years. The language itself is believed to be Indo-European derived possibly directly from Hittite, and excavations at Gordium have uncovered a number of inscriptions, primarily in a religious context. The inscriptions indicate that the Phrygians had mastered writing well before 700 BC, which would place them on par with the Lydians in that respect. Most of the inscriptions were found at what are believed to be religious sites and on vases. The Phrygian alphabet itself remains enigmatic but scholars believe that it was based on the Greek script. Besides the Phrygian language inscriptions, excavations around Gordium have also uncovered a fair amount of knowledge about Phrygian religion. Among the many cultural features of any pre-modern society, perhaps the one most visible and important to archaeologists is burial customs. The way a culture buries its people says a lot, particularly as it pertains to their philosophies on the afterlife and the importance of their deities. 
Burial customs can also tell modern scholars about the social stratification and the wealth of a society. Archaeologists at Gordium discovered that the Phrygians preferred the tumulus method of burial. A tumulus is simply a mound where the deceased and some of his, her belongs were interred. Tumulus-style burials were very common among Indo-European cultures and have varied in size depending on the culture that created them and the time period in which they were made. It should be pointed out, though, that not all Indo-Europeans made tumulus-style graves, and non-Indo-Europeans have also been known to make them throughout history. It is believed that the Phrygians introduced this style of burial to Anatolia. The Phrygian burial customs were just one part of their religion, though, as the most important aspect was their belief in the Mother Goddess. Besides King Midas, the aspect of Phrygian culture that the Greeks and Romans wrote most about was their religion, particularly their mother goddess, who they knew as Sibylle. The name Sibylle, or sometimes spelled as Kibylle, is actually a Roman name derived from uncertain origins. The Phrygian name for Sibylle was Mata, which is the Phrygian word for mother. The most complete description of the myth of Sibylle was written by the 1st century BC Greek historian Diodorus. The passage reads as follows. However, an account is handed down also that this goddess was born in Phrygia. For the natives of that country have the following myth. In ancient times, Maon became king of Phrygia and Lydia, and marrying Dindyme he begat an infant daughter, but being unwilling to rear her, he exposed her on the mountain which was called Sibylus. There, in accordance with divine providence, both the leopards and some of the other especially ferocious wild beast offered their nipples to the child and so gave it nourishment, and some women who were tending the flocks in that place witnessed the happening, and being astonished at the strange event, took up the babe and called her Sibylle after the name of the place. The child, as she grew up, excelled in both beauty and virtue, and also came to be admired for her intelligence for she was the first to devise the pipe of many reeds and to invent cymbals and kettle drums with which to accompany the fames and the dance, and in addition she taught how to heal the sicknesses of both flocks and little children. The man who associated with her and lover her more than anyone else, they say, was Marcias the Phrygian, who was admired for his intelligence and chastity. Now Sibylle, the myth records, having arrived at full womanhood, came to love a certain native youth who was known as Attis, but at a later time received the appellation Papus. With him, she consorted secretly and became with child, and at about the same time her parents recognised her as their child. Consequently, she was brought up into the palace, and her father welcomed her at the outset under the impression that she was a virgin. But later, when he learned of her seduction, he put to death her nurses and Attis as well, and cast their bodies forth to lie unburied. Whereupon Sibylle, they say, because of her love for the youth and grief over the nurses, became frenzied and rushed out of the palace into the countryside, and crying aloud and beating upon a kettle drum, she visited every country alone, with hair hanging free, and Marcias, out of pity for her plight, voluntarily followed her, and accompanied her in her wanderings because of the love which he had formerly borne her. But the myth goes on to say, a pestilence fell upon human beings throughout Phrygia, and the land ceased to bear fruit, and when the unfortunate people inquired of the god how they might rid themselves of their ills, he commanded them, it is said, to bury the body of Attis and to honour Sibylle as a goddess. Consequently, the Phrygians, since the body had disappeared in the course of time, made an image of the youth, before which they sang dirges and by means of honours in keeping with his suffering, propitiated the wrath of him who had been wronged. And these rites they continue to perform down to our own lifetime. As for Sibylle, in ancient times they erected altars and performed sacrifices to her yearly, and later they built for her a costly temple in Pisinus of Phrygia, and established honours and sacrifices of the greatest magnificence, Midas their king taking part in all these works out of his devotion to beauty. And beside the statue of the goddess, they set up panthers and lions, since it was the common opinion that she had first been nursed by these animals. The passage presents several interesting details about Sibylle, 
but most historians are quick to point out that the Greek and Roman concepts of the goddess were quite different than that of the Phrygians. Matar's name appears on nine different Phrygian language inscriptions, and her image has been discovered on a plethora of different statues and reliefs in Anatolia. Some believe that the possible Thracian origins of the Phrygians as a people can be seen in Matar's similarities with the primary ancient Thracian deity, who was also a female. Interestingly, Matar may have been not only the Phrygians' primary deity, but also their only deity. There are no representations of other deities in Phrygia, and the only mention by classical authors of any other Phrygian deities was to Sibylle's consort, Attis. It should be noted that Attis was only worshipped as a god at a much later date when Phrygia was no longer independent. This revelation has led some to believe that the Phrygians practiced an early form of monotheism, but there is currently no hard evidence of that either. For a religion to be considered truly monotheistic, it would have to deny the existence of all other gods, and presently there is no evidence that the Phrygians denied the existence of deities other than Matar. Put simply, no other textual or archaeological evidence has been discovered that articulates a Phrygian belief in only one or many gods. As enigmatic as Matar's origins are, her worship and the rituals relating to her cult are equally mysterious. So far, modern archaeologists have uncovered no temple, at least in the traditional sense of the word, that was dedicated to Matar or her cult. It appears that instead of having specifically designated sacred spaces, the cult of Matar often conducted their rituals in rural settings, usually on mountaintops, like their Hittite predecessors. Although many of the ritual locations have been located by modern scholars due to the dearth of Phrygian sources, little is known about her rituals. Scholars do believe that her worship involved music, but not to the extent that the Romans used music to accompany their worship of Sibylle. Despite there being very little Phrygian language written material about Matar, or any other aspect of Phrygian religion for that matter, a number of artistic representations of the goddess have survived the sands of time. A number of statues, reliefs and figurines that depict Matar have been discovered throughout Anatolia, from different historical periods, which show how the Phrygians thought of their primary deity. Mata was usually accompanied by some type of falcon or a bird of prey, which indicates that the goddess had protective qualities. When not accompanied by a bird of prey, Matar was shown with lions and other fantastic creatures. These attributes show Matar not as the modern concept of a Mother Earth deity who frolics through fields of daisies, but more so as a goddess who represents strength and power, in an active and somewhat martial manner that can benefit mankind. By the time the Greeks and Romans took hold of Matar, they changed her name to Sibylle, and along with it many of her attributes. To the Romans, Sibylle became an urban goddess who was associated with the Romans' victory over the Carthaginians in the Punic Wars, when she was brought to Rome in 204 BC. Sibylle was then given a temple on the Palatine Hill, which was a far cry from the mountaintop shrines dedicated to Matar in Phrygia. As Sibylle became an official state deity of Rome, her rituals, festivals and iconography changed to the point where her origins as the Phrygian matter were no longer recognisable. Although not as popular as in Rome, the Greeks also worshipped Sibylle, but did so as a mystery cult, which was far different than the original way Matar was worshipped in Phrygia. Phrygia's Decline Like nearly every society that existed in the ancient world, Phrygia experienced a decline that eventually resulted in the loss of its independence. Because there is a lack of primary Phrygian sources, it is difficult to determine where to attribute the origins of the decline, but in most other major kingdoms, societies and civilizations that have collapsed, the decline usually began from within. Social and economic problems ravaged Rome long before it fell victim to the barbarian hordes, for example, and a similar pattern can be seen in most pre-modern societies. Egypt, Mesopotamia and medieval China all experienced declines that were similar to Rome's. Based on this, it would seem safe to say that Phrygia experienced internal problems before it was invaded by the Cilicians and Cimmerians and eventually conquered by the Lydians. A number of primary sources chart the decline, although they offer few explanations. During the reign of Midas, 
Phrygia was at the peak of its power, although it was still under the suzerainty of the Assyrians to a certain extent. According to the Assyrian annals, in Sargon II's fifth year of rule, the king of Carchemish instigated an Anatolian rebellion against his Assyrian overlords. In my fifth year of reign, Pisiri of Carchemish sinned against the oath by the great gods and sent messages of hostility against Assyria to Meta of the land of Muski. I lifted my hand to Assur, my lord, and brought him and his family out of his city in chains. Gold, silver, together with the property of his palace, and the rebellious people of Carchemish, who were with him, with their goods, I carried off and brought them into Assyria. Fifty chariots, two hundred steeds, three hundred foot soldiers, I selected from among them, and added them to my royal host. People of Assyria, I settled in Carchemish and placed the yoke of Assur, my lord, upon them. Although this rebellion was discussed before, and how it affected the apex of Phrygia's power, it also serves to demonstrate the beginning of its decline. Building an empire is all about taking risks, and apparently Midas believed that siding with Carchemish against Assyria was a worthwhile risk. The gamble may have paid off in another situation, but the Phrygians had the bad luck of being attacked by the Cimmerians and Cilicians around the same time. The result was that Phrygia was severely weakened and thus fell from the apex of the Anatolian power hierarchy until it was replaced by its neighbours, the Lydians. Despite its declining status, Phrygia continued to exist as an independent and somewhat influential kingdom well into the 6th century BC. When Croesus became the king of Lydia in the middle of the 6th century BC, he embarked on an ambitious campaign to make his kingdom one of the leaders in the eastern Mediterranean region. He was lucky enough to inherit plenty of wealth and the world's most advanced economic system from his predecessors, which he promptly used to conquer the rest of Anatolia. According to Herodotus, the process was extremely quick. In the course of time, Croesus subdued all the peoples west of the river Halis, except the Cilicians and Lycians. The rest he kept in subjection, Lydians, Phrygians, Mysians, Mariandinians, Calibians, Paphlagonians, Thracians, both Thinian and Bithynian, Carians, Ionians, Dorians, Aeolians and Pamphylians. Once the Phrygians were incorporated into the Lydian kingdom, it became increasingly difficult for non-Anatolian peoples to differentiate between the Lydians and Phrygians. Despite the definite setback that the Lydian conquest was for Phrygian culture, they continued to exist as a unique culture for nearly another 500 years. Not long after Croesus conquered Anatolia, he decided to face off against the mighty Achaemenid Persian Empire. As noted above, it takes risks and gambles to make an empire, and as Midas failed in his gamble to make the Phrygians the premier people of Anatolia, Croesus failed in his attempt to defeat the Persians. In 546 BC, Western Anatolia, including Phrygia, fell under the rule of the Persians when Cyrus the Great defeated Croesus and the Lydians. Phrygian cultural identity was diluted to a certain extent when Phrygia was conquered by the Lydians, but Anatolia became an even bigger morass when the Persians took control. When the Persians conquered new territory, they incorporated kingdoms into their empire based more on ethnicity than geography. The system worked well for most subject peoples, who also corresponded with a specific geographic region, such as Egypt or Babylon, for example. Anatolia, though, presented the Persians with a unique problem, because there were several long-standing cultural groups all within close proximity to each other. Instead of creating a province or satrapy for each ethnic group in Anatolia, the Persians consolidated several into one satrapy. During the rule of Xerxes I in the early 5th century BC, the Phrygians were considered part of Persia's third satrapy, along with several other peoples. Herodotus wrote, Third, the people on the southern shore of the Hellespont, the Phrygians, the Thracians of Asia, the Paphlagonians, Mariandinians, and Syrians, 360 talents. The number of Persian satrapies fluctuated throughout the lifetime of the Achaemenid Empire and the Phrygians were counted as different satrapies during the reigns of different Achaemenid kings. Although tightly under the control of the mighty Achaemenid Empire and no longer independent, 
Phrygia and the Phrygians continued to play a role in the history of the ancient world. One of the more interesting incidents to take place in Phrygia during its post-independence period took place early in the rule of the Persian king Darius I, who came to the throne through rather dubious circumstances. According to both Herodotus and Persian inscriptions from Darius's tomb at Behistun in Iran, Cambyses was assassinated by an impostor who then briefly ruled as king. Through the help of his god Ahura Mazda, Darius I eventually killed the usurper and became king of the Achaemenid Empire himself. The situation led to instability within the Achaemenid Empire, with many of the satrapies rebelling against Persian rule, and Phrygia was at the centre of the rebellion. According to Herodotus, the satrap of Phrygia and Lydia decided to take advantage of the situation and make himself king in the style of Midas and Croesus. Darius, once his power was established, was anxious to punish Oroites for his many crimes, and not least for the murder of Mitrobates and his son. He thought it would be unwise, things being as they were, to send an armed force openly against him, for the country was still in an unsettled state. He himself has only recently come to the throne, and he knew that Oroetes was a powerful man, being governor of Phrygia, Lydia and Ionia, with a thousand Persians in his bodyguard. Darius had recourse in consequence to subtler methods, and called a meeting of the leading men in the country. His object in this was to test the loyalty of Oroetes's bodyguard in case they might be willing to act against their master. When, therefore, he noticed that they regarded the documents with respect, and still more, the words they heard read from them. He passed one to the secretary which contained an order, purporting to come from Darius, to the effect that the guards were to refuse service to Oreoetes. The order was read out, and the guards promptly laid their spears at Bagaeus's feet. Then Bagaeus, seeing the written order obeyed, ventured to hand to the secretary the paper he had reserved till last. This contained the words, King Darius commands the Persians in Sardis to kill Oreoetes. The guards immediately drew their scimitars and dispatched him, and that was how Oroetes the Persian was punished for his betrayal of Polycrates. After Darius I put Oreotes to death, Phrygia never again rebelled against Achaemenid authority. Another problem the Persians had with the region is that the number of satrapies the Persians claimed fluctuated, but there were always twenty to twenty-four satrapies listed on any monument. Among the monuments that listed the Achaemenid Empire's subject peoples, the statue of King Darius I discovered in the ruins of the ancient city of Susa in 1972 provided an important example concerning how the Persians viewed the Phrygians. On the base of the statue are inscriptions of 24 of the Persian subject peoples, each with distinct ethnic facial features and wearing their traditional garb. Each representative kneels on top of a ring fortress, which looks much like an ancient Egyptian cartouche that contains the name of the group written in the Egyptian hieroglyphic script. The figures are arranged according to geographic proximity. For example, the Egyptian, Libyan and Nubian are the 20th, 21st and 22nd peoples depicted, respectively. Although there is no Phrygian listed on the base as a distinct people, there are two other groups, that more than likely incorporated the remnants of the Phrygian people. The people occupying the 17th position on the base of the Darius statue are known as Scudra, or the Scudrans. Modern scholars believe that Scudra was the ancient Persian name for Thrace, and that due to their possible origins and their style of dress, the Phrygians may have been included with this delegation. The other possibility for the Phrygians' inclusion in the Darius statue was Delegation 15. Lydia. As noted above, the Phrygians and Lydians essentially shared Anatolia for hundreds of years, and as much as the two kingdoms were rivals, they also had many cultural affinities. The Phrygians and Lydians may not have seen themselves as being very similar, but outsiders such as the Persians certainly viewed them as such. Some researchers have noted that the Lydian is the only representative of the Hellenic peoples on the statue and that they were representative of the entire region, which included the Ionian Greeks. Based on the incident discussed above, where Darius I had Oroates, 
the satrap of Phrygia, Lydia, and Ionia. Killed? It certainly seems that the Persians considered the Phrygians and Lydians interchangeable, at least during his reign. But however the Persians viewed the Phrygians, it is clear that their status diminished after the Persian conquest. With that said, there is evidence that the Phrygian capital continued to be an important regional centre. Gordium became a great city during the reign of King Midas, but it continued to be important long after his death. When the Persians began to compile their immense empire under Cyrus, they often left the local kingdoms fairly intact, only requiring some type of tribute. For the most part, things did not change very much when the Persians took control of Phrygia, but the Persians did add one innovation that was important to Gordium's continued importance, roads. The royal road in particular began in Sardis and snaked its way across Anatolia, terminating in Susa. Archaeological excavations at Gordium have revealed that the area near Gordium was crossed by the royal road. The presence of the royal road near Gordium was enough to not only keep the city prosperous, but also to temporarily raise the level of Phrygia's prestige. Phrygia became an official satrapy in the 4th century, but it would only enjoy that status for a couple of decades before the conquests of Alexander the Great. In 334 BC, the on-again, off-again conflict between the Greeks and Persians was about to come to a head. Alexander the Great had just conquered mainland Greece and set his sights to the east and the Achaemenid Empire. The route of his conquests was a bit circuitous, but it included nearly every important kingdom in the Near East. His first stop was Anatolia to conquer the Lydians, Phrygians and Ionian Greeks. After crossing the Hellespont, Alexander landed in Lesser Phrygia, near the area of ancient Troy, which the Greek writers often referred to as Troad. According to a garbled passage from Diodorus, Alexander knew that he would be able to take Phrygia when he noticed a damaged statue of a former Phrygian satrap. As the king began his march out of the Troad and came to the sanctuary of Athena, the sacrificiant named Alexander noticed in front of the temple a statue of Ariobarzanes, a former satrap of Phrygia, lying fallen on the ground, together with some other favourable omens that occurred. He came to the king and affirmed that he would be victor in a great cavalry battle, and especially if he happened to fight within the confines of Phrygia. He added that the king with his own hands would slay in battle a distinguished general of the enemy. Such, he said, were the portents the gods disclosed to him, and particularly Athena, who would help him in his success. The passage is a bit garbled because it mentions Alexander the king and another Alexander, as if they were two different people, but in all reality they were more than likely one and the same. But despite problems with the passage, it demonstrates that Phrygia was still an important place and was a vital strategic point in Alexander's conquest of the Achaemenid Empire. After winning battles in Lesser Phrygia, Alexander and his army continued inland to Greater Phrygia and Gordium. Although Gordium had by this time lost much of the luster it had acquired during the reign of Midas, it was still an important regional centre, and Alexander knew that he had to conquer Gordium and the rest of Phrygia if he was to continue south to the Levant. According to Arian, Gordium was well stocked with supplies and men, and ready to withstand a long siege, but the satrap instead decided to surrender to Alexander. Arian wrote, The town of Selenai has a lofty central stronghold, sheer all round, and this was garrisoned by a thousand Carian troops and one hundred Greek mercenaries, who took their orders from the Persian governor of Phrygia. The garrison sent Alexander an offer to surrender the town, provided that no reinforcements arrived on a certain day on which they had agreed to expect them, which date they specified. And it seemed better to Alexander to accept this arrangement than to attempt the reduction by siege of such an unassailable position. Accordingly, he left a force of some 1,500 men to watch the town, and after a wait of ten days, marched for Gordium. To Parmenio, he sent orders to meet him at Gordium with the troops under his command and the orders were duly carried out. The recently married Macedonians who had been sent home on leave also rejoined at Gordium with a force of freshly levied troops, 3,000 Macedonian infantry and about 300 horse, 200 Thessalian horse, 
and 150 men from Elis, under their own commander, Alcaeus. Gordium is in Hellespontine Phrygia. The town stands on the river Sangarius, which rises in Phrygia and runs through Bithynian Thrace into the Black Sea. Instead of immediately moving on with his army south to the Levant, Alexander stayed to muster his troops, resupply, and take part in an act that has become more fiction than fact. As discussed earlier, Gordium, like many important cities in the ancient world, was home to an oracle, and according to Arian's account, the oracle said that a wagon would bring the Phrygians a king who would end their problems. The man who brought them the wagon turned out to be none other than Midas. Arian also recounts that another prophecy associated with the wagon concerned how the man who undid its knot would become the ruler of Asia. There was also another traditional belief about the wagon. According to this, the man who undid the knot which fixed its yoke was destined to be the lord of Asia. The cord was made from the bark of the cornel tree, and so cunningly was the knot tied that no one could see where it began or where it ended. For Alexander, then, how to undo it was indeed a puzzle, though he was nonetheless unwilling to leave it as it was, as his failure might possibly lead to public disturbances. Accounts of what followed differ. Some say that Alexander cut the knot with a stroke of his sword and exclaimed, I have undone it. But Aristobulus thinks that he took out the pin, a sort of wooden peg which was driven right through the shaft of the wagon and held the knot together, and thus pulled the yoke away from the shaft. I do not myself presume to dogmatize on this subject. In any case, when he and his attendants left the place where the wagon stood, the general feeling was that the oracle about the untying of the knot had been fulfilled. Moreover, that very night, there was lightning and thunder, a further sign from heaven. So Alexander, on the strength of all this, offered sacrifice the following day to the gods who had sent the from heaven and proclaimed the loosing of the knot. After that encounter, Alexander did in fact go on to conquer Western Asia and Egypt, while Gordium and Phrygia fell into obscurity. With that said, after Alexander returned from India with his army to Mesopotamia, he gave a speech to his troops that enumerated the most prominent lands they conquered. I borrowed a further sum of 800 talents, and marching out from a country too poor to maintain you decently, laid open for you at a blow, and in spite of Persia's naval supremacy, the gates of the Hellespont. My cavalry crushed the satraps of Darius, and I added all Ionia and Iolia, the two Phrygias and Lydia, to your empire. Miletus I reduced by siege, the other towns all yielded of their own free will. I took them and gave them you for your profit and enjoyment. The wealth of Egypt and Cyrene, which I shed no blood to win, now flows into your hands. Palestine and the plains of Syria and the land between the rivers are now your property. Babylon and Bactria and Susa are yours. You are masters of the gold of Lydia, the treasures of Persia, the wealth of India. The last vestiges of Phrygian culture were then appropriated by the Greeks and Romans based on their perceived exotic nature. The cult of Matar became Sibylle and lost most of its original meaning, while Phrygia itself quickly faded into obscurity. The ever-expansive Romans eventually conquered Anatolia, which they referred to as Asia Minor, in the first century BC, and most of what was once Phrygia became the Roman province of Galatia. The Cultural Background of the Lydians The kingdom of ancient Lydia was one of several kingdoms to emerge in Anatolia, roughly the geographic equivalent of modern Turkey, after the collapse of the Hittite Empire at the hands of the Sea Peoples, around 1200 BC. Besides Lydia, the kingdoms of Uratu and Phrygia emerged as important successor states to the Hittites in the early first millennium BC. Although most of Lydia was within the Anatolian interior, there were some notable population centres on the Mediterranean coastline. The most important Lydian city was Sardis, which was located inland and only accessible to the sea by river or roads. In fact, the 5th century BC Greek historian Herodotus wrote that the only site worth seeing in Lydia was the capital city of Sardis. Herodotus noted, The country, unlike some others, has few marvels of much consequence for a historian to describe, except the gold dust which is washed down from Tumulus. It can show, however, the greatest work of human hands in the world, apart from the Egyptian and Babylonian. I mean the tomb of Croesus's father, Aliatis.
The wealth that the gold deposits of Sardis produced for the Lydians will be discussed more thoroughly below, but Herodotus also noted that as a result of the deposits, the Lydians were a nation of shopkeepers. The Greeks generally took a neutral to negative view toward economic endeavours, and they saw the Lydians' affinity for business with complexity. Greeks who visited Sardis were impressed with its beauty, but they also viewed the Lydians' pursuit of money as an obsession. Historians like Herodotus were often quick to point out what they viewed as immoral methods that the Lydians sometimes used to acquire their wealth. According to Herodotus, the Lydians not only accepted prostitution, but they promoted the world's oldest profession as a legitimate way to make money. Working-class girls in Lydia prostitute themselves, without exception to collect money for their dowries, and continue the practice until they marry. They choose their own husbands. Although Herodotus's statements about Lydian culture are tinged with bias, and possibly a degree of sensationalism, they do provide a contextual background for the daily lives of the average Lydian. While given the ancient sources, there is no doubt that the Lydians were truly a people of commerce, their ethnic origins remain a bit more obscure. Lydia was essentially a successor state to the collapsed Hittite Empire. An investigation of the Lydian language reveals that the Lydian people may have been directly related to the Hittites, Indo-Europeans who migrated to Anatolia sometime before 2000 BC. The Hittites were the first Indo-Europeans to develop writing, around 1900 BC, and by the time they established dominance over most of Anatolia by the middle of the second millennium BC, there were three closely related Indo-European languages spoken in the region, Hittite, Luwian, and Palic. The Lydian language was determined by modern scholars to be a later form of Luwian, and they came to this conclusion by translating a number of bilingual, Aramaic Lydian inscriptions from Sardis. Early historians were able to determine that the Lydian language agreed in syntactical structure with Luwian, and was therefore a Hittite-related language. Although scholarly knowledge of Lydian is still in the infant stage, what is known has determined that the Lydians were essentially ancestors of the Hittites, but the question remains if the Lydians descended from actual survivors of the Hittite collapse, or if they were non-Indo-European peoples who coalesced and adopted Luwian as their language. Scholars remain divided on this point, and a definite answer will probably never be known unless a greater collection of Lydian-era texts surface. The chronology of the Lydian kings and the important events associated with those rulers has been culled by modern researchers from a variety of ancient sources that includes Herodotus, deciphered local Lydian inscriptions, and contemporary Near Eastern inscriptions from kingdoms such as Assyrian and Babylon. As is the case with many ancient kingdoms, Lydia's early history remains shrouded in mystery as the lines between legend and history were often blurred. In addition, though Herodotus's account is the most complete ancient source on Lydian history, it should be treated with a certain degree of scepticism, as the historian was more concerned with the Greek cities and their relations to the Lydians than recording pure Lydian history. Even so, Herodotus's writings still offer a solid base from which Lydian chronology may be reconstructed. According to Herodotus, the oldest Lydian dynasty was known as the Herculid, because its kings were believed descended from the legendary Greek hero. The idea that the Lydians could trace their kings back to Hercules may have been a point of pride for Lydians of the period. But the reality is that their origins are more likely found not too far from home. Lydian linguistic origins, for example, point toward a Hittite source, but the name of the last Lydian king of the Herculid dynasty, Candoles, also known as Mirillus, a conspicuously Anatolian sounding name, also indicates as much. In fact, Mercilis, or Mercili, was a popular name used by three different Hittite kings. Some scholars believe Candolis slash Mirillus may have even been a direct descendant of the Hittite kings. It is nearly impossible to determine an exact date when the Herculid dynasty began using Herodotus alone, but modern scholars have been able to determine an approximate date when the dynasty ended. Around 680 BC, the Herculid dynasty was overthrown and replaced by the Mermnidae dynasty, which ruled Lydia until it was conquered by the Achaemenid Persians around 546 BC.
Herodotus' account of the overthrow of the Hercolids is quite detailed and somewhat lurid. According the ancient historian Candaules, the Hercolid king offered to let his friend Gyges watch his wife undress, but when the queen found out about the plan, she turned on her husband. Herodotus wrote, The sovereignty of Lydia, which had belonged to the Heraclids, passed into the family of Croesus, the Myrmnidae, in the following way. Candaules, king of Sardis, the Greeks call him Merciless, was descended from Alcaeus, son of Heracles. One day, the king, who was doomed to a bad end, said to Gyges, It appears you don't believe me when I tell you how lovely my wife is. Well, a man always believes his eyes better than his ears, so do as I tell you, contrive to see her naked. Gyges, she said, as soon as he presented himself, there are two courses open to you, and you may take your choice between them. Kill Candles and seize the throne with me as your wife, or die yourself on the spot, so that never gains may your blind obedience to the king tempt you to see what you have no right to see. One of you must die, either my husband, the author of this wicked plot, or you who have outraged propriety by seeing me naked. Night came, and he followed her into the bedroom. She put a knife into his hand, and hid him behind the same door as before. Then, when Candualis was asleep, he crept from behind the door and struck. Thus Gyges usurped the throne and married the queen. Gyges was able to not only establish the Myrnidais as a viable dynasty, but he was also the first king to make Lydia a regional power. Gyges ruled for about thirty years, and in that time he made contacts with a number of non-Lydian peoples who would influence the course of the Anatolian kingdom. When Gyges became king of Lydia, the Assyrian Empire was the most powerful kingdom in the region, so it was imperative for the new king to make peace with his powerful southern neighbours in order to ensure the survival of the Myrmnidae dynasty. Assyrian texts from the period refer to the Lydian kingdom during the reign of Gyges as fairly new, but also subservient to the major power. Gyges, king of Lydia, a province on the other side of the sea, a distant region whose name the kings who went before me, my fathers had not heard mentioned. Assur, the god who created me, revealed the honoured name of my majesty to him in a dream, saying, Lay hold of the feet of his highness, Assurbanipal, king of Assyria, favourite of Assur, king of the gods, lord of all, and revere his kingship, implore the favour of his lordship, as of one doing homage and paying tribute, let thy prayers come to him. It was a common practice in the ancient Near East for militarily weaker kingdoms to pay tribute to those stronger. The tribute-paying kingdoms were usually given protection by the tribute-receiving kingdoms from other kingdoms, or in the case of Lydia during the reign of Gyges, against various tribes of semi-nomadic peoples. The Chimerians and Scythians proved to be a problem for Lydia during the 8th and 7th centuries BC in particular. According to the Assyrian annals, Gyges was able to deal with these tribes himself, although the text does indicate some level of Assyrian support. The text reads, Gyges, king of Lydia, a district of the other side of the sea, a distant place whose name, the kings, my fathers had not heard, Assur the god my creator, caused to see my name in a dream. Lay hold of the feet of Asabanipal, king of Assyria, and conquer thy foes by calling upon his name. On the day that he beheld this vision, he dispatched his messenger to bring greetings to me. An account of this vision, which he beheld, he sent to me by the hand of his messenger, and made it known to me. From the day that he laid hold of my royal feet, he overcame, by the help of Assur and Ishtar, the gods, my lords, the Chimerians, who had been harassing the people of his land, who had not feared my fathers, nor had laid hold even of my royal feet. From among the chieftains of the Sumerians, whom he had conquered, he shackled two chieftains with shackles, fetters of iron, manacles of iron, and sent them to me, together with his rich gifts. Lydia was firmly within the Assyrian realm of influence during the reign of Gyges, but the Lydian king also made overtures to other, important, near eastern kingdoms. In the approximately thirty years that Gyges was on the throne of Lydia, he would have witnessed the quick decline of the Assyrian Empire. Assyrian king Asabanipal was an especially aggressive ruler, 
as he was able to expand Assyria's borders by conquering Egypt in 664 BC. But the control was ephemeral, and when the Assyrian king died, the empire quickly unraveled. Gyges may have viewed the weakness of Assyria with a Machiavellian eye, as Herodotus wrote that mercenaries from Ionia showed up in Egypt just after the Assyrians were expelled, during the reign of Samtek I, which happened to coincide with the reign of Gyges. Herodotus wrote, It so happened that a company of sea raiders from Ionia and Korea were forced by bad weather to land on the Egyptian coast. They wore bronze armour, and an Egyptian, who had never seen such a thing before, hurried off to the marshes and told Semeticus that bronze men had come from the sea and were plundering the country. Seeing in this the fulfilment of the oracle, Semeticus made friends with the raiders, and by the promise of rich rewards persuaded them to enter his service, and by their help and the help of his supporters in Egypt, defeated and deposed his eleven enemies. The passage never mentions Gyges or Lydia, but since Lydia was part of Ionia, and since Gyges was king of Lydia during this event, there is a good chance he was the one to send the mercenaries. Gyges clearly took a conservative approach to geopolitics in the eastern Mediterranean. Pay tribute if you must, and make friends wherever you can. Gyges's geopolitical policies appear to have been followed by his successors. Herodotus and the other ancient sources are vague concerning the details of the reign of the next two Lydian kings, Ardis and Sadiates. According to Herodotus, Ardis, like his predecessor, was burdened with attacks by the Chimerians. His account relates, Ardis took Preen and attacked Miletus, and during his reign the Cimmerians, driven from their homes by nomadic Scythian tribes, came to Asia and captured Sardis, except for its citadel. This account indicates that although Lydia was still threatened by nomadic raiders during the reign of Ardis, the Lydian king apparently felt secure enough in his political position to attack and conquer other cities on the Ionian coastline. Ardis's aggressive policy toward Lydia's Anatolian neighbours was duplicated by his successors to varying degrees. Herodotus wrote little about Sadiates other than that he was Ardis's successor and reigned for twelve years. His treatment of Syates's successor, Aliates, who ruled from about 610 to 560 BC, was much more complete. According to the historian, Aliates managed to eliminate the barbarian threat to Lydia and then expanded his kingdom's borders. Aliates made war with the Medes under Chiaxeres, grandson of Deoses, expelled the Chimerians from Asia, captured Smyrna, a city which had been founded by people from Colophon, and attacked Clazomenae, where he did not succeed as he hoped, but met with disaster. Furthermore, to continue the tale of what was most memorable during his reign, Aliates carried on the war which he had taken over from his father against the Milesians. His custom each year was to invade Milesian territory when the crops were ripe, marching in to the music of pipes, harps, and treble and tenor oboes. On arrival he never destroyed or burned the houses in the country, or pulled their doors off, but left them unmolested. He would merely destroy the trees and crops, and then retire. The reason for this was the Milesian command of the sea, which made it useless for this army to attempt a regular siege. The Lydians refrained from demolishing houses, in order that the Milesians, having somewhere to live, might continue to work the land and sow their seed, with the result that they themselves would have something to plunder each time they invaded their country. The war between the Lydians and Milesians, which began during the reign of Sadiatis, waged for twelve years before Aliates made peace with them. Herodotus's account of the Lydian-Milesian War has been corroborated by modern archaeological excavations in Smyrna, and archaeological excavations have also confirmed that Aliates conquered the neighbouring Anatolian kingdom of Phrygia. A massive Lydian fortress unearthed there points to a military presence, and the discovery of Lydian pottery indicates the conquered Phrygians had assimilated aspects of the Lydian culture. The Milesians and Phrygians managed to build kingdoms, impressive in their right, but neither established themselves as military threats, which no doubt left them vulnerable to outside forces. By the middle of the 6th century BC, the Lydians had established military, economic and political hegemony over most of Anatolia, and few in the region could challenge them in any of those respects. The Medes, however, 
mentioned in the above passage, were one of the premier military powers in the Near East during this period, and posed a definite threat to Lydian power. The Medes were an Indo-European ethnic group from Persia, who, along with the Neo-Babylonians, toppled the mighty Assyrian Empire when they sacked Nineveh in 612 BC. As the Median and Neo-Babylonian empires expanded, so too did the Lydian kingdom, which put them on a direct collision course with the Medes. According to Herodotus, a group of Scythians wanted for murder by the Medes fled to Lydia and Aliates, who agreed to give them protection. Chiaxeres demanded that they should be given up, but when Aliates refused, war subsequently broke out between the two countries and continued for five years, during which both Lydians and Medes won a number of victories. One battle was fought at night. But then, after five years of indecisive warfare, a battle took place in which the armies had already engaged when day was suddenly turned to night. Both the Lydians and Medes broke off the engagement when they saw this darkening of the day. They were more anxious than they had been to conclude peace, and a reconciliation was brought about by Cyanesus of Cilicia and Labinetus of Babylon, who were the men responsible for the pact to keep the peace and for the exchange of marriages between the two kingdoms. Aliates established a diplomatic system, followed by his successor, which involved a continued marriage alliance with the Medes and further contact and alliances with Lydia's other powerful neighbours. Lydian Religion Understanding Lydian religion, like the chronology of the kingdom, is an often difficult proposition, because there are few extant Lydian religious texts. Again, Herodotus gives modern scholars a glimpse into royal Lydian religious practices, but there appears to be a gulf between the religion of the nobles and that of the majority of Lydians. The primary sources, both Greek and Lydian, indicate Lydian rulers favoured a more Hellenic religion, while archaeological discoveries indicate the majority of Lydians practised a more native Anatolian religion, closer to that of the Hittites. An examination of primary sources demonstrates that Lydian kings followed many aspects of the Hellenic religion, at least outwardly. Beginning with Geigers, the Oracle of Delphi played an important role in the decision-making of Lydian kings, who were known to extend their ostentatious nature towards the Oracle. Herodotus noted, Gyges, as soon as he had made himself supreme, sent a number of presents to the shrine at Delphi. Indeed, most of the silver there came from him, and in addition he presented a vast number of vessels of gold of various kinds, the most noteworthy being six golden mixing bowls. Gygus's reasons for enriching the Oracle of Delphi were probably somewhat complex. His efforts drew Lydia closer to Sparta, so there was, no doubt, a political consideration, but he and his successors appear to have genuinely believed in the power of the Oracle as well. When Aliates came to the Lydian throne, he also consulted the Oracle about his health, as Herodotus explained. But on the army's return to Sardis, Aliates fell ill. For a considerable time he got no better. So either on somebody's advice, or because he thought it the sensible thing to do, he sent to Delphi to inquire of the god about his health. The cynical mind might argue the Lydian patronage of the Oracle of Delphi was born more out of political and personal considerations than any genuine belief in the Hellenic pantheon, but other passages from Herodotus revealed the Lydians may have had a deeper belief in Greek religion. Aliates recovered from his illness at about the same time his campaign against the Milesians ended. In the ancient world, such occasions were often viewed as propitious signs from the gods, so the party in question would often sacrifice some animals to the gods he believed had helped him achieve the fortune. Instead of offering a few paltry animals to the gods as thanks, in true Lydian fashion, Aliates dedicated two new temples in Anatolia to the Greek goddess Athena. Herodotus wrote, Aliates made peace with the Milesians and dedicated temples to Greek deities to celebrate the occasion. By the terms of the peace, the two peoples afterwards became friends and allies. Aliates built two temples for Athene at Assesus instead of one, and recovered his health. A little while after, Aliates' son, Croesus, also saw fit to offer sacrifices to the Greek god Apollo, and again, in true Lydian fashion, Croesus offered a sacrifice like none before it. Croesus now attempted to win the favour of the Delphian Apollo by a magnificent sacrifice. 
Of every kind of appropriate animal he slaughtered three thousand. He burnt in a huge pile a number of precious objects, couches overlaid with gold or silver, golden cups, tunics, and other richly coloured garments, in the hope of binding the god more closely to his interest, and he issued a command that every Lydian was also to offer a sacrifice according to his means. The Lydian kings adopted the Hellenic religion as the faith of the court to curry favour with their Greek neighbours, and as a means to demonstrate the wealth of their kingdom to the Greeks. This is not to say the Lydian kings did not believe in the religion, because by all accounts they were believers, but the religion of the Greeks was not the native religion in Lydia. Proof of this is in extant Lydian inscriptions from Sardis, which indicate the importance of the Greek pantheon to the Lydians. One of the first Aramaic Lydian bilingual inscriptions translated by modern scholars was from a tomb in Sardis. The inscription makes numerous references to Hellenic deities, especially versions were believed to have dwelled in Anatolia. The inscription reads, This tomb to Apollo and Artemis is dedicated, set apart, now this tomb who injures or not alive, the doer of it him Apollo, Zeus and Artemis of Ephesus will curse, the year five it is, says Mithridates of Mithras the priest, the image or chamber all also there is is mine, now descendant shall bury here beside me. Now what I possess is the property wholly of the said person. Now of it he who the images removes the doer of it him both Apollo and Artemis will deprive him and his family of water, and the anger of the gods let him incur, nor here shall be buried neither he nor his family. And what is mine which I possess is the property of the heir. Most of the deities mentioned are clearly of Greek origin, but interestingly, the priest mentioned has the decidedly Persian name of Mithridates and is said to be of Mithras, which was a Persian deity. The Lydian state religion also, apparently, carried on some elements of its Anatolian past. According to Herodotus, the most important temple at Sardis was not dedicated to Apollo or Zeus, but to the Anatolian earth goddess Sibylle or Sibibi. Not much is known about the Lydian theology of Sibylle or the rituals surrounding the goddess's worship, but the Greeks' destruction of her temple in Sardis became a source of major animosity. Ultimately, the official Lydian religion of the nobles was one of syncretism, combining elements of Hellenic and Anatolian myth, religion, and religious elements from further east. The religion of the Lydian masses is another story. Though the Lydians shared linguistic and geographic similarities to their Hittite predecessors, an examination of the non-noble Lydian religion indicates they may have also shared cultural similarities. Of all the religions of the peoples of the ancient Near East Bronze Age, the Hittite religion is the least known to modern scholars. Although there are many extant Hittite magical and ritual texts, no known text relating to a detailed cosmological discourse exists, and scholars are left with many lacunae in that respect. Despite the absence of many Hittite mythological texts, the ritual texts, combined with modern archaeological discoveries from Sardis, actually provide the best source with which modern scholars have been able to reconstruct day-to-day -day non royal Lydian religion. An archaeological discovery at Sardis in the 1960s, where over 30 burial caches were excavated, appearing to be the remains of a ceremonial meal, may help add some missing pieces to the puzzle. Besides some plates and other eating utensils, the remains of canines were also discovered. Determining the significance and purpose of the burial caches have been difficult since they were not accompanied by inscriptions and there are no known Lydian-era texts describing similar rituals. The remains were discovered in the floors of what may have been small houses or shops, which indicate that part of the city may have been the merchant or craftsman's quarter. The geographic context clearly indicates that whatever ritual took place in these homes was part of the everyday religious rituals of non-royal Lydians. The religious meaning, origins and significance of these rituals continue to be somewhat enigmatic to modern scholars, but reasonable conclusions have been drawn that place the rituals in an Anatolian context. An examination of other ancient religious rituals involving canines reveals there were no parallels in Greek religion. The Greeks were known to sacrifice dogs from time to time in order to effect a propitious outcome to a certain situation from the gods.
but the setting appears to be quite different from what was discovered at Sardis. When the Greeks sacrificed dogs, the ritual was usually performed in public, at a temple or other public location, and was never carried out in the privacy of a home, as is the case with Sardis rituals. Because of this, Robertson looked to Anatolian history for a precedent. A large part of the extant Hittite religious texts consists of spells and incantations, many of which were used to protect a specific individual and his, her home. One Hittite protection text in particular appears to fit the context of the Sardis dog burials. The text reads, The old woman takes a small pig, she presents it to them and speaks as follows. See, it has been fattened with grass and grain. Just as this one shall not see the sky and shall not see the other small pigs again, even so, let the evil curses not see these sacrifices either. She waves the small pig over them, and then they kill it. They dig a hole in the ground and put it down into it. They put a sacrificial loaf down with it. She also pours out a libation of wine, and they level the ground. The notable difference between the Hittite text and the Sardis burials is that a pig instead of a dog was used. Robertson believes the Sardis burials were part of a larger ritual, essentially Hittite in origin, done from time to time in order to safeguard the building. The Lydians had Hittite origins in their language, so it should be no surprise they also inherited aspects of Hittite religion. The Lydian royal kings patronized the Greek pantheon and the Hellenic religion, along with their native Anatolian traditions, for a variety of reasons, while it appears most of the Lydian population practiced a version of the religion that had been known and practiced for several centuries by the time the Lydian kingdom became powerful. Religion clearly played an important role in Lydian culture, and at the centre of all Lydian culture was the city of Sardis. The ancient world was full of many magnificent cities. Babylon, Memphis, Nineveh and Athens were but a few of those great metropolises. All of these cities attained greatness for various reasons. Some, such as Athens, became known as centres of learning, while others, such as Babylon, became important religious centres. Ancient Sardis was also known for its temples and schools, but what made the city truly great were its markets and mines. The Lydians were known for their economic acumen, and it was at Sardis where they conducted most of their business and devoted the proceeds of the bulk of their profits. The result was that, for a brief time in world history, Sardis was the jewel of the region. Archaeological excavations have determined that settlements existed at Sardis from the early 1st millennium BC onwards, but it was during the early 7th century BC when the site became truly impressive. Sardis's rise to prominence coincides with the rule of the Myrmnidae dynasty, which enriched itself, Lydia, and the capital of Sardis. Reconstructing the layout of an ancient city is a difficult and tedious prospect for modern archaeologists, but fortunately for Sardis, very little modern development has encroached on the ancient site. Sardis's layout followed a decidedly Hellenic influence, with an Acropolis containing the royal palace which dominated the skyline. Below the Acropolis, on a plain, was the city itself, protected by a stone wall. Most of the excavated houses, dated to the 6th century BC, were quite spacious and ostentatious when compared to those of other peoples of the same period. The Sardis homes were roofed with tiles. Beautiful terracotta friezes were popular decorations for the inhabitants of the city during the 6th century BC. The homes and palace of Sardis must have been a sight to see, but perhaps the true story of Sardis is in the origin of its wealth, which explains how the Lydians were able to make Sardis so beautiful. If Sardis was the source of Lydia's wealth and power, then it was the Pactolus River that was the source of Sardis's wealth. Sardis is rare, but not totally unique when compared to many other great cities in world history, because it was landlocked. Many of the greatest cities of the world are located on or extremely close to the ocean, which helps facilitate trade and helps the people who possess the city an advantage when waging war. Coastal cities can send more troops out on ships, and their ports can import and export goods the world over. If they were not located on a coast, the next best thing cities in the pre-modern world could hope for was coastal access via a river. Egyptian, 
Mesopotamian, and the early Chinese all developed away from the coastline because they had the benefit of life-giving rivers with ocean access. The Pactolus River may not be the Nile or Euphrates, but it gave the Lydians access to the coastline, and more importantly, contained minerals which proved the lifeblood of Lydian culture. The river, which ran through the center of Sardis, contained natural deposits of the electrum alloy. Electrum, comprised of both silver and gold, can be treated to separate the two metals as the Lydians did, or traded and used as is as the Egyptians did. The Lydians collected electrum deposits from the river and extracted the gold in a large refinery located on the main north-south road in Sardis. This easy access to precious metals meant the Lydians could trade gold and silver in bullion, which was the standard practice of kings of the great Near Eastern kingdoms during the Bronze Age. Alternately, they were free to create new uses for the metal. As Herodotus noted, the Lydians were the first people we know of to use a gold and silver coinage and to introduce retail trade. In addition to being the source for Lydia's wealth, Sardis was also a centre of learning and culture throughout the region. Solon, the Athenian lawgiver, visited Sardis for a time, but he was not the only cultural luminary to visit the city. In the early 6th century BC, Sardis became a magnet for philosophers from throughout the region. Herodotus noted, when all these nations had been added to the Lydian Empire, and Sardis was at the height of her wealth and prosperity, all the great Greek teachers of that epoch, one after another, paid visits to the capital. The wealth and culture was truly impressive, not only to the Lydians, but also their Hellenic neighbours. It also appears that Sardis may have been a source of envy for the Lydians' Ionian Greek neighbours. In 499 BC, the Greek city-states of Ionia were under the rule of the Achaemenid Persians, viewed as a less than desirable development by the mainland Greeks. The mainland Greeks, primarily the Athenians and Spartans, instigated their Ionian cousins to rebel against the Persians until Aristagoras, the tyrant of Miletus, heeded the call and organized a rebellion. The rebellion, known as the Ionian Revolt, proved to be the first campaign in the Persian Wars but it ultimately ended in utter failure for the Ionian Greeks. Greek efforts in the Ionian Revolt were directed at Sardis, primarily because a Persian garrison was stationed there. But jealousy no doubt played a role. The Ionian Greeks finally had their chance to show up the ostentatious Lydians in warfare, an area in which they believed themselves to be inherently superior. According to Herodotus, the Aristagoras and the Ionian Greeks went beyond merely capturing Sardis. They set about to destroy the city and its most holy sites. The Athenian squadron of twenty sail now reached Miletus. It was accompanied by five other triremes belonging to the Eritreans, who had joined the expedition not for the Athenians' sake, but to pay a debt of honour to the people of Miletus, who some time previously had fought at their side all through their war with the Chalcidians, who in their turn, had the support of Samos. On the arrival, therefore, of these two contingents, Aristagoras, as soon as the rest of his allies had assembled, proceeded to attack Sardis. The outlying parts were all burning, so the native Lydians and such Persians as were there, caught in a ring of fire and unable to get clear of the town, poured into the market square on either bank of the Pactolus, where they were forced to stand on their defence. The Pactolus is the river, which brings the gold dust down from Tumulus. It flows through the market at Sardis and then joins the Hermus, which, in its turn, flows into the sea. The Ionians, seeing some of the enemy defending themselves and others approaching in large numbers, then became alarmed and withdrew to Tumulus, and then, just before nightfall, they marched off to rejoin their ships. In the conflagration at Sardis, a temple of Sibibi, a goddess worshipped by the natives was destroyed, and the Persians later made this a pretext for their burning of Greek temples. Croesus, the Lydian king to whom Herodotus had dedicated most of his passages, was also the last Lydian king. Croesus expanded Lydia's borders, established several alliances with foreign powers, and made the already impressive city of Sardis even greater. When Croesus came to the Lydian throne, he was thirty-five and an apt pupil of his father, Aliates, 
because he followed many of his political and military programs. One of the most far-sighted ideas Croesus employed was to establish economic and military links to the strongest states in the eastern Mediterranean. According to Herodotus, Croesus conquered the Ionian Greeks, while he made alliances with those from the mainland. The historian noted, he was the first foreigner so far as we know to come into direct contact with the Greeks, both in the way of conquest and alliance, forcing tribute from Ionians, Aeolians and Asiatic Dorians, and forming a pact of friendship with the Lacedaemonians. Lacedaemonian is a term commonly used by ancient writers for the Spartans, known throughout the region for their martial skills. Croesus, like his father, also maintained a marriage alliance with the Medes, and was on friendly terms with the kings of Egypt's 26th dynasty, as well as the Neo-Babylonian dynasty. He was apparently quite a shrewd leader, because as he made alliances with the strongest states in the region, he conquered the weaker ones. The alliances Croesus made with other states in the region allowed him to further pursue Lydian imperial aims, first initiated by his father. The alliance with Sparta in particular probably helped him the most, as the Ionian coastline, the western shore of Anatolia, was primarily inhabited by Greeks. By the middle of Croesus's reign, he was able to conquer most of Anatolia. Herodotus explained, in the course of time Croesus subdued all the peoples west of the river Halis, except the Cilicians and Lycians. The rest he kept in subjection, Lydians, Phrygians, Mysians, Mariandinians, Calibians, Paphlagonians, Thracians, both Tinian and Bithynian, Carians, Ionians, Dorians, Aeolians and Pamphylians. It is important to note that the last four peoples listed in this passage were all of Greek origin which points toward the importance of the Lydian-Spartan alliance. The Lydians were able to conquer most of Anatolia, including several Greek city-states, while the powerful Spartans acquiesced. Croesus's time as king of Lydia was not spent solely entwined with the arts of diplomacy and war. The king also set out to enrich his land and ego. The Lydian king did not have to do much to further enrich his kingdom, as there was a large gold deposit outside of Sardis that seemed infinite at the time. Once Croesus expanded the realm of his kingdom and made sure the royal coffers were filled with gold, he invited notable visitors from around the civilized world to marvel at his kingdom, and at the city of Sardis in particular. An interesting passage from Herodotus illustrates Croesus's ego and hubris. Among the notable foreigners who visited Lydia during the reign of Croesus was Solon, the Athenian. Solon is credited with being Athens' lawgiver, and therefore one of the wisest men in the Hellenic world. Croesus invited Solon to Lydia, with the goal of impressing the lawgiver with the kingdom's ostentatious nature. Croesus knew Solon was a wise man, and he asked the lawgiver who he thought was the happiest man he had ever seen, perhaps thinking he would mention the Lydian king. According to Herodotus, Croesus did not receive the answer he desired. Croesus entertained him hospitably in the palace, and three or four days after his arrival instructed some servants to take him on a tour of the royal treasuries and point out the richness and magnificence of everything. When Solon had made as thorough an inspection as opportunity allowed, Croesus said, Well, my Athenian friend, I have heard a great deal about your wisdom and how widely you have travelled in the pursuit of knowledge. I cannot resist my desire to ask you a question. Who is the happiest man you have ever seen? But whoever has the greatest number of the good things I have mentioned and keeps them to the end and dies a peaceful death, that man, Croesus, deserves in my opinion to be called happy. These sentiments were not the sort to give Croesus any pleasure. He let Solon go with cold indifference firmly convinced that he was a fool. For what could be more stupid than to keep telling him to look at the end of everything, without any regard to present prosperity? This passage vividly demonstrates not only Croesus's hubris, but also his inability to put important situations in their proper context. Croesus may have expanded Lydia's borders and made Sardis the envy of the civilized world, but the Lydian king made a fatal mistake in his assessment of the geopolitical situation in the region during the middle of the 6th century BC. At the beginning of the 6th century BC, it appeared to be a safe bet for the Lydians to align with the Medes, Babylonians, Egyptians and Spartans. 
but by the middle of the century, one of those kingdoms had been eliminated and the other three were threatened. The Achaemenid Persian dynasty went from a little-known backwater kingdom to a world empire in a relatively short period of time, as it quickly consumed the major powers of the Near East, beginning with their neighbours, the Medes. The Persians, under their king Cyrus, expanded north into the Iranian plateau from their homeland in the hills of southern Persia, and conquered the Medes' capital of Ekbatana around 550 BC, thus vanquishing the Median king Astyages from the throne. For the most part, the Achaemenid Persian kings practiced a policy of continuity, whereby they continued to employ Median concepts of royal authority and essentially ruled a kingdom with the same boundaries. But Croesus took his alliance and diplomatic marriage with the Medes seriously and chose to oppose the Persians. Herodotus wrote, For two years Croesus grieved for the death of his son until the news from Persia put an end to his mourning. Cyrus, son of Cambyses, had destroyed the empire of Astyages and the power of Persia was steadily increasing. This gave Croesus food for thought and he wondered if he might be able to check Persian expansion before it had gone too far. Croesus's decision to honour his alliance with the Medes proved ultimate demise of the Lydian kingdom as it brought forth the wrath of the immense and aggressive Achaemenid Empire. Since the available primary sources state no concrete dates, historians have been unable to pinpoint the exact years of the Lydian-Persian War, but some historians believe it was either 546 or 542 BC as possible dates. Either way, according to ancient sources, Croesus and the Lydians were woefully unprepared to undertake a major military campaign against any foe, never mind one as large and powerful as the Achaemenid Persians. The Lydian forces were quickly overwhelmed, and the Persians were able to encircle and besiege Sardis. Croesus once more demonstrated his hubris by sending a message to Lydia's allies for assistance without urgency. Herodotus explained, Thus the siege of Sardis began, and Croesus, in the belief that it would last a long time, sent a second appeal for help to his allies. The first messenger had been sent to ask for reinforcements to be at Sardis after four months, but these, now that Croesus was already beleaguered, were to beg for immediate assistance. All the states which were in treaty with Croesus were applied to, but the most urgent request was to Sparta. As the situation in Sardis deteriorated, Croesus realised that needed to act quickly, so he sent another request for assistance to Sparta, which, unfortunately for the Lydians, came too late. It was in the midst of these troubles that the messenger arrived at Sparta to ask for help in raising the siege of Sardis, and the Spartans, in spite of their difficulties, were eager to render assistance when they heard what he had to say. But by the time their preparations were complete and their ships ready to sail, a second message brought the news that the city had fallen and Croesus was a prisoner. They were much distressed to hear of his misfortune, but they could do no more. In fairness to Croesus, the Achaemenid Persians had the advantage of numbers and advanced siege weapons. Cyrus also made what was a rare military manoeuvre in ancient times, attacking Lydia in the middle of winter, which caught the Lydians off guard. The Spartans, along with the Athenians, would later challenge the Achaemenid Persians in the Greek-Persian Wars, but they were unable to rescue Croesus from the hands of fate. Despite being conquered by the Persians, there were still more chapters to be written in the story of Croesus and Sardis. There is a clear consensus among modern historians that Lydia was conquered by the Achaemenid Persians sometime in the second half of the 6th century BC, but disagreement persists concerning Croesus's ultimate fate. The disagreement stems from conflicting primary sources, as Herodotus stated that Cyrus spared Croesus's life, while the Babylonian sources indicate he was probably killed. Herodotus wrote, The Persians brought their prisoner into the presence of the king, and Cyrus chained Croesus and placed him with fourteen Lydian boys on a great pyre that he had built. So he brought him down from the pyre and said, Tell me, Croesus, what man persuaded you to march against my country and be my enemy rather than my friend? King, Croesus replied, the luck was yours when I did it, and the lass was mine. The god of the Greeks encouraged me to fight you. The blame is his. No one is fool enough to choose war instead of peace. 
In peace, sons bury fathers, but in war, fathers bury sons. It must have been heaven's will that this should happen. Cyrus had his chains taken off and invited him to sit by his side. He made much of him and looked at him with wonder, as did everyone who was near enough to see. The benevolent Cyrus described by Herodotus is contrasted with the more brutal Persian king depicted in the Babylonian chronicle. The chronicle states, Nabonidus, the king, stayed in Tema. The crown prince, the officials, and the army were in Akkad. The king did not come to Babylon for the ceremony of the month of Nisanu. In the month of Nisanu, Cyrus, king of Persia, called up his army and crossed the Tigris below the town of Arbela. In the moth Ayaru, he marched against the country. Lydia killed its king, took his possessions, put there a garrison of his own. Afterwards, his garrison as well as the king remained there. Due to the fact the chronicle never names the Lydian king, it has led some modern scholars to argue the events described here are in relation to the Achaemenid conquest of Babylon in 539 BC, and not the conquest of Lydia, which had already happened. However, the reality is that the text clearly states Cyrus killed its king, which can only refer to Croesus, as Lydia never had another native king after the Achaemenid conquest. Alternately, this may be a case of the Babylonian chronicler confusing the chronology of events, but this still does not explain Herodotus's account. One possibility, synchronizing the two accounts, involves Herodotus's account as factual, whereas the events in the chronicle describe a rebellious usurper who attempted to claim the Lydian throne and expel the Persian overlords. Until more evidence is located in the form of lost texts or new archaeological discoveries, the debate over Croesus's fate will continue. Lydia, under the Achaemenid Persians The Ionian Greeks ravaged the great city of Sardis and humiliated its inhabitants, but that was only the most recent humiliation the Lydians suffered, as they had already been conquered by the Persians. After the Achaemenid Persian conquest of Lydia and the vanquishing and or execution of Croesus, Lydian culture persisted for some time. The Persian conquest of Lydia only meant that the Lydians and Sardis became part of the vast Achaemenid Empire, not that their culture was destroyed. In fact, immediately after Cyrus conquered Lydia, he sent the Achaemenid treasury to Sardis and placed a military garrison in the city under the general Tabalus. According to Herodotus, Cyrus left the day-to-day -day operations of Lydia to the Lydians, but that quickly led to attempts at rebellion. The rebellion greatly angered Cyrus, and he'd intended to sell the entire population of Sardis into slavery. Croesus, who was travelling with Cyrus, eventually convinced the Persian king to mitigate his punishment of the Lydians. Herodotus wrote, After this Cyrus left Tabalus, a Persian, as governor of Sardis, entrusted to a Lydian named Pactyes, the task of collecting and conveying the treasure belonging to Croesus and the other Lydians, and himself started eastwards on his march to Ecbatana, taking Croesus with him. As soon as Cyrus had gone, Pactyes induced the Lydians to rise against their Persian governor, and going down to the coast was enabled by his possession of the Sardian gold to hire soldiers and persuade the men from the coastal districts to support him. He then marched against Sardis and laid siege to Tabalus, who was shut up in the Acropolis of the city. The proposal pleased Cyrus, and he promised to accept it. Then, saying he was no longer angry, he sent for Mazaris, a Mede, and ordered him to make a proclamation to the Lydians along the lines suggested by Caresus, and to sell into slavery everybody who had joined in the Lydian attack on Sardis. With that proclamation, Cyrus spared the Lydians of Sardis and the Lydian culture continued to persevere. After the rebellion, the Persians' interest in Lydia primarily concerned the latter's wealth and strategic geographical location, which held strong allure for the Persians. They quickly set about to build a road directly connecting Lydia and Persia. After they conquered Lydia, the Persians wasted no time building a road from Sardis to Susa in the heart of Persia, now known as the Persian Royal Road and it served as the primary artery of an elaborate road system they developed during their tenure as rulers of the Near East. The road left Sardis in a southeastern direction and had three stops before it left Lydia and went into Cappadocia. Due to Lydia's great wealth,
the Persians saw the need to integrate Sardis and Lydia as seamlessly as possible into their empire. The royal road facilitated the integration of Lydia into the Achaemenid Empire, but also served to keep trade and gold moving from the Lydian capital to one of the Persian capitals. According to Herodotus, the Persians invested their resources not only to not make it efficient, but to make it safe for travellers as well. The historian noted, At intervals, all along the road are recognised stations, with excellent inns, and the road itself is safe to travel by, as it never leaves inhabited country. Although the road was wide enough to accommodate wagons, chariots, caravans and large troop movements, it was not paved, which meant parts would become muddy and unnavigable after heavy rain. The importance of Lydia in the Achaemenid Empire can also be seen in Persian texts from the period. There is not a large corpus of extant texts from the Achaemenid Empire, but a few inscriptions mention Lydia and the Lydians as one of the many subject peoples, or satrapies, of the Achaemenid Empire. One particularly interesting Achaemenid period text mentioning Lydia is the statue of Darius I. The Lydian referred to as Saprucha is in the 15th position between Armenia and Cappadocia, wearing a traditional Lydian turban, and modern scholars know that the Lydian clothing depicted on the statue is accurate because a number of Greek vases show Lydians wearing similar garb. The Achaemenid Persians also depicted their subject peoples on a number of other monuments found in places ranging from Egypt to Bactria. Three stelae from Egypt, also dated to Darius I, and known collectively by modern scholars as the Red Sea stelae for their provenance, list 14 of the same satrapies on one stela, but Lydia is not one of them. After the Darius statue was discovered in 1972, scholars determined that the badly damaged Red Sea stela that contains the 14 satrapies was actually incomplete, and at one time comprised the same list of peoples found on the base of the statue, hints 118. The list perfectly follows that of the Darius statue and ends with Armenia, which means that if it were the same list, Lydia would be the next satrapy listed. Another depiction of the Lydians as subjects of the Achaemenid Empire can be found in the ruins of the Apadana or royal palace from the Achaemenid capital of Persepolis. Although large parts of the Persian capital were destroyed by Alexander the Great, Reliefs that depict the subject peoples bringing tribute to the Persian king have survived. The Lydians are represented in the reliefs as the sixth delegation, bringing what appears to be gold and other precious items to the king. The Lydians are depicted wearing the same clothing and turbans as they are on the base of the Darius statue. Persian depictions of the Lydians are historically important because they demonstrate that Lydian culture persisted despite being under the yoke of the Achaemenid Empire. But the inscriptions and reliefs are lacking in details that could help modern scholars determine Lydia's provincial status. For those details, scholars must, once more, turn to Herodotus. In most of the Persian satrapal lists, the Ionian Greeks are conspicuously absent, although they were clearly under Persian rule. Some experts believe that the reason for the omission of Ionia stems from the fact that the Persians considered it to be a part of Lydia. One particular passage from Herodotus, where Darius I brought the recalcitrant satrap of Lydia under heel, appears to confirm this idea. Herodotus wrote, Darius, once his power was established, was anxious to punish Oroetes for his many crimes, and not least for the murder of Mitrobates and his son. He thought it would be unwise, things being as they were, to send an armed force openly against him, for the country was still in an unsettled state. He himself had only recently come to the throne, and he knew that Oroetes was a powerful man, being governor of Phrygia, Lydia and Ionia. Herodotus also listed his own Achaemenid satrapal list that differed slightly from the one on the Darius state. Notable differences in Herodotus's list include the following. Only 20 satrapies are listed instead of 24. Ionia is listed separately from Lydia, and the type and amount of tribute the Persians received from each group is detailed. But as the number of satrapies the Persians claim fluctuated throughout the period of their rule, so the fact that Herodotus only lists 20 instead of 24 is not surprising. The relevant portion of the text states, Now for the account of the tribute paid by the 20 provinces. 
First, the Ionians, the Magnesians in Asia, the Aeolians, Carians, Lycians, Millians, and Pamphylians contributed together a sum of 400 talents of silver. Second, the Mysians, Lydians, Lysonians, Cabellians, and Hytenians, 500 talents. Third, the people on the southern shore of the Hellespont, the Phrygians, the Thracians of Asia, the Paphlagonians, Mariandinians, and Syrians, 360 talents. Fourth, the Cilicians paid 500 talents of silver, together with 360 white horses, one for each day in the year. Of the money, 140 talents were used to maintain the cavalry force which guarded Cilicia, and the remaining 360 went to Darius. On the base of the Darius statue, all of the four satrapies listed in this passage were included as part of either Lydia or Cappadocia. The Lydian satrapy provided a great source of revenue for the royal Achaemenid coffers, but it was also utilised as a base from which the mighty Persian army invaded Greece during the Greek-Persian wars. According to Herodotus, the Ionian revolt, and particularly the sack of Sardis in 498 BC, was the impetus for Darius I's invasion of mainland Greece in 492 BC. While Onesilus was busy with the siege of Amethus, news was brought to Darius that Sardis had been taken and burnt by the Athenians and Ionians, and that the prime mover in the joint enterprise was Aristagoras of Miletus. After that he sent for Histius the Milesian, whom he had already detained for a long time at his court, and said, I understand, Histius, that your deputy, whom you put in charge of Miletus, has thrown off his allegiance to me. He has brought against me men from the continent across the sea, and has persuaded the Ionians, who shall assuredly pay for it, to join them in his service, and he has taken Sardis from me. Come now, was this well done? And could it have happened without your knowledge and advice? The time may come when you will blame yourself. Darius I's invasion of Greece was stopped at the Battle of Marathon by the Athenians, but even after the decisive loss there, the Persian emperor was not done with his punitive plans for Athens. According to Herodotus, the Persian loss at Marathon only incensed the Achaemenid king even more. When the news of the Battle of Marathon reached Darius, son of Histaspes and king of Persia, his anger against Athens, already great enough on account of the assault on Sardis, was even greater, and he was more than ever determined to make war on Greece. Without loss of time, he dispatched couriers to the various states under his dominion with orders to raise an army much larger than before, and also warships, transports, horses and grain. So the royal command went round, and all Asia was in an uproar for three years, with the best men being enrolled in the army for the invasion of Greece and with the preparations. In the year after that, a rebellion in Egypt, which had been conquered by Cambyses, served only to hard Darius's resolve to go to war, not only against Greece, but against Egypt too. Achaemenid Persian historical records say nothing of the Battle of Marathon, and little concerning the Greco-Persian Wars, which is not surprising since the Persian historical tradition was essentially inherited from other ancient Near Eastern traditions that depicted the sovereign as always victorious. Even had the Persians followed more modern or Hellenic historiographical traditions, they still would have ignored their loss at Marathon due to its one-sidedness. According to Herodotus, the final casualty count of the battle was 5,400 Persians killed, while the Greeks only lost 192 men. Whatever the actual numbers, the dead Greek hoplites were buried at the site of the Battle of Marathon, which led to the site becoming both a sacred place and an archaeological treasure trove in later centuries. Modern archaeological excavations at Marathon have revealed that a mound at the site, called the Sauros, was in fact the burial place of the fallen Athenian hoplites. In terms of recreating the Battle of Marathon, the mound is believed by modern scholars to be the place where the Greek centre was broken and where they suffered the most casualties. Excavations have shown that the hoplites were cremated en masse on a large pyre following ancient Greek funerary traditions. Those present for the funeral then had a large feast, placed earth over the pyre, and then laid wreaths, which effectively made the site into a memorial. 
Hundreds of years later, the Greek geographer Pausanias visited the site and gave a detailed report of what he witnessed. He wrote, There is a parish called Marathon, equally distant from Athens and Charistus in Euboea. It was at this point in Attica that the foreigners landed, were defeated in battle, and lost some of their vessels as they were putting off from land. On the plain is the grave of the Athenians, and upon it are slabs giving the names of the killed according to their tribes. And there is another grave for the Boeotian Plataeans and for the slaves, for slaves fought then for the first time by the side of their masters. There is also a separate monument to one man, Miltiades, the son of Simon, although his end came later, after he had failed to take Paros, and for this reason had been brought to trial by the Athenians. At Marathon, every night, you can hear horses neighing and men fighting. No one who has expressly set himself to behold this vision has ever got any good from it, but the spirits are not wroth with such as in ignorance change to be spectators. The Marathonians worship both those who died in the fighting, calling them heroes, and secondly Marathon, from whom the parish derives its name, and then Heracles, saying that they were the first among the Greeks to acknowledge him as a god. Although the Athenians assert that they buried the Persians, because in every case the divine law applies that a corpse should be laid under the earth, yet I could find no grave. Pausanias's account is not only interesting, but also fills in gaps of Herodotus's account and corroborates it in other ways. Pausanias noted that the names of all the Athenian fallen were written on slabs at the site, which could corroborate Herodotus's number of fallen Greeks. Although Herodotus wrote his history decades after the Battle of Marathon, some of the veterans were still alive, so he may have consulted them as sources, but it is improbable that senior citizens could have given him such accurate numbers on the fallen. For that, he probably consulted the inscriptions that Pausanias described. Darius would never get his chance to exact revenge against the Athenians, as he died soon after in 487 BC, but the Greco-Persian wars would continue under his son and successor Xerxes, who would lead an even greater army into Greece. Some Greeks also anticipated another Persian invasion. The Spartan king Leonidas was the main advocate of this theory, sustaining it even when Darius died and was succeeded by Xerxes. Under Leonidas and their other king, Agesilius, the Spartans waged a series of campaigns in the years following the Battle of Marathon to bring reluctant allies and Persian sympathizers into the fold and ensure a united Greek front would greet all Persian attempts to invade. That invasion, just as Leonidas had prophesied, came in 480 BC, when Xerxes, at the head of an army which Herodotus claimed numbered over a million men, bridged the Hellespont via a colossal pontoon bridge and marched his army into Thrace, threatening Greece proper. Sardis proved to be an ideal staging location for the Achaemenid army as it was close to Greece, but still located within Asia and therefore firmly within Persian territory. The Lydian treasury as well as the gold deposits provided Xerxes with the resources he needed to fund a long campaign which the king had planned for as he'd intended to march into Europe instead of sailing across the Aegean as Darius had done. In early 480 BC, Xerxes and the Achaemenid army assembled in Sardis and prepared for their long march across the Hellespont and into Europe. Before Xerxes and the Persians assembled in Sardis, they marched along the royal road from the Persian heartland into Lydia. Herodotus described the scene. Passing the Phrygian town of Anawa, and a lake from which salt is extracted, Xerxes now arrived at the large city of Colossae, where the river Lycus disappears underground to reappear about half a mile further on, where it too joins the Meander. Leaving Colossae, the army made for the Lydian border and arrived next at Sidrara, where a column with an inscription upon it set up by Croesus defines the boundary between Phrygia and Lydia. The road as it enters Lydia divides, one track leading left towards Korea, the other to the right towards Sardis. A traveller by the latter road has to cross the Meander and pass Kalatabus, a town where the manufacture of honey out of tamarisk syrup and wheat flour is carried on. This was the road which Xerxes took, and it was hereabouts that he came across a plane tree of such beauty that he was moved to decorate it with gold ornaments and to appoint a guardian for it in perpetuity.
The following day he reached the Lydian capital. In Sardis, Xerxes's first act was to send representatives to every place in Greece, except Athens and Sparta, with a demand for earth and water, and a further order to prepare entertainment for him against his coming. When the Greeks learned that Xerxes and his army were assembling in Sardis, they sent spies to the city in order to gather intelligence. The agents were able to carry out the first part of their mission successfully, but they were then captured. Herodotus explained, These decisions were put into force at once. The private quarrels were settled, and three men sent off to Asia to collect information. They arrived at Sardis and found out all they could about the king's army, but were caught in the process, tortured by the Persian army commanders, and condemned to death. But when Xerxes was told that they were about to be executed, he disapproved of this general's decision, and sent men from his bodyguard with orders, if the three spies were still alive, to bring them before him. As the sentence had not yet been carried out, the spies were brought to the king, who, having satisfied himself about the reason for their presence in Sardis, instructed his guards to take them round and let them see the whole army, infantry and cavalry. Once in Sardis, Xerxes wasted no time quickly leading his army out of Lydia, along with the pontoon bridges used to traverse the Hellespont. But as they marched, they were met by a Lydian who requested a favour of the Persian king. He then prepared to move forward to Abydos, where a bridge had already been constructed across the Hellespont from Asia to Europe. The army, however, had not gone far when Pythias the Lydian, in alarm at the sign from heaven, was emboldened by the presents he had received to come to Xerxes with a request. Master, he said, there is a favour I should like you to grant me, a small thing indeed for you to perform, but to me of great importance, should you consent to do so. My lord, I have five sons, and it happens that every one of them is serving in your army in the campaign against Greece. I am an old man, sire, and I beg you in pity to release from service one of my sons, the eldest, to take care of me and my property. Xerxes was furiously angry. You miserable fellow, he cried. Have you the face to mention your son, when I, in person, am marching to the war against Greece with my sons and brothers and kinsmen and family? Having answered Pythias in these words, Xerxes at once gave orders that the men to whom such duties fell should find Pythias's eldest son and cut him in half and put the two halves one on each side of the road for the army to march between them. The order was performed. That was how Xerxes rode from Sardis. Once Xerxes and his army left Lydia, all of their battles against the Greeks took place in Europe, so the Lydians were spared further atrocities like the one that Pythias suffered. Ultimately, the Persian invasion under Xerxes would also end in failure thanks to legendary battles like Thermopylae and Salamis. And given that perspective in hindsight, the Battle of Marathon was the pivotal event, and the Athenians were the major agent in the Greco-Persian Wars. It was the Athenians who instigated the Ionian Greeks into rebellion and subsequently provoked the wrath of the Persians. And it was the Athenians that soundly defeated the Persians at Marathon, which set the stage for the later battles of Thermopylae, Salamis, and Plataea. Perhaps the greatest effect that the Battle of Marathon had on the Greek world was the level of confidence that it bestowed upon Athens. Indeed, the beginning of the 5th century BC would usher in the Golden Age of Athens, which involved some of the city's most famous men, like Socrates and Plato. Before Marathon, Athens struggled with tyrants and numerous other Greek enemies, but after the epic battle, the Athenians went on to lead the Hellenic League, along with Sparta, successfully against the Xerxes and the Persians. Of course, the successes would also lead Athens and Sparta on a collision course towards the Peloponnesian War in the late 5th century, a war so devastating that it would help bring about the collapse of Greek independence altogether. Lydia would also play an important role shortly after that conflict. Lydia is mentioned in very few historical texts in the decades after the Greco-Persian Wars, but in the late 5th century BC, it was once more used as a staging area for a major military campaign. In 401 BC, the Greeks and Persians had an uneasy truce, although a number of Greek mercenaries fresh off the Peloponnesian War 
offered their martial skills to the Persians. One major campaign, led by the Spartan general Xenophon, was intended to overthrow the reigning Persian king, Artaxerxes II, and install his brother Cyrus to the throne. The account of the campaign, written by Xenophon, details how 10,000 Greek hoplites had to fight their way through hundreds of miles of Persian territory after their benefactor was killed in the Battle of Cunaxa. According to Xenophon, the Greek mercenaries and their Persian allies used Sardis as a staging area, much the same way Xerxes did decades before, but instead of marching north and west into Europe, the campaign went east into Asia. Next, Xeneas arrived at Sardis with his men from the cities, about 4,000 hoplites, and Proxenus came with about 1,500 hoplites and 500 light infantry. Sophonetus the Stymphalian came with a force of a thousand hoplites, and Socrates the Achaean with about five hundred hoplites. Passion the Megarian had three hundred hoplites and three hundred peltasts. Socrates and he were from the force operating against Miletus. These then reported to Cyrus at Sardis. Cyrus, with those whom I have mentioned, set out from Sardis, and a three days' march through Lydia of sixty six miles took him to the river Meander. After Cyrus was killed at the Battle of Cunaxa, Xenophon and the Greeks retreated north until they came to the Black Sea, where they travelled home by ship, thereby avoiding Sardis. Lydia and Sardis played an important role in the Achaemenid Empire for economic and strategic reasons, but its importance did not immediately diminish when the Persians were eventually defeated by the Greeks. The rivalry between the Greeks and the Persians abated for over a century until Alexander conquered the Persian Empire. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of ancient accounts about Alexander's campaign is what is not said. There is no mention of Sardis's wealth, its famed treasury or its electrum deposits, which Alexander could have used to help fund his campaign. By the 4th century BC, it seems as though Lydia's wealth had diminished. That said, it was not entirely gone. Sardis continued to operate as a trade centre well into late antiquity, first under the Romans and later under the Byzantine Empire, but the venerable Lydian city suffered from the effects of competition and geography. The Romans discovered abundant gold deposits in Spain and other locations in Europe. Other market cities such as Palmyra also developed. These were located along key caravan routes that connected the Roman Empire to the lands and riches of the East. Sardis was also not helped by its landlocked location, which limited both the amount of goods that could be shipped and speed at which they were shipped. The Foundation of the Persian Empire The Persians had humble beginnings among the Indo-European nomadic tribes that lived in the plains of central Eurasia. They originally coexisted alongside a number of prominent Indo-European tribes, including the Medes, Quaresmians, Sogdians, Bactrians and Heretians. However, around 550 BC, Cyrus, a tribal leader, set off on a campaign of conquests. With his charisma, and with what the Greeks called the fear he inspired and the terror he struck in all men, Cyrus took control of more and more territory, eventually overthrowing their primary rival, the Medes. Cyrus the Great, as he became known, subsequently founded the Persian Empire, and reigned as the first king of the Achaemenid dynasty, from approximately 550 to 530 BC, and in just a few decades he laid the foundations of an empire whose borders would stretch from India in the east, to Greece on the Mediterranean, down to Egypt and Ethiopia, and north to what is now Russia. More than 30 different peoples were brought together under the rule of the man that called himself the King of the World. Cyrus established his palace at the ancient city of Pasargadae. This site represented the birth of the Achaemenid rule, demonstrated Persian culture at its most sophisticated and refined, and influenced both the artistic and architectural layout and lifestyle of other urban centres in Persia. The city was founded in 550 BC and served as the empire's first capital, but it was later abandoned by the Persian kings in favour of Susa and Persepolis. Irrigation channels were dug into the earth leading towards the city's most stunning feature, its royal gardens. The entire area in front of Cyrus's residential palace was cultivated as a walled garden called the Paradesa, 
a word that was later adopted by the ancient Greek and Latin languages, and which gives English the modern word paradise. Cyrus was famous throughout the ancient world for his love of gardens, to the extent that the ancient Greek writer Xenophon noted that in all the districts that he resides in, he takes great care that there are paradises full of all the beautiful things that the soil will produce. No archaeologist has ever found evidence of the legendary hanging gardens of Babylon, so those of Cyrus's palace represent the earliest evidence of a formal garden found anywhere in the world. Gardens similar to this one were widely found across the empire during successive dynasties. These gardens were seen as representations of the perfection of life, where the flowing water would have been refreshing and cool in the hot climate. Herodotus, one of the earliest Greek historians, also wrote that the Persians adopt foreign customs more readily than any other people. This sentence, written perhaps with a touch of contempt, actually reveals one of the most positive and impressive aspects of the Persian Empire. In the time of Cyrus, the economy in Asia was expanding and the people wanted stability. There was a widespread desire for ecumenism, meaning people wanted to be part of a unified world. The first to appreciate the value of this concept, and to put it into practice, was Cyrus. Found in Pasargadae was a sculpture of a winged genie that appears in the form of a typical Assyrian figure, dressed as an Elamite and wearing a showy Egyptian headdress. The evidence suggests that the concept of a unified world, or perhaps a desire to belong to one, had originated in Persia. It also suggests that the Persians found pleasure in trying out the different lifestyles of the empire's many peoples. The Persian Empire extended into Europe under the rule of Cyrus's successors, and many other great cities were founded in modern Iran under their rule. Cambyses II added Egypt to the empire, and he was succeeded by his cousin Darius the Great, who ruled for 36 years between 550 and 486 BC. Under his rule the empire reached its greatest extent, stretching from the Indus Valley and Central Asia on the east to Libya and the Danube River on the west. Darius spent the earliest years of his rule stymieing revolts across the Persian territory, and he appointed satraps, local governors, to oversee the maintenance of order and collection of taxes in the diverse regions of the empire. Realizing that many of their subject peoples were just as advanced as the Persians, these satraps served as representatives of the empire, but otherwise allowed local customs and laws to continue existing, as long as they swore obedience to the Persian king and paid their taxes. Darius also ordered the construction of an extensive network of roads that expedited communication and trade across his realm. Ten years after Pasagade was founded by Cyrus, Darius I initiated a new era marked by the transfer of the Achaemenid capital to Persepolis. Historical records indicate that under Darius, the proto Elamite city of Susa grew in splendor, becoming an imperial capital along with Persepolis. At Susa, a great number of building foundations and the remains of massive columns attest to the presence of one of the largest palatial cities of Persia, equal in grandeur to Persepolis. It was also during this time that the importance of other parts of Mesopotamia gradually declined, with the Persian lands in modern Iran serving as the new center of cultural and political hegemony in Central Asia. Nonetheless, even as the Persians were building great cities and gardens, they were still essentially a nomadic people. Like many groups in modern-day Iran, Persian communities would spend the winter months tending to their herds on the plains and spend the hot summer months in the cool of the mountains. For the Greeks, the Persians' nomadic lifestyle was a cause for mockery. Escaping from the summer heat was taken as evidence of Persian unmanliness. What the Greeks never understood, though, was that travelling was a key part of the Persian way of life. Their nomadic traditions always remained even after the construction of their cities. They were as at home in a tent as they were in the monumental structures of urban centres. Even around great settlements like Persepolis, there would have been a city of tents for those that came and went from the hinterland. Within these tents, one can imagine that ancient Persian life would not be too dissimilar to the kinds of images that can be seen today. Cooking, the rearing of animals, the collecting of foodstuffs, and the weaving of clothing and carpets. Moreover, 
the Persian kings did not stay in a single place throughout the entire year. Persepolis was covered in snow for most of the winter, and thus impractical for many of the governmental functions. With such a vast empire to direct, the government could not simply shut down during this time of the year. Instead, they transferred operations to Susa, the bona fide second imperial capital in its own right. They migrated seasonally, residing in Susa during the colder months and in Persepolis during the summer. These two cities were not only the political, economic and administrative centres in the heartland of the empire, but also regarded as sacred capitals. Pasagadai was used during coronation ceremonies, and Persepolis also had a key ceremonial role, having been founded as a site to hold the great annual feast of Norus, the Persian New Year's celebration. People streamed into the city for the festival of Norus from neighbouring areas and put up their tents in the suburbs of the capital as activities took place both outside and inside the palace grounds. The king initiated the Norus feast when his subjects bore him upon his throne from one capital to the other. Because of this, Persians called Persepolis Takti Jamshed, which translated to the throne of Jamshid in reference to the popular mythological figure Jamshid. Positioned in the heart of the continent-sized Persian Empire was Persepolis, the greatest of all Persian cities, and the key to understanding their empire's greatest achievements. Persepolis is the Greek designation for the Acropolis of the city that was once originally called Perses, the Persians, but today it is generally applied to both the city and its Acropolis. The name is attested in Achaemenid inscriptions, but after the fall of the Persian Empire and the destruction of the city, the population was no longer able to read the royal documents and inscriptions. The name of the city was gradually forgotten, and later the Sassanids called it Sad Stun, the 100 Columned. Persepolis is located in the Fars province of modern day Iran, approximately 70 miles northeast of modern day Shiraz. Ancient Persia was composed of a broad range of ecozones, including plateaus, rainforests, deserts, plains, and mountain ranges, each containing a diversity of flora and fauna, and a climate ranging from arid to subtropical. The characteristics of the landscape in and around Persepolis were major factors in the site's growth and success. In particular, the city's success depended strictly upon its relationship with the ecology, climate and resources of the Marvdasht Plain, a remote and barren land surrounded by sharp cliffs and fertile foothills of the Zagros Mountains, and part of the Kur River Basin. This area was settled around the first millennium BC. The climate of the region affected Persepolis dramatically. During the rainy season of the Iranian winter, the surrounding landscape became muddy and impassable. Therefore, most activity in the city took place during the warmer spring and summer seasons. Archaeologists have been able to attribute most of the structures and phases of construction in Persepolis to the reign of one emperor. Persepolis was founded shortly before 500 BC by Darius the Great, the fourth king of the Achaemenid dynasty. The first period of construction took place between 518 and 490 BC, and during this time, the monumental terrace was constructed along with the Apadana Audience Hall and Treasury Building, with the eastern stairs serving as the access point. King after king added to Darius's creation. The second period of construction began from around 490 BC, as Darius initiated the construction of the Takara, Winter Palace, and the Gate of All Nations with its stairway, and expanded the Apadana. Many of these structures were completed during the third period of construction between 480 and 470 BC under the rule of his son, Xerxes I. Xerxes, the greatest foe of the Greeks, succeeded Darius in 486 and ruled until 465 BC. The largest part of Persepolis, a sort of second city, was built by the succeeding emperors of Xerxes down to Darius III. Under Xerxes's rule, the Hardys, Queen's Quarters, Tripolon, and Southern Buildings were constructed. After Xerxes, Persepolis continued to expand considerably, and friezes and bas-reliefs of this period depict it as a time of great celebration and expansion of the empire. This gives a sense of how strong and solid the empire was. 
quite the opposite of the barbarian images that the ancient Greeks handed down to Western civilization. Under the rule of Artaxerxes I, the hall of 100 columns was constructed, along with his palace and the garrison quarters. The final phase of construction took place from the turn of the century to Alexander's invasion in 334 BC. During this time, the royal tombs of Artaxerxes II and Artaxerxes III were excavated. The palace of Artaxerxes III was constructed along with the hall of 32 columns, and a new road and gate were started. In approximately 518 BC, Darius selected a huge rock on the northwestern side of a hill called Kui Rahmat, Mountain of Mercy, for the construction of an immense terrace, upon which a fort, palaces, audience halls and a treasury would later be built. Large sections of the original rock were cut away, with the stone carved into immense stone blocks, and these blocks were used together with rough boulders, smaller stones and mud to construct the terrace. It took almost a century for this giant platform to be completed, but when it did, it covered an area of more than 125,000 square metres. Due to its massive size, the construction of the palatial complex took place in a series of stages. The finished terrace was between 45 and 55 feet high, with the southern part lower than the rest. This area was where the original access point was located. Water channels were dug into the bedrock and the hillside, with an outlet dug in the form of a long and deep moat located behind the eastern wall. Originally, there was a fortification wall that went around its entire circumference, including the ridge and crest of the adjacent Kue Ramat. The terrace was later accessed by a series of monumental double staircases on the northwestern side of the Acropolis platform. The construction of the staircases was ordered by Xerxes. Each flight had 111 steps, and each step was about 20 feet wide and 38 centimetres deep, but with a very shallow rise of just 10 centimetres. The steps were deliberately given broad width and short height so that the large number of military and civil officers and representatives of the subject nations who came to the city could climb with ease and in groups, as seen in the frieze of the Tripolon staircase. Located east of these stairs was the Gate of All Nations, the monumental entrance portal that provided access to the ceremonial core of the city. Two massive guardian bulls supported the pillars of the west doorway. These were images of kingship and royal strength, known as Lamassu, that had been adopted from the Babylonian civilization and became widely used throughout the Persian homeland. They announced to visitors that they were entering the heart of royal Persian power. The gate was covered in a cedar wood roof, and its doors were adorned with gold fittings. Walking through the enormous structure, visitors were asked to stand and wait in a four-columned hall, sitting on benches of black marble that abutted the walls. These walls were covered in glazed tiles that were decorated with patterns of lotus flowers, palm trees and stars. Here, the foreign delegates would be arranged in groups depending on the distance they had travelled to reach Persepolis before being allowed to access the imperial platform. A master of ceremonies would stand on a platform abutting one of the walls, observing the hall, and within view of the king's palace, where a representative would give him a signal to send forth the delegates. They would then proceed through the southern doorway. Persian dignitaries, in contrast to those from vassal states outside of the Persian heartland, would pass through the eastern doorway, the pillars of which were supported by additional human-headed Lamassu bulls. At the heart of Persepolis was the Apadana, an audience hall where the Persian king received his subjects, and where the mysteries of the city truly begin. The Apadana took 30 years to complete and covered an area of 3,600 square metres, almost as large as a modern-day football field. It is believed that the enormous hall could have accommodated up to 10,000 people. Its walls were nearly six metres thick. Today, only 14 of the original columns still stand, but in its original state, 72 columns, each over 80 feet high, held up a massive cedar wood ceiling. Each column was supported by a square base with a fluted shaft and a capital in the form of a double-headed bull. Unusually, the capitals of the eastern portico had a double-headed lion instead. The floor would likely have been covered in costly carpets and rugs, 
and the walls would have been adorned with glazed tiles, decorated with variegated floral motifs, rows of cedar and palm trees, files of soldiers, and even cuneiform inscriptions. The construction of this extraordinary palace was a remarkable achievement, so Darius the Great ordered a trilingual inscription in the Old Persian, Akkadian, and Elamite languages to be prepared. It listed his name and the extent of his realm, and was copied onto four pairs of gold and silver tablets. Each pair of tablets were placed within a stone box and deposited inside the foundation wall at each of the four corners of the hall. Xerxes made some modifications to the Apadana, as attested by an inscription on glazed bricks, discovered there that state, the great King Xerxes says, By the grace of Ahura Mazda, much that had been ordered by King Darius, my father, was well. It was also by the grace of Ahura Mazda that I completed these works and made it excellent. However, it is unknown precisely what these later works were. The Apadana was where the Persian kings received tribute from all of the peoples of their empire, and where they could portray themselves as conquerors of the world. After climbing the staircases and through the deep portico, the foreign dignitaries would have been led through a massive set of doorways, each sixty feet high and covered with sheets of decorative gold patterns, lions and bulls. Unfortunately, nothing remains today apart from the massive door sills. Visitors would have had to go through a specific series of ceremonial actions when they entered the Great Hall, as indicated by the bas-reliefs carved throughout the Acropolis. They would have fallen to their knees in front of the king, and then immediately prostrated themselves on the ground, before giving the gifts or tribute and slowly backing out of the Great Throne Room. The most beautiful and important surviving part of the Apadana is the Eastern Portico Frieze, which is decorated with exquisite sculptured bas-reliefs. This frieze was likely created in the final years of the 6th century BC and is believed to have been the work of Yauna sculptors from Greece. The inner façade of the Apadana Eastern Portico frieze that faces the courtyard is decorated with lines of soldiers, dignitaries and courtiers adorning one wing and 23 gift-bearing delegations on another. The northern part of the frieze depicts a troop of dignitaries from within the Persian homeland, marching alongside horsemen and charioteers. At the centre are eight armed men and a winged sun. On the southern area of the frieze is depicted a procession of dignitaries from all over the Persian Empire, travelling to Persepolis to give gifts and pay tribute to the great Persian king. Twenty-three nations have been identified in this stairway frieze, and among those represented are Thracians from Southeast Europe, Syrians and Cappadocians from the Levant and Anatolia, Aryans, Bactrians and Sogdians from the East, Arabs from the South, Babylonians from ancient Mesopotamia, and Libyans from Africa. The nations were identified by their styles of dress or facial features. The Medes were those with round caps, the Persians had straight caps, and the Elamites had their distinctive robes. They are shown bringing objects and commodities from different parts of the empire, such as fine horses, shaggy mountain goats, camels, ivory tusks, carts gold and jewellery. Some of the figures possess characteristics that mark them as figures of great importance. For example, one Elamite is wearing a diadem in his curly hair and brings with him lions to offer to the Persian leader, all of which are signs of royalty. Some of the objects that are shown on the friezes have been discovered by archaeologists, such as a tall golden vessel with handles in the shape of griffins. Most of these dignitaries are shown carrying a lotus-like flower, and some hold round objects, both of which are still associated with the Nowruz festival. This displayed both the wealth and power of the Persian Empire. The frieze was also covered in symbolic imagery. Floral rosettes with twelve petals are shown, likely symbolising the twelve months of the year, as well as cypress trees, and an evergreen plant that was considered auspicious and paradoxical by the Persians. These have been interpreted as symbols of perpetual happiness and prosperity. A lion attacking a bull is shown beneath the sculpted cypress trees, with the lion's head depicted frontally, a perspective that is very unusual compared to the side-on profiles of the figures shown elsewhere across the city. The most accepted interpretation of this scene is its astronomical association. The lion Leo was one of the signs of the Persian zodiac, 
and was associated with the sun. The bull Taurus was also one of the star signs that had been identified by this time. These stars were closely associated with the vernal equinox, which in the Persian calendar marked the start of the Nowruz festival. It may also have signified eternity, the symbolism of which would not have been lost among those attending ceremonies at the site that were designed to strengthen the ties between the diverse parts of the empire. This frieze indicates that Persepolis was less a military capital, and instead first and foremost a symbolic and ceremonial place. From all over the empire, subject peoples came here to give their gifts to the king. The formal presentation of tribute confirmed the loyalty of the subject nations and the power of the king. A walk to the king followed a specific route through the complex, intended to maximize the impact of the architecture. Thousands of years later, it's still possible to imagine the cacophony of noise that would have been caused by the procession as they climbed the great staircases of the unfamiliar city before they finally reached the gate of all nations. Coming from the far-flung corners of the empire, few of these people would have ever seen a structure like this, ensuring that every visitor in ancient times who was allowed to climb to the royal terrace would have been in total awe. The royal treasury was one of the first buildings to be constructed on the platform, its function was interpreted from the artefacts discovered there, among which was a cache of 750 clay tablets inscribed with texts in the Elamite language. These tablets preserved the record of payments to those employed in Persepolis. Needless to say, this archive is crucial because it sheds light on the administration of the work and conditions of the labourers at Persepolis, providing information on the division of work, the ethnic background of many employees, and their classification according to skills and gender. Both men and women were hired as labourers at Persepolis, and were paid in kind or cash according to their skills and nature of their work. The tablets also record the staff of the treasury itself. They indicate that more than 1,300 people worked there. Also found in the treasury was a statue of Penelope, wife of the legendary Greek figure Odysseus. The statue may have been stolen from Greece during the campaigns there, led by Darius in 480 BC, or it might have been gifted to the king by a foreign dignitary. The second largest palace of Persepolis was a splendid building with a central hall containing 100 columns, which gave the structure its name, the Hall of 100 Columns. Its construction was started by Xerxes and completed by his son, Artaxerxes I. The columns of the building were laid out in ten rows of ten columns each, built of a local dark grey stone. Each had a bell-shaped base, fluted shaft, and was adorned on the top with floral designs and a gilded double-headed bull, upon whose backs rested the cedar rafters that supported the ceiling. The hall was over 200 feet long and 200 feet wide, and access was provided by four main doorways, two to the south and two to the north. The doorways to the south were decorated with the figures of the king in audience, with subjects carrying his throne. Those to the north depict five rows of ten figures, each shown from one perspective of their profile on either side of the doorway. These one hundred individuals represented the most senior officials of the empire, an analogy to the symbolism of the hundred columns within the hall. It's believed that this structure was an additional audience hall, though at an unknown point in time, it was converted into storage rooms. Not everyone was allowed to approach the king. Sometimes visitors would have to be content with a glimpse of the emperor. According to bas-reliefs, when the king sat on his throne, he was enclosed in curtains and shrouded in shadow. The sparkling of his golden scepter was the signal that granted the right to speak. Only a select few would have been allowed to approach the king and pay homage to him with a deferential kiss known as proskinesis. Some of the most beautiful works of Persian art have been found in the Hall of 100 Columns. Their art was depicted in a very stylized manner, from the way they rendered the curls of hair to the extraordinarily detailed animals with evocative facial expressions. There is also evidence that the friezes were painted in bright colors. The costumes for all of the foreign delegates are rendered in such detail that it is clear the Persian artists were fascinated by the variety of peoples they witnessed visiting the city. 
Also found in the building was the miniature bust of a young prince made of lapis lazuli and eyes of precious stones, now lost. Another work of art, there was a small tile ornamented with an eagle with outstretched wings, the royal ensign of the Persian Empire. After presiding over the grand procession in the Apadana, the king would withdraw to the central palace known as the Tripolon, the Triple Gate, a private room for the king and his councillors located in between the Apadana and Hall of 100 Columns. The building is composed of a main hall supported by four massive columns, each decorated with capitals sculpted in the shape of Lamassu bulls. The eastern doorway depicts the mirror images of a ceremonial scene showing the Persian king seated on a royal chair, with his crown prince standing behind him. They are both upon a massive platform that is being carried into the hall by 28 people, an image that may allude to what happened inside the structure. The north and south doors of the Tripolon led to the king's private apartments. These were also heavily decorated, this time showing the king leaving the building. It was here that the king would meet with his trusted aides to improve the organization of his empire. In this chamber, the council resolved to build new roads, chart new sea routes, establish a unified system of weights and measures, evidence of which has been discovered in the treasury, and adopt a common currency using coins of gold and silver. That said, some scholars argue that this structure was nothing more than a monumental corridor connecting the Apadana and Hall of 100 Columns. One of the first palaces built on the Persepolis platform was the Takara, Winter Palace, located to the southwest of the Apadana and facing south. This was intended to serve as the private residence of Darius, but he died before construction was completed, so it was finished by his son, Xerxes. The facade of the building was almost exactly modelled after Achaemenid royal tombs from Darius onwards, and its lintels carved in an Egyptian style also showed a striking resemblance to the palace of the Sasanian king Ardassir I in the city of Firuzabad. Bas reliefs were carved into the door frames and facade, depicting the king entering the building carried by a retinue of servants. Other motifs show the king's warriors slaying lions, winged bulls, and other beasts. The columns and ceiling of this palace were probably wooden, though no trace of them has survived. There were many royal inscriptions carved into the walls, doorways, window frames, and even on doorknobs of the palace, the floor was paved with red tiles and likely covered in beautiful carpets. One particularly splendid room within this complex was a room dimly lit by light streaming through the window spaces, which then reflected off of the highly polished stonework within. The architectural work was created with such a refined polish and beauty that people called it the Mirror Hall. Sometime after 375 BC, Artaxerxes III added a gate and staircase on the western side of the palace. Upon the doorframe, he had inscribed messages that proclaimed his royal lineage and the buildings constructed during his reign. It is believed that a garden was also cultivated during this period, as small water channels were installed close to the gate, and the clay tablets found in Persepolis list the different trees and plants that were planted here. They showed that the composition of the garden was deeply symbolic. There were seedlings for thousands of different types of plants, including mulberries, olives and dates, that had been collected by the king. These were trees that he had imported from all over his empire to reflect the size and extent of his power in this garden space. This garden was another form of political statement, because by making plants grow in an otherwise barren landscape and by creating something ordered in an otherwise chaotic environment, the Persian king showed all who came that they were the masters of the world. Close to the mirror hall was the palace of Xerxes, built on the south side of the terrace. Known as the Hardies, it measured over seven and a half thousand square feet, making it twice as large as the palace of Darius. The main hall in the palace featured 36 columns, and surrounding it were three rooms on its eastern side and three on its western side. On the northern side, was a wide portico facing the Apadana. The decorative scheme of this building was similar to that of Darius's palace, with bas-reliefs that depicted the king being carried by servants as he entered and exited his residence. Located in between the palace of Darius and that of Xerxes is a very well-preserved interconnecting stairway frieze, 
depicting Ahura Mazda flanked on each side by sphinxes and members of the king's bodyguard. According to classical writers, this elite corps of the Persian army consisted of 10,000 foot soldiers carefully selected to protect the emperor. The number always remained at 10,000, because as soon as one died or was injured, another immediately replaced him. For this reason, the corps was known as the Immortals, or the Apple Bearers. Based on the depictions of these troops at the Palace of Xerxes and on glazed bricks at Susa, their uniforms were very colourful and shone with brilliant golden and floral designs. The king they defended represented the unified state and the sole ruler capable of imposing order onto the world. In some parts of the empire, he was even viewed as a divinity. The aforementioned halls represent the most well-known structures on the Acropolis, but many other buildings were constructed there. There were various residential areas and small private palaces scattered throughout the Acropolis. On the lower southern side of the platform was a complex known as the Southern Buildings, which may have been used as storerooms or residential quarters for slaves and servants. These were built by Xerxes between approximately 480 and 470 BC, and it is believed that they stand on top of the earliest point of access to the Acropolis. Located west of the palaces of Darius and Xerxes was a series of structures known today as the Garrison Quarters, though it is unknown precisely what their function once was. These were constructed during the reign of Artaxerxes I and feature a very well-preserved kitchen area, complete with a mud-brick oven. East of Xerxes's palace and west of the treasury is the so-called Queen's Quarters, an L-shaped complex also constructed during the period of Xerxes' rule. Although it has been called a harem, these institutions did not exist in Persia during the Achaemenid period of rule. The title was given by later European explorers, drawing upon fanciful stories of the Persian king's 360 wives, as described by the Greeks. Although less well-preserved in comparison to those of Darius and Xerxes, King Artaxerxes III had his own splendid palace constructed on the Acropolis during his reign. His palace was located in between the Palace of Xerxes and the Apadana. The floor plan was roughly identical with that of Darius's palace. The western section of the palace was decorated with a series of horned stone crenellations. Artaxerxes III also constructed a structure known as the Hall of 32 Columns on the Acropolis, though its function is not known. To the north of the Hall of 100 Columns is an unfinished gate started under the rule of Artaxerxes III, which was originally intended to be a counterpart to the Gate of All Nations. It is believed that from the mid-4th century BC on this served as the main access point to the terrace, with a thoroughfare known today as the Army Road or Procession Road leading from this entrance to the Gate of All Nations. Located along the road were unfinished capitals carved in the shape of unusual eagle-headed griffins believed to represent the Huma bird of Persian mythology. The incomplete status of the gate has provided scholars with a glimpse at the process by which many of the structures in Persepolis were built. For example, unfinished slabs were laid over one another before being carved into shape because the artists did not want to damage the lower parts with falling chips as they were working on the upper sections. There were also a series of fortifications separating the Acropolis from the lower city of Perses, which surrounded the ceremonial core of Persepolis to the south, west and northwest. This area was likely occupied before Darius started construction of the terrace, though little is known about its earliest history. The lower city was an entire city of servants' houses, artisans' workshops and everything else that served life in the king's court. Much of this is still waiting to be revealed by archaeologists and for their secrets to be discovered. The limited archaeological studies have revealed the foundations of a few large buildings, most of which were built in the traditional Persian style of square-shaped mud bricks, much like those of the Acropolis. Many of the door jams were made of stone, which was very abundant in Persepolis perched, as it was, on a terrace of rock. One is particularly well preserved, showing a floor plan that consisted of a residential core, including a central hall surrounded by smaller rooms, with a square courtyard accessed by a short flight of stairs. The lower city seems to have been looted and razed during the period of Alexander's conquest, 
and remained uninhabited after his armies had moved on. In Persia, if someone wanted to offer tribute to a deity, they would have been hard-pressed to do so because there were no temples. All over Persia, altars have been found standing alone on open hilltops, and the traces left by fires during sacrifices can still be found. Along with other evidence, these have contributed to historians' understanding of the Persian religion. For the Persians, all of creation was divine, the sky, the earth, and all of its elements. The Persians considered natural phenomena, such as water, wind, earth, and fire, as sacred attributes. Hence, sacrifices were not held in an enclosed temple, but outside under the open sky. They offered their sacrifices to the sun, the sky, the moon, the earth, and fire. The earliest believers may have worshipped these as deities, thanks to their association with some of the most fundamental aspects of daily life. However, around the 8th century BC, fundamental changes occurred in religious beliefs across the region, as demonstrated in the Shahnameh, the Book of Kings, an epic history of the Iranian people, written sometime in the late 1st millennium AD by the Persian poet Fadawsi. In this, it is made perfectly clear that these people had begun to believe in a sort of monotheism which had been reformed and made more ethical by Zoroaster, Zarathustra, sometime during this time. Although little is known of Zoroaster's life, other than that he was Persian, his teachings were not actually compiled and documented until as late as the 3rd century AD, many centuries after his death. Nonetheless, his teachings of a dualistic religion and of the eternal conflict between good and truth and evil and deception had a profound impact on Persian society. Their faith was directed towards the worship of a single deity known as Ahura Mazda, who incarnated the supreme good. Other deities were reinterpreted as being nothing more than demons and devils. Zoroastrianism became the principal religion of the Achaemenid dynasty. On the southern retaining wall of the Acropolis Terrace, there are two inscriptions that describe the extent and nature of its connection to Persian royal power. Both are written in the Aryan alphabet, a script created under the orders of Darius I to be used for Achaemenid royal inscriptions. These attest to the importance of Ahura Mazda to the rulers of Persepolis. Ahura Mazda was the principal Zoroastrian god, the lord of wisdom, who was worshipped at fire temples. However, the Persians did not force the people of their empire to believe in Ahura Mazda. They allowed freedom of worship. Sacrifices could be dedicated to any god they wished. The Jewish Book of Ezra offers an independent account, in which the Persians are praised for liberating the Jews and allowing them to practice their religion freely. Two of the Persian kings, Artaxerxes II and Artaxerxes III, had their tombs cut into the rock above Persepolis, on the sacred Kui Mer, mountain of Mithra, which was known as the Kui Ramat, Mount of Mercy, from the 13th century on. This site was closely associated with the ancient Persian deity Mithra, god of oases and of the sun. There were an additional four Achaemenid royal tombs excavated at Naxi Rustam, a necropolis located approximately 12 kilometers to the northwest of Persepolis. A few miles from Persepolis, archaeologists discovered a well-preserved small building with a square foundation known today as the Cube of Zoroaster. What it was is still a mystery, sparking vigorous debate among scholars, not just because of its unknown origin, but also for its location close to the walls of Mount Nakshe Rustam. There are several hypotheses regarding this site. Some say that it is a temple of fire, and others believe that it is a watchtower. The most alluring idea is that it was once a library where sacred texts were kept. Upon closer inspection, a number of figures were found carved into the rock face. They appear to be in mourning for the death of their emperor, as evidenced by the cross-shaped incisions carved high in the rock face, each with an entrance elevated far from the ground. This is where Kings Darius I, Xerxes I, Artaxerxes I and Darius II were buried most in stone sarcophagi. Kings Artaxerxes IV and Darius III of May also have been buried in the tomb of Artaxerxes II. All six of these tombs share a similar form and decorative scheme, 
and are believed to have all been copied from that of Darius I. They also share a resemblance with the carved façade of the Tachara. The king is shown on the tomb register as standing upon a platform that is carried by his servants. Depicted on these tombs are bas-reliefs that show the Persian king making sacrifices to a flame and to the god Ahura Mazda. In front of the tomb of Darius I is a well-preserved water basin, which is believed to have been used in funeral ceremonies. From Persepolis, the Persian kings managed their vast empire, and they were unique in how they envisaged how an empire should be run. Compared to the general consensus of the ancient world, in which cultures would seek to conquer, obliterate and rebuild according to their own terms, this process was not the case with Persia, where political objectives were ensured through tolerance of cultural diversity. If subject nations paid their taxes and tribute to the Persian king, that was all that was required for them to continue living according to their own customs and cultural setting. To avoid confusing Babel, a common language was adopted during ceremonies and official acts, Old Persian. By using a language that they themselves had to study and learn, the Persians once again displayed their desire to create a common world that all would be able to belong to. Old Persian was the official language of the Persian bureaucracy, an important step between the creation of an empire encompassing many peoples to a state composed of a single people. The Persian representation of the empire as being multifaceted and tolerant of diversity was a dramatic departure from the imperial precedents of their forebearers. The subjects of earlier empires, such as of the Babylonian and Assyrian empires, had also spoken and written many languages, but when it came to putting inscriptions into palaces and monuments of the rulers, the inscriptions were that of the rulers. In this way, the identity of the empire was expressed in the terms of the rulers. The languages of the Achaemenid inscriptions, by contrast, were unprecedented symbols of the relationships between rulers and the ruled, as they were frequently provided in both the official Old Persian language and the languages of their vassal states, namely Elamite and Akkadian. By allowing subject nations to live their own lives, the Persians ensured that a multi-ethnic and multilingual empire flourished in relative peace for 250 years. That said, it obviously took more than tolerance to maintain control over a territory that stretched nearly 3,000 miles from west to east. Empires need an infrastructure in order to maintain control. Persian Power Fifty miles outside of Persepolis, carved into the side of a hill, is an ancient Persian road leading to the city, and the sides of the road are up to thirty feet high. Such feats of engineering were repeated across the empire, where a network of roads and highways allowed the Persians to get information, people and materials from one corner of the empire to wherever the king was as quickly as possible. Even the Greeks could not fail to be impressed by the Persian road system, which stretched from Persepolis to Susa, and to Ekbatana via Pasargadai, and then 1,500 miles to the west to Ephesus on the Mediterranean. Roads also went east to India. The Greeks were particularly amazed by the messengers that travelled along these roads, keeping the Persian kings at Persepolis informed of everything that occurred in the empire. The great Greek historian Herodotus wrote that no mortal thing travels faster than these Persian couriers. Such speed was possible because of another Persian innovation, the staging post. Thanks to this system, a messenger would ride on one horse and be able to quickly change animals at these garrisons, located approximately every twenty miles along the highways, before continuing their journey straight away. Manned by Persian soldiers, the staging posts also ensured that for the first time in antiquity, traders and travellers could move around a vast tract of land in relative safety. Much is known about the nature and structure of imperial power through the art discovered in the city. Archaeological investigations discovered two particularly interesting sculptured scenes showing the royal audience, one of which is stored in the Iran National Museum and the other in the Persepolis Treasury. Both of these had originally ornamented the central façade of the Apadana stairways, but were later removed to the treasury for unknown reasons. The king appointed members of his family or his most trusted men to select positions. 
Darius I is displayed enthroned beneath a canopy, and the heir to the throne, Xerxes, stands alongside several senior officials behind him. One of these officials is likely Pharnaces, the son of Arsames, and the chief economic official who was responsible for the payment of food gifts to the residents and visitors of the city. The master of ceremonies stood before the throne and reported on the proceedings of the festivals. Ushers are depicted introducing the groups of gift-bearing delegations as they enter. The exchange of gifts was therefore a key element in the Persian mechanisms of power and royal ideology, and the Apadana served as the principal location at which this took place. It was therefore no surprise that Alexander the Great targeted this structure in particular to be destroyed. One particularly interesting inscription discovered in the Queen's quarters indicated that there might have been an element of competition when it came to a ruler's succession. Describing the ascension of Xerxes to the Persian throne after the death of Darius I, it reads, My father Darius had other sons, but thus was Ahura Mazda's desire. My father Darius made me the largest after himself. When my father Darius went away from the throne, by the grace of Ahura Mazda, I became king on my father's throne. Researchers from the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago began to excavate the Acropolis in 1931, and in 1933 they discovered fragments of tablets in two rooms of a gatehouse at the edge of the stone terrace. These became known as the Persepolis Fortification Tablets, as they had been discovered in the foundations of the ruined fortification wall that once surrounded the terrace. Thirty thousand fragments and whole tablets were found which together provide one of the few sources of information about the workings of the empire that were written by the Persians themselves, information that we would otherwise never have access to. They were written in several languages and composed of four main types of document, cuneiform texts in the Elamite language with impressions of seals, documents written in the Aramaic language and script also with seal impressions, pieces with seal impressions but no text, and various miscellaneous and unique pieces in Greek, Phrygian, Akkadian, and the only tablet written in Old Persian ever discovered. Like a treasure trove of coins, these were stored together in antiquity and found together in modern times. What do these tablets tell researchers about Persepolis? They were not about the deeds and characters of kings, or armies on the march, or the eunuchs and harem intrigues, or other things that Hellenistic writers and artists were interested in. They are mostly the receipts and invoices of the empire during a narrow time of fewer than 20 years, around 500 BC. More specifically, they are the record of one particular aspect of the Persian Empire, the provision of food by a centralised body. They describe transactions involving a range of grains, beer, wine, animals, fruits and vegetables, for people that were on the Persian government's payrolls, including workers, craftsmen, clerks, travellers, and members of the king's own family. One records one and a half shekels of silver for carpenters making sculptures, and another details one jug of wine each to the 74 Syrian labourers working on the columned hall. With their road infrastructure, the Persians could establish an extensive trading network across their empire, through which they acquired the luxury goods to maintain the loyalty of their elite. The purpose of luxury at Persepolis was mainly linked to their perceptions of power and the propaganda of kingship, to have superfluous articles of expensive clothing, or to have one's palace strewn with textiles, an expression of power and wealth through the conspicuous consumption of material goods. In that vein, one custom that both fascinated and appalled the Greeks was the Persian feast. Most of what is known of the Persian feast comes from Greek sources, who described the opulence of the objects used, and the amount of drinking that was an essential part of the proceedings. The Persians lived according to a principle of telling the truth, something that the Greeks begrudgingly admired in them. Drinking during feasts had an important social role. They tended to get very drunk, because they believed that only in doing so they would tell the truth and be able to effectively settle arguments. Feasting brought groups together as a community, with everyone partaking in the same food and engaging in the same experience. Perhaps not surprisingly, the Persians were renowned for their luxury. 
Records and archaeological evidence indicate that they purchased spices, gold, purple dyes, and reams of the finest textiles. Although all that remains today are bare stone pillars and walls, the halls and palaces of Persepolis were once splendidly decorated in sumptuous textiles. These fabrics were a way of expressing status and would have been found on walls, all over the floors and the furniture. The cost of the site must have been immeasurable, judging from its immense scale, the opulence of its decoration, and luxury of the ceremonies and events that took place there. It seems the Persians were able to afford it through state investment, and making sure the fertile region of the Persian homeland flourished under the Achaemenid rule. Agriculture served as their main form of income, and the Persepolis fortification tablets indicate that grain and other produce served as the primary means of paying taxes. In addition to the tributes and taxes paid by their vassals within the empire, the Persian royalty profited from the extensive trade that took place across their realm, along the land-based routes known as the Silk Road and maritime trade routes via the Persian Gulf. Due to their position, the Persians frequently acted as middlemen in transactions between their neighbours. Their economy made use of a system of standardised coinage, and they even had a form of banking system by which the market could be made secure. Gift-giving was how the Persian kings reinforced the loyalty of their subjects, but they also had other, less benign ways of exercising power. A bas-relief at Behistun, in northwestern Iran, shows the Persian king at his most ruthless. Darius I is shown enslaving those who threatened his throne, and the prominent position of the image served as a public warning to those who may have considered resisting him. Many ancient Greek accounts also suggest that the Persians ruled with an iron fist, including descriptions of how the Persians cut off the limbs and even noses of their prisoners. However, the reliefs at Persepolis seem to present a very different perspective. There, the figures do not display the expected rigidity of court rule or enslavement. Instead, they appear relaxed, chatting and encouraging one another. They are depicted as holding one another's hands or shoulders, providing an image of peace and harmony. There are no battle scenes depicted in the city, and no violence in any form is demonstrated. Tolerant, peaceful and wealthy, the Achaemenid kings believed that they were the masters of all that they surveyed, and during the Iron Age, they were absolutely correct. The End of the Persian Empire In 500 BC, the major Greek city-states Sparta and Athens were not terribly interested in the affairs of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, and for the most part, the status of the Ionian Greeks, who were under Persian control, also mattered very little to them. Sparta stood at the head of an alliance league of Peloponnesian city-states who were more concerned with their region, while Athens had recently abolished tyranny and was learning the intricacies of democratic government. While Athens was uninvolved, perhaps following the cue of their Athenian cousins, some of the Ionian, Aeolian and Doric city-states in Anatolia revolted against their own tyrants, which was tantamount to rebellion against their Persian overlords. Herodotus provided the best account of the Ionian Revolt, which was largely instigated by a former tyrant named Aristagoras, who believed that a successful revolt would place him in a powerful position. Herodotus wrote, Certain substantial citizens of Naxos, forced by the commons to leave the island, took refuge in Miletus, which had been put under Aristagoras, son of Molpagoras, as deputy governor. He was nephew and son-in-law of Histiaeus the son of Lysagoras, who was being detained by Darius at Susa. The first thing they did when they got there was to ask Aristagoras to lend them some troops, in the hope of recovering their position at home. This suggested to Aristagoras that if he helped the exiles to return, he himself would be ruler of Naxos, so using their friendship with Histiaeus to cloak his purpose, he made them an offer. Aristagoras had a keen sense of political acumen and a feel for the times, as a large part of his strategy was to gain the favour of the Ionians' Greeks by promising the reward of democracy. First, he had to abdicate his own tyranny, which he did in public fashion. According to Herodotus, to induce the Milesians to support him, he began by professing to abdicate his tyranny in favour of a popular government, and then went on to do the same thing in the other Ionian states, where he got rid of the tyrants. 
At the same time, Aristagoras knew that enticing the Ionian states to rebel would not be enough to defeat the mighty Achaemenid Empire. For that, he would need the support of one or both of the Ionian's mainland Greek cousins. However, Aristagoras's efforts to obtain the aid of Sparta and Athens against the Persians would lead to his demise and set the Athenians on a crash course with the Persians that would reach its apex at Marathon. Perhaps owing to the fierce reputation of the Spartan warriors, or simply due to the fact that Sparta was farthest from Ionia, Aristagoras visited Sparta first to plead for assistance against the Persians. At the time, Sparta's government was a type of republican monarchy in which adult males had voting rights at their councils, but two kings presided over the city and largely decided on affairs of state such as diplomacy and war. When Aristagoras finally made it to Sparta, he met with the only reigning king of the time, Cleomenes, and at first tried to appeal to his patriotism, then his pride, and finally his greed. Herodotus's account of Aristagoras's plea to Cleomenes reads, I hope, Cleomenes, that you will not be too much surprised at my anxiety to visit you. The circumstances are these. That Ionians should have become slaves in place of free men is a bitter shame and grief, not only to us, but to the rest of Greece, and especially to you, who are the leaders of the Greek world. We beg you, therefore, in the name of the gods of Greece, to save from slavery your Ionian kinsmen. It will be an easy task, for these foreigners have little taste for war, and you are the finest soldiers in the world. The Persian weapons are bows and short spears. They fight in trousers and turbans. That will show you how easy they are to beat. Moreover, the inhabitants of that continent are richer than all the rest of the world put together. They have everything, gold, silver, bronze, elaborately embroidered clothes and beasts of burden and slaves. All this you may have if you wish. Cleomenes's interest was apparently piqued until Aristagoras showed him a map of the vast Achaemenid Empire, to which the Spartan replied, Your proposal to take Lacedaemonians a three-month's journey from the sea is a highly improper one. Unfazed by the Spartan's denial of his proposal, Aristagoras began to sail back to Ionia, but he stopped in Athens to present the citizens of that city-state with a similar offer. Aristagoras approached the Athenians at an opportune time, as they had recently expelled their tyrant Hippias, who was supported by the Persians, so they were already inclined to campaign against them. Aristagoras used many of the same arguments he tried with the Spartans, including the weakness of the Persian military and the riches of the Achaemenid Empire, but he also appealed to common ancestry that the Athenians and Ionians shared. Herodotus noted, In addition to this, he pointed out that Miletus had been founded by Athenian settlers, so it was only natural that the Athenians, powerful as they were, should help her in her need. Once persuaded to accede to Aristagoras's appeal, the Athenians passed a decree for the dispatch of twenty ships to Ionia under the command of Melanthius, a distinguished Athenian. Athenian support for the Ionian cause was lukewarm at best, and the entire Ionian coalition soon crumbled under the weight of the mighty Achaemenid Empire. When the Persians were finally able to re-establish their rule over the rebellious Ionian city-states, Aristagoras fled and later died in exile, and the rebellious cities, especially Miletus, suffered under brutal punitive measures. Herodotus graphically wrote about the punishment the Persians meted out to the Ionians. Once the towns were in their hands, the best-looking boys were chosen for castration and made into eunuchs. The most beautiful girls were dragged from their homes and sent to Darius's court, and the towns themselves, temples and all, were burnt to the ground. The ruthless suppression of the Ionian revolt by the Persians proved to be the first act in the greater Greco-Persian wars, and if the Athenians thought that their limited involvement in the affair would mitigate the ire of Darius, they were sorely mistaken. Through their involvement in the Ionian revolt, despite the fact it was minimal for the most part, the Athenians set themselves at odds with the Persian emperor, putting them on a crash course that would culminate at the Battle of Marathon about nine years later. In 491 BC, following a successful invasion of Thrace over the Hellespont, 
Darius sent envoys to the main Greek city-states, including Sparta and Athens, demanding tokens of earth and water as symbols of submission. But Darius didn't exactly get the reply he sought. According to Herodotus in his famous histories, Xerxes, however, had not sent to Athens or to Sparta heralds to demand the gift of earth, and for this reason, namely because at the former time when Darius had sent for this very purpose, the one people threw the men who made the demand into the pit and the others into a well, and bade them take from thence earth and water and bear them to the king. Thus, in 490 BC, after the revolt in Ionia had been crushed, Darius sent his general Mardonius, at the head of a massive fleet and invading force, to destroy the meddlesome Greeks, starting with Athens. The Persian army, numbering anywhere between 30,000 and 300,000 men, landed on the plain at Marathon, a few dozen miles from Athens, where an Athenian army of 10,000 hoplite heavy infantry, supported by a thousand Plataeans, prepared to contest their passage. The Athenians appealed to the Spartans for help, but the Spartans dithered. According to the laws of Lycurgus, they were forbidden to march until the waxing moon was full. Accordingly, their army arrived too late. Thus, it fell upon the Athenians to shoulder the burden. With their army led by the great generals Miltiades and Themistocles, the Athenians charged the outnumbering Persians. Outmatched by the might of the heavy bronze-armoured Greek phalanx, the inferior Persian infantry was enveloped and destroyed, causing them to flee for their ships in panic. The Athenians won a colossal victory against an overwhelming and seemingly invincible enemy. Somewhat ironically, the Battle of Marathon has been best commemorated by the race that bears its name, a tradition that started based on a legend that a Greek man named Pheidippides ran the a little over 26 miles back to Athens in order to announce the Greek victory and subsequently collapsed and died as soon as he had done so. However, the importance of the battle itself cannot be overstated. The Battle of Marathon proved to be one of the biggest sources of enmity between the Greeks and Persians, and Darius's son Xerxes would seek to undo the results with his own invasion just years later. As it was, the rivalry between the Greeks and Persians would last for over 150 years and culminated with Alexander the Great's destruction of the Achaemenid Persian capital city of Persepolis. Marathon also positioned the city-state of Athens as a major power not only in Greece but throughout the Mediterranean and Near East as their military, diplomatic and economic influence grew after the battle. There are few battles in history in which the vanquished are better remembered and celebrated than the victors, and even fewer where a defeat is considered a victory. But that has become the enduring legacy of the Battle of Thermopylae, a battle as unique as it is famous. The story of the battle and the willing sacrifice of the Greek defenders to buy the rest of the retreating Greek's time is well known across the world and still resonates with audiences to this day. Last stands are the stuff of martial legends, and Thermopylae is the greatest of them all. Though there was another contingent of Greeks fighting alongside them, Thermopylae is remembered for the stand of the 300 Spartans, who, with no compulsion binding them, chose to fight and die in the remote mountain pass against insurmountable odds. Their story has been told in literature, art, film, and even in graphic novels. But the battle was more than the ultimate self-sacrifice, the embodiment of the famous statement that greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. It was also a veritable clash of civilizations, and one that, though in and of itself it was a defeat, helped set the stage for the eventual Greek victory that might very well have changed the course of history. It was a showdown between various Greek city-states, including Sparta and democratic Athens, against the autocratic, absolutist Persian Empire. Had the Persians triumphed, the Golden Age of Athens would have been snuffed out, and ancient Greece would never have formed the backbone of Roman and Western culture. Simply put, the West as people know it today might never have existed. Of course, the Greeks themselves couldn't have known that, and doubtless never viewed it that way. Famous as this battle is, it is likely that anyone with even a passing interest in military history has a basic understanding of what happened at Thermopylae. 
there still exist a vast number of misconceptions on the subject. First and foremost, the idea that the Persian horde was faced exclusively by the elite 300 Spartans. In actuality, until the last day of the battle, between 5,000 and 7,000 Greeks took their place in the battle line, including Arcadians, Corinthians, Mycenaeans, Mantineans, Tegeans, Thespians, Phocians, Locrians, and Thebans. Likewise, the idea that the Greeks themselves fought for democracy or any such political ideal is a fallacy. They were frequently at war with each other, and in this case banded together simply to fight for the individual independence of their own city-states and the continuing freedom of Greece itself. When the Spartans' famous and sacrificial stand at the Battle of Thermopylae ended, the Athenian fleet was forced to fall back, and Xerxes' massive Persian army marched unopposed into Greece before advancing on Athens. The Greek armies were scattered and unable to face the might of Persia, so Athens was forced to do the unthinkable, evacuate the entire population of the city to Salamis, from where the Athenians watched in horror as Xerxes' troops plundered the defenceless city, set it aflame, and raised the Acropolis. However, the Athenians remained belligerent, in part because according to the oracle at Delphi, only the wooden wall shall save you. Indeed, this would prove true when Themistocles managed to lure the Persian fleet into the Straits of Salamis. There, on a warm day in September of 480 BC, hundreds of Greek and Persian ships faced each other in a narrow strait between the Attic Peninsula of Greece and the island of Salamis. The battle that ensued would prove to be epic on a number of different levels, as it set a precedent for how later naval battles were fought in the ancient Mediterranean, turned the tide in the Greeks' favour against the Persians in the Persian Wars, and ultimately played a role in Athens' rise to a preeminent role in the Hellenic world. Bereft of much of his fleet after Salamis, Xerxes feared being stranded on the wrong side of the Hellespont, as there was a chance Themistocles might take the Allied navy north to destroy his bridge across the straits. Accordingly, he retreated with the greater part of his army, back through Thermopylae, and then from there to Persia, and many of his men perished from lack of adequate supplies and disease. Thus, it can safely be said that while Thermopylae continues to be more celebrated and better remembered, Salamis was the decisive battle of the Second Persian War. A careful examination of the Battle of Salamis and its aftermath reveals that perhaps the most important aspect that the battle had on Greece was the fulfilment of the oracle's prophecy that a wooden wall would protect the Greeks against the Persians. The wooden wall of Greek ships proved to not only protect the Greeks from the invaders, but also helped to propel the Greeks to a position of hegemony in the Mediterranean that was not surpassed until the rise of Rome several hundred years later. Of course, the Greco-Persian Wars also directly set the Achaemenids on a confrontational path with Alexander the Great in the following century, after the Macedonian king became the hegemon of Greece, and then set his sights to the east. Darius III, king of Persia at the time of Alexander's invasion, was no tactical genius. But he was an intelligent and persistent enemy who had been handed the throne just before the arrival of the indomitable Alexander. His misfortune was to face an enemy at the forefront of military innovation and flexibility, a fighting force that he was not equipped to handle, and the unconquerable will of the Macedonian army, fueled by devotion to their daring and charismatic king. Ever since the famous Persian invasions that had been repelled by the Athenians at Marathon and then by the Spartans at Thermopylae and Plataea, Greece and Persia had been at odds. For the past few years they had enjoyed an uneasy peace, but that peace was shattered in 334 BC when Alexander crossed the Hellespont into Persia. He brought with him an army of 50,000 infantry, 6,000 cavalry, and a navy of over a hundred ships, a mixed force of Macedonians, Greeks, Thracians, and Illyrians, all chosen for their specific strengths. He was still just 22. Darius III was no tactical genius but he was an intelligent and persistent enemy who had been handed the throne just before the arrival of the indomitable Alexander. His misfortune was to face an enemy at the forefront of military innovation and flexibility, a fighting force that he was not equipped to handle, 
and the unconquerable will of the Macedonian army, fueled by devotion to their daring and charismatic king. When Alexander crossed the Hellespont in 334 BC, his first major encounter with Persian forces took place along the Granicus River. The Persian commanders had met at the city of Zaleia, along with Memnon of Rhodes, the leader of their Greek mercenary forces, and Memnon advised the Persians not to fight Alexander head-on. Since the Persian forces were slightly outnumbered for the battle, Memnon advised that the Persians should scorch the nearby lands and make travel, and supplying the army difficult for Alexander. Ultimately, however, the Persians did not trust the Greek commander and were unwilling to destroy their own lands. It's quite likely they thought that the young, inexperienced king at the head of a Greek army would not be too difficult to defeat, so they instead decided to draw Alexander into a defensive position of their own choosing. Against a lesser general, their strategy might have worked well, but at the Battle of the Granicus River, the Persians would learn that Alexander was no typical military leader. What happened there set the tone for the rest of Alexander's campaign against the Persians, including at the legendary Battle of Issus. But over 2,000 years after the Battle of the Granicus River was fought, there are still a lot of lingering questions surrounding it. Though it's frequently grouped with Alexander's other three major military encounters, the Battle of Issus, the Battle of Gorgamela, and the Battle of Hydaspes, the ancient sources lack the detailed information about the battle dispositions and the actual activities of the battle that characterise their accounts of the other three. Moreover, the facts that are presented are confusing and seem almost unlikely. For example, historians wonder why the Persian army, ostensibly a larger, stronger force than Alexander's, took up a completely defensive position on the far side of the Granicus. Others have long questioned why Memnon of Rhodes, the commander of the Greek mercenaries in Asia Minor, participated in the battle on horseback, far from his own soldiers. It's still unclear how many infantry soldiers present at the battle were even mercenaries. Ancient historians asserted that Alexander risked a direct frontal assault on a well-defended position, but the accounts of the exact progression of the battle are conflicted, with sources completely contradicting one another as to the decisions made by the legendary general. Contradictions abound in the numbers of soldiers listed on both sides, the dispositions of the armies during the battle, and how the Macedonians ultimately won. After the Battle of the Granicus River, the Persian king would personally face Alexander twice, once at the Battle of Issus, and again at the Battle of Gaugamela, and the battles would decide the fate of his empire and the fate of the Western world. At Gogamela, estimates of Persian losses range from 40,000 to 90,000, while the Macedonians probably lost something like 1,200 men. While the Persian numbers are likely exaggerated, they could easily be in the tens of thousands, since the heaviest losses would have occurred after the battle as the Persians fled the field. Either way, it was a bloody and complete loss for the Persian army, despite a massive numerical advantage due to Alexander's superior tactical ability, his leadership skills, and the discipline of his soldiers. At the head of the cavalry, Alexander renewed the chase for Darius, assuming that the Persian king would make for the city of Arbela, which indeed he did. However, night fell before Alexander could reach the city. Upon crossing the Lycus River, he and his men made camp, while Parmenion and the infantry took the remains of the Persian camp, including the baggage train, elephants and camels. Alexander reached Arbela the next day, but Darius had already continued on, intending to regroup for the next fight. He made for Media, expecting that Alexander would take the easy open roads to the prized cities of Babylon and Susa, while the route to Media was a rough path that would be difficult to traverse with a large army that was unfamiliar with the territory. Much of Bessus's Bactrian cavalry remained with him, as well as some Persian soldiers, the immortal bodyguards, and many of his Greek mercenaries. As both Alexander and Darius knew, while Darius was living and free, the war was not yet over, and Darius was certainly persistent and resilient. He made his way to Ecbatana, always staying one step ahead of Alexander while he attempted to reform his forces to a point that he could again challenge the young conqueror. 
he had accumulated approximately 3,300 cavalry, 4,000 archers, and 30,000 infantrymen, including the 4,000 Greek mercenaries who remained unswervingly loyal. When he left Ecbatana heading in the direction of Bactria, he knew that Alexander was still closely pursuing him and coming closer all the time, as his cavalry detachment moved much quicker than Darius's large force of mixed horsemen and foot soldiers. He therefore called his commanders together to exhort them for a coming battle, telling them, I have personal experience of both your courage and your loyalty from evidence more compelling than I should have liked, and I ought to strive to prove myself worthy of such friends rather than wonder whether you remain the men you were. Of the many thousands under my command, you are the ones who have followed me, twice defeated and twice in flight, and your unflinching loyalty makes me believe that I am a king. Even had I been considering flight, an idea I find thoroughly unacceptable, I would have been encouraged by your bravery to face the enemy. How long, I ask, am I going to be in exile in my own kingdom and flee through my own empire from a foreign king, when by trying the fortunes of war I can either recover what I have lost or else achieve death with honour? I beg and beseech you, assume the courage appropriate to your reputation and that of your nation to meet whatever fortune has in store for us with the resolute spirit with which you have faced the events of the past. As for me, I shall certainly have perpetual fame conferred on me, whether by a glorious victory or a glorious battle. Darius's oldest friend and closest adviser, Artabasus, spoke up bravely and said, We shall follow our king into battle dressed in our richest robes and equipped with our finest armour, mentally prepared to expect victory, but also ready to die. Though the council applauded his words, Nabazanes and Bessus did not. They had already conspired to overthrow Darius and take him prisoner. They assumed that should Alexander catch them, they could ingratiate themselves to the Macedonian by handing him Darius. Conversely, if they escaped, they could then kill the king and lead the forces themselves. Nabazanes tried to lay the framework for their plan, suggesting that Darius temporarily give his command and his kingship to Bessus until Alexander was defeated. After that, Bessus could step down, and Darius could take back the throne. Perhaps not surprisingly, Darius was infuriated and drew his sword on Nabazanes, but Bessus and his men prevented him from the attack before withdrawing their forces for a secret council. Artabasus managed to calm Darius, reminding him that he needed to be tolerant of stupidity in such a dire situation. Darius eventually listened to him, but still frustrated, he retired to his tent, leaving the camp in a precarious state. Bessus and the Bactrians tried to encourage the Persian soldiers to join them in a mutiny, but the Persians refused to rise against their king, which they considered the very height of impiety. Meanwhile, Patron, the commander of the Greek mercenaries, was fully aware of the discontent brewing and ordered his men to be ready to arm themselves at a moment's notice. Artabazus proved his worth as second in command, for throughout the tense hours he toured the camp, encouraging and rallying the Persians, and then managed to convince Darius to come out of his despair and attend to the situation. Realising that the Persians would remain loyal, Bessus and Nabazanes returned to subtle conspiracy. The next morning, they came before Darius, contrite and apologetic, shedding tears and insisting that they had meant no disrespect by their misguided suggestion. Chug explained, their humble pleas moved Darius, who was naturally kind-hearted and sincere, not merely to believe their protestations, but even himself to shed a tear. He fully accepted their apologies and returned to planning for another eventual battle with Alexander. Patron, however, was not convinced. He had his men remain armed and armoured on the coming march, and he resolved himself to warn Darius, though he was not permitted in the king's presence without a direct invitation. He therefore rode as close as he dared to Darius's chariot, endeavouring to catch the Persian king's attention. Bessus feared that the Greek had perceived their treachery, so he stayed directly by Darius's side to interfere with the warning. Eventually, Darius noticed Patron and when asked if he wished to speak with the king, Patron confirmed that he did, but only in private. Darius knew enough Greek to be able to converse with Patron, so he dismissed all of his attendants and motioned the Greek to speak. 
Patron reiterated the loyalty of his men and begged Darius to camp among the Greek mercenaries that night for his own protection. Upon further inquiry, Patron revealed his belief that Bessus and Nabarzanes were still plotting against Darius. Though Darius appreciated the gesture and the loyalty of the Greeks, he insisted that he could not abandon his own countrymen, and that, if his own soldiers did not wish to save him, then his end had come too late. Despairing of the king's welfare, Patron returned to those over whom he exercised authority in order to prepare for every trial of loyalty. Bessus, now convinced that Patron had given away his plot, could not follow through with his desire to murder Darius on the spot for fear of turning the army against him. Instead, he degraded Patron for being a mercenary and called his honesty into question before calling upon all the gods to witness his own loyalty. His speech only made Darius even more certain of the truth of Patron's words, but he pretended to take Bessus's side. It made little difference, since Darius was already in a perilous position. The Greeks numbered only 4,000, while those that might possibly be considering treachery were closer to 30,000. Furthermore, if Darius abandoned his own Persians and went to the Greeks, many of those undecided about the plot might see it as a violation of their trust and a justifiable reason to join the conspirators. In the end, Darius decided he would rather be betrayed as an innocent than deserve it, so he merely remarked to Bessus that he had as much evidence of Alexander's sense of justice as of his courage, and any who expected a reward for betrayal from him were mistaken. None would be a more severe avenger or punisher of treason than Alexander. At camp that evening, Darius called Artabazus to him, and told him of the charges made by Patron. Artabazus urged Darius to take refuge with the Greeks, certain that the Persian ruler would take the advice, but Darius had already despaired of his life, broken by the treachery of his commanders. He embraced Artabazus, and the two exchanged mutual tears at the farewell. Eventually, Darius had to order his attendants to remove Artabazus by force, for he clung to his king and refused to abandon him. Darius had to look away rather than see the grief of his friend. After spending time in prayer, he ordered his personal attendants and eunuchs to leave him and save themselves, but they remained in the tent until the arrival of Bessus and Nabazanes, who entered and ordered Darius arrested and bound with golden chains. They put him in a dirty wagon covered in animal skins, and the wagon was driven by men who did not recognize the Persian king in order to keep his presence a secret. Despite his captivity, Darius was destined to have some vindication, for his assertion that Alexander would despise the treacherous generals would be proven true. Upon encountering deserters and learning of Darius's imprisonment, Alexander and a small force of the most physically fit men in his army tore across the countryside on horseback, intent on catching the Persians. When Bessus and Nabazanes learned of Alexander's impending arrival, they went to the wagon serving as Darius's prison and tried to convince the king to mount a horse and run with them to escape Alexander. Darius, however, declared that the gods had come to avenge him and calling for Alexander's protection refused to go along with the traitors. In a fury, they speared the king many times and left him for dead in the cart. They also wounded the animals so that they could not carry Darius away. Alexander and his men came upon the column of fleeing Persians, but though they searched the camp and the throngs of men, they could not find the king. It was by mere chance that a Macedonian named Polystratus eventually came upon the grisly site. He was overcome with thirst and sought out a spring that the locals had told him about in order to get a drink. Darius's wounded animals had wandered in a painful daze and finally came to a stop in the same valley, moving towards the water, when they finally died of their wounds. Coming across the speared animals, Polystratus was surprised to hear the moans of a man in pain, and upon further investigation, he found the king in the back of the wagon, alone and at the point of death. Upon Darius's request, Polystratus brought him some water from the stream, and he then desired that the following message should be given to Alexander, that he died without having done him any acts of kindness, but a debtor to him for the greatest, since he had found his feelings towards his mother and children to be those of a prince, not of a foe. That he had been more happy in his enemy than in his relations, 
for by his enemy, life had been granted to his mother and children, but taken from himself by his relatives, to whom he had given both life and kingdoms, and that such a requital must therefore be made them as his conqueror should please. For himself, that he made the only return to Alexander which he could at the point of death, by praying to the gods above and below, and the powers that protected kings, that the empire of the world might fall to his lot. Some sources indicate that Alexander arrived before Darius had died, received the Persian king's final blessing in person, and swore to Darius that he would avenge his death. Either way, upon seeing the great king of Persia come to such an end, Alexander was grieved to the point of tears. He covered the body with his own cloak, and ordered that Darius's body be returned to Persepolis to lie in state, before being honoured with a full Persian funeral and laid to rest among his royal ancestors. The circumstances of Alexander's death are unclear. Certainly there were plenty of ambitious men, even among his inner circle, who might have wanted him dead. Yet all of the main historians for Alexander's life discount the possibility of foul play, claiming no poison was used, and slow-acting venom capable of prolonging a man's agony for two weeks seems technologically unviable for the period in question. Perhaps Alexander was simply exhausted. After all, he was a famous binge drinker, like his father, which did little for his health, and he had been on campaign for more than a decade, having sustained at least three serious wounds in the process. Even today, scientists and doctors still try to diagnose Alexander based on accounts of his death, naming potential natural causes like malaria, typhoid fever, or meningitis. Either way, by the time the 32-year-old king was dead, he had conquered most of the civilized world in the West. The young general was able to overwhelm the mighty Achaemenid Empire, which had stood as the most powerful force in the Near East for over 200 years, and gained some of the most ancient and venerated cultures, including Egypt and Babylon. Alexander's conquest of the Persian Empire was not unlike previous wars of conquest in many ways, but the young Macedonian had a vision to spread the benefits of Greek culture to the conquered peoples, an idea that has been referred to as Hellenism by modern scholars. Unfortunately for Alexander, his untimely death meant that he was unable to see his vision fulfilled, but some of his top generals made it their duty to spread Hellenism to the East. All of the main historians for Alexander's life discount the possibility of foul play, claiming no poison was used, and slow-acting venom capable of prolonging a man's agony for two weeks seems technologically unviable for the period in question. Perhaps Alexander was simply exhausted. He was a famous binge drinker like his father, which did little for his health, and he had been on campaign for more than a decade, having sustained at least three serious wounds in the process. Even today, scientists and doctors still try to diagnose Alexander based on accounts of his death, naming potential natural causes like malaria, typhoid fever, or meningitis. On his deathbed, some historians claim that when he was pressed to name a successor, Alexander muttered that his empire should go to the strongest. Other sources claim that he passed his signet ring to his general Perdiccas, thereby naming him successor, but whatever his choices were or may have been, they were ignored. Alexander's generals, all of them with the loyalty of their own corps at their backs, would tear each other apart in a vicious internal struggle that lasted almost half a century before four factions emerged victorious. Macedonia, the Seleucid Empire in the east, the Kingdom of Pergamon in Asia Minor, and the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt. During the course of these wars, Alexander's only heir, the posthumously born Alexander IV, was murdered, extinguishing his bloodline forever. Although it was an incredibly important period in world history, it is sometimes as confusing as it is frustrating for historians because the allegiances of the generals changed constantly and historical sources are often biased in some regards and utterly lacking in others. Although none of these men were able to replicate Alexander the Great's territorial success, a few carved out sizable empires and were able to establish long-lasting political dynasties. Ptolemy I brought Egypt back to a central position of power in the region, and Seleucus I built a strong empire on the ruins of ancient Babylonia, but other generals, such as Perdiccas, were killed early on in the fighting, 
and slipped into relative obscurity. Some of the Macedonian generals had a significant impact on the region during their lifetimes, but they left no heirs to carry on their political memories. The general Lysimachus won control of Thrace and established a fairly important kingdom in that land, but when he died, his successors all turned on and killed each other, effectively ending any potential dynasty. Similarly, Cassander was a Macedonian general who was involved in the Diadochi Wars, and for a time it looked like he was going to be the biggest winner among the Macedonians. Cassander became the king of Macedon, had direct influence over most of southern Greece, and was courted by the other kings and generals in their conflicts against each other. For a time, Seleucus and his successors commanded the largest empire in the world as it stretched from the high plains and deserts of what is now Afghanistan in the east to parts of the Levant and Asia Minor in the west. The empire's early kings were strong and shrewd, and committed to the ideas of Hellenism as much as holding power and expanding the realm of their empire but later rulers did not prove as capable. In time, the Seleucid royal house often descended into orgies of violence, which were driven by ambitious men and women. Despite its troubles and its sheer size and scope, the Seleucid Empire lasted for several centuries, and it would not truly reach its end until the heyday of the legendary Roman general Pompey the Great in the first century BC. By establishing notable Greek cities like Antioch, the empire tried with partial success to create a sense of cultural harmony among a giant melting pot, which spanned thousands of miles and incorporated a countless number of ethnicities. Certain groups chafed under the Hellenization more than others, and the Seleucid Empire witnessed a lot of infighting, but it managed to leave an indelible mark on the region that has lasted to this day. Smyrna and the Region Today, most people who know anything about Smyrna generally think of its classical phase, namely the Roman and Christian periods, more than its earlier eras, which is unfortunate since classical Smyrna was essentially a culmination of all its earlier phases of development, going back to the 4th millennium BC. Smyrna may have received its name from the Greeks, and it was a Greek city in character for a large part of its history. But long before the Greeks founded the city, there were numerous other people who settled the area in and around what would become Smyrna. Thus, it's necessary to be familiar with the pre-Indo-European and Bronze Age Indo-European people who settled the region. Today, the modern city of Izmir, Turkey, sprawls over where ancient Smyrna and its surrounding and affiliated settlements once stood. Although some architectural elements of ancient Smyrna have survived into the modern period, much of it has been lost to development over the centuries, which has made reconstructing the city and its history difficult. With that said, enough has been excavated, along with the extant historical and literary texts, to get a sense of what the city was like and what daily life was like there. There were actually several different ancient settlements in and around Smyrna, beginning in the late 4th millennium BC, with various ethnic groups building temporary and permanent settlements all around what would become Smyrna and its surrounding settlements. Later. When Smyrna became the classical era Smyrna, as it is known, like other Greek city-states, it claimed a larger rural area with several smaller villages. As a result, when one speaks of Smyrna, defining when and where the city began is not such an easy task. Therefore, this book will survey the entire lifespan of the city and its near proximity. It is also important to know that there were two ancient cities known as Smyrna, which modern scholars refer to as Old Smyrna, and New Smyrna. As will be discussed later, the settlement of Smyrna was a long process that took place over several hundred years, but it became a Greek city by the 9th century BC. Old Smyrna was located at the north end of a bay, connecting the people of the city to Aegean and their Greek cousins on the islands and mainland Greece beyond, while Anatolia was to its east. Although Old Smyrna was located on the coastline, it is today about 1,500 feet inland, underneath the modern Izmir suburb of Bairakli. The Meles River, mentioned by the poet Homer, flowed through Old Smyrna, and although it was not necessarily important for trade, it did provide inspiration for literature. Eventually, as will be more thoroughly discussed later, tragedy struck Old Smyrna, forcing the inhabitants to abandon it for a new location. 
After living under the rule of the Lydians and the Persians for more than two hundred years, Old Smyrna was almost entirely abandoned as the people moved to surrounding villages. During the fourth century, some of Alexander the Great's generals, known as the Diadochi, decided to rebuild Smyrna on the south side of the bay at the foot of Mount Pagos, which modern scholars now refer to as New Smyrna. The origins and details of New Smyrna's founding are still a topic of discussion, but what is known is that by the 3rd century BC, the city was once again fairly populated and somewhat important. New Smyrna's monuments, art and artefacts have been better studied than Old Smyrna's, and when compared to other Hellenic cities, archaeological work at Smyrna has been relatively more recent. Scientific archaeological excavations of ancient Greek and Roman sites began in the 19th century, but Smyrna was not significantly uncovered until well into the 20th century. Archaeologists had to contend with the urban sprawl of Izmir, as well as the Mandarin system of the Ottoman Empire, which left most archaeologists looking for other places to dig. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed after World War I and was replaced in part by the modern state of Turkey, the new government was more open to foreign expeditions and from 1932 to 1941, New Smyrna was excavated by German archaeologist Rudolf Naumann and Turkish archaeologist Salahattin Kantar. The most notable discovery these men made was the excavation of the Agora, which was the centre of the city's life in the Hellenistic and Roman periods. The discovery of the Agora certainly advanced what historians knew about ancient Smyrna, and there was still more to be uncovered but it would have to wait until World War II was over. Although Turkey was relatively free of conflict during the war, the fighting shut down archaeological work in virtually every corner of the world. However, once the war was over, archaeologists from the British School of Archaeology at Athens, led by John Cook and Turkish scholars from Akara University, headed by Ikram Akagol, decided to put their picks in the ground north of the bay to uncover Old Smyrna. From 1948 to 1951, Cook and Akagul's team uncovered houses, a temple, and the Acropolis of Old Smyrna, revealing much about how the city grew and was conquered during the Classical period. The British-Turkish excavations also uncovered information about Smyrna's pre-Greek past and helped shed light on the nature of how Smyrna became a Greek city. Historians once believed that Smyrna and the other Ionian cities were colonised during a wave of migrations by Athenians sometime between the 12th and 10th centuries BC. But thanks to the work of Cook, Akagal and others, the importance of indigenous Anatolian people in the formation of Smyrna was recognised. Scholars know that Indo-Europeans entered Anatolia in the late 3rd century BC, and thanks to archaeological work in the region, they also know that non-Indo-European people inhabited Anatolia, including the region around what would become Smyrna before that time. Therefore, the origins of Smyrna are somewhat amorphous and shrouded in mystery. Ancient Greek historians and geographers often recounted the earliest histories of many Greek city-states and even some non-Greek people, such as the Egyptians, in quasi-mythical terms. In their works, humans lived alongside gods and demigods, in a sort of golden age, accounts that were definitely influenced by Hesiod's Theogony. The Greeks believed that Smyrna's origins could be traced back to that same era, a time before civilization as they knew it when myth and history seemed to coexist. According to the first century BC Greek geographer Strabo, Smyrna was founded by an Amazon. Smyrna was an Amazon who took possession of Ephesus, and hence the name both of the inhabitants and of the city just as certain of the Ephesians were called Cicerbitae after Cicerba. Also, a certain place belonging to Ephesus was called Smyrna, as Hipponax plainly indicates. As colourful as Strabo's account is, it is not necessarily far from reality. Instead of claiming that Smyrna had been settled by Athenian colonists in a wave of migration, he attributed its foundation to a non-Greek source. This is a historically interesting and important point, since the archaeological evidence clearly indicates that the first people to live in the area were not the Greeks. Ceramic remains indicate the region around Smyrna was inhabited as early as the 4th millennium BC, 
and the decorated pottery wares reflect a common ceramic tradition in Western Anatolia that predated the arrival of the Greeks and other Indo-European people in the region. Although Smyrna had yet to become an urban centre at that point, archaeologists believe it was at the centre of a system connecting Western Anatolia to the Eastern Aegean region. The mountains in Western Anatolia actually served as a barrier between Central Anatolia and the Aegean coast, and although connections were certainly made between Central Anatolia and the coast, the people of the coast developed more enduring connections to the people of the Aegean at an early point. Recent excavations in and around Izmir, near the location of Old Smyrna on the north side of the bay, at the site known as Liman Tepe, show the region was continuously inhabited from the late Chalcolithic period through the late Bronze Age. This revelation is important to the understanding of Greek Ionia in general, and Smyrna in particular. The material culture, left by the early inhabitants of Western Anatolia, what would later become known as Ionia, demonstrates that sophisticated cultures had already developed settlements and possibly advanced systems of trade and travel long before the Greeks had placed their cultural stamp on the region in a supposed process of colonization and migration. Although the Greeks did, in fact, come to the region to leave their cultural mark, archaeological evidence shows they were just one in a long line of people who claimed Smyrna and the surrounding region as their own. After the initial inhabitants developed a ceramic-making culture in the 4th millennium BC, they were joined, or possibly invaded, by Indo-Europeans in the 3rd millennium BC. Different Indo-European people began entering Anatolia from the north, beginning around 3000 BC, but possibly earlier. The Hittites are the best known of these Indo-European-speaking people, as they occupied a central position in Anatolia, and built a kingdom that endured for hundreds of years, influencing the geopolitics of the Near East in the process. The Indo-Europeans of Anatolia developed all the hallmarks of an advanced civilization, such as writing, a sophisticated bureaucracy and organized religion, among other things, and integrated themselves with the other great powers of the ancient Near East, including Egypt, Alashia, Babylon, Mitanni, and Assyria. Although the Hittites are the best known of these Anatolian Indo-European people, there were other Indo-Europeans that entered Anatolia around the same time as the Hittites, making their way to western Anatolia and the region where Smyrna would become a city. These Indo-Europeans would play a peripheral role in the geopolitics of the late Bronze Age Great Powers Club, with some of these people occupying the area of Smyrna. There were two major Indo-European kingdoms, Azawa, and Ahiyawa that occupied western Anatolia during the late Bronze Age. The future Smyrna was completely within the borders of one of these kingdoms, although there is no scholarly consensus as to which one it was. The long-held idea among most scholars is that Smyrna was within the kingdom of Azawa, which stretched along the coast of what later became Iona, while Ahiwa occupied the far northwest section of Anatolia and the Dardanelles including the fabled city of Troy. A less popular theory asserts that Azawa was more in southwest Anatolia and Ahiyawa was just to its north along the western coast, which would have placed Smyrna in that kingdom. For its part, Azawa was a relatively powerful kingdom that was on an equal, or near equal, footing with the Egyptians and other members of the late Bronze Age Great Powers Club of the Near East. A Hittite language document discovered in the Amarna Letters archives from Egypt details a marriage alliance between Azawa and Egypt. Nimuwarea, great king, king of Egypt, speaks as follows. Say to Tarhundaradu, the king of Azawa, by me all is well. For my houses, my wives, my children, my magnates, my troops, my chariot fighters, all my property and my countries, all is well. Behold, I have sent to you Ersapa, my messenger, with the instruction, let the daughter whom they will offer to my majesty in marriage, and he will pour oil on her head. Behold, I have sent you a sack of gold. It is excellent quality. Although Bronze Age texts testify to the existence of both Azawa and Ahiwa somewhere in western Anatolia, and Smyrna was undoubtedly part of one of these kingdoms, precisely locating either is difficult because they were so culturally similar. Azawa, Ahiwa, and the Hittites shared many cultural attributes, 
and one could argue they were part of the same greater civilization. The three people had similar material cultures, so defining their boundaries based on pottery distribution is impossible. As complicated as pre-Hellenic Smyrna's relationship with Arzawa and Ahiwa was, things are made even more difficult by the potential influence Troy and the Hittites had on the region. There is evidence that both the Hittites and Troy had at least some influence on the area that would later become Smyrna, although the extent of each is open to debate. Herodotus mentioned a monument of the Egyptian king Sesostris on the road between Smyrna and Sardis, which is confusing for a number of reasons. It reads, In Ionia also there are two images of Sesostris cut on rock, one on the road from Ephesus to Phocia, the other on the road between Sardis and Smyrna. In each case the carved figure is nearly seven feet high and represents a man with a spear in his right hand and a bow in his left, and the rest of his equipment to match partly Egyptian, partly Ethiopian. The passage is confusing because although there were three Egyptian kings named Sesostris Senusret, they all lived during Egypt's Middle Kingdom, which was hundreds of years before Arzawa's contact with the Egyptians, as documented in the Amarna letters. Modern Egyptologists believe that the monument to which Herodotus refers is actually a rock-cut image of a Hittite king near Karabel, which is just east of Smyrna. The rock carving certainly proves the Hittites extended their reach and influence as far as the Smyrna region, but it does not indicate how strong that presence was, nor how long it endured. Some scholars are sceptical that it proves anything about the Hittite influence in the region, because other than the Karabel inscription, the evidence is scant. Troy's possible influence on the region around Smyrna must also be considered. Although many believed for a long time that Troy was a mythical city, archaeologists proved its existence more than 100 years ago and that it had been destroyed and rebuilt seven times before it faced its major destruction during the Trojan War around 1200 BC. Before that time, Troy, like most of western Anatolia, was under the influence of Arzawa, and or Ahiwa, but it also carved out its own sphere of cultural influence in the region. The pottery style modern archaeologists know as Northwest Anatolian greyware was popular in Troy early in the Late Bronze Age and became more prominent in the latter part of Late Bronze Age Smyrna. This movement of pottery style from Troy to Smyrna indicates the former was influential, but just how much influence it may have exercised over the latter is a matter of debate. If anything, the Trojan cultural influences would have been just the latest in what was already by then a long tradition of multiple influences on the region that would become known as Smyrna. Complicating the issue of who had the most influence over pre-Smyrna, it is important to note the site was located just on the edge of the Mycenaean zone of influence. The remains of Mycenaean pottery in the area that would become Smyrna indicates that either Mycenaeans Greeks began inhabiting the region by the later Late Bronze Age, or the native Anatolian inhabitants of the region were trading with the Mycenaeans, or both. Other Late Bronze Age archaeological discoveries from Smyrna indicate the site had curvilinear homes, which were common in later periods, and rectangular structures, pointing toward multiple points of architectural influence. All of this architectural evidence combined with the few extant texts, points towards Smyrna's Bronze Age cultural origins being quite heterogeneous. The pre-Indo-European people of Anatolia were the first inhabitants of the regions, and next came the Indo-Europeans, who incorporated the area into either the Kingdom of Arzawa or Ahiwa in the Late Bronze Age. Finally, the Trojans, Hittites and Mycenaeans all influenced Bronze Age Smyrna, although the extent to which they did will probably never be completely known. There are no signs of violent invasions or major destruction in archaeological levels before the end of the Bronze Age at Smyrna, which suggests that the early evolution of the site was more or less peaceful. All of that changed after 1200 BC, when the Bronze Age came to a relatively quick end under a tsunami of migrating people. The Sea People were the best known of these migrant warrior bands but land-based people, such as the Thracians, Dorians and Phrygians, also caused havoc in Greece and Anatolia, initiating a dark age in the region that lasted for about 200 years. 
While there is no known document explicitly stating when the area that became known as Smyrna began being referred to specifically as Smyrna, what modern archaeologists know as Old Smyrna was probably founded around the year 1000 BC, and by about 900 BCE, Smyrna had a distinctly Greek character, which was at least partly the result of migrations from mainland Greece, although the extent of these migrations is a source of scholarly debate among modern classicists. The idea of the migrations themselves must be examined and potentially challenged to determine how much of an impact the Greek migrations to Western Anatolia had on the establishment of Old Smyrna in the early Iron Age. The archaeological evidence of Old Smyrna's foundation helps narrow down the chronology, but it does little to clarify details about from where the first Greek Smyrnians came or how they arrived in Smyrna. For that, modern historians have to rely mostly on classical sources. Most importantly, Herodotus and Strabo both wrote that the Greek Smyrnians were originally Aeolian Greeks, who later joined Ionian League Greeks. Strabo wrote, these are the twelve Ionian cities, but at a later time, Smyrna was added, being induced by the Ephesians to join the Ionian League. For the Ephesians were fellow inhabitants of the Smyrnians in ancient times, when Ephesus was also called Smyrna. Herodotus's account added more details and intrigue by suggesting the Ionians took control of the city through treachery and that most of the people had left. The Aeolians lost Smyrna by treachery. They had received into the town some men from Colophon, who had been defeated by the rival faction and expelled. The fugitives watched their chance, and when the people